Well put. Okay. All right, I see we're we live. Are, we are live, and um, I'm going to start sharing this with some groups. Great. Oh, I love this. Uh, this uh, I can't get enough of deep filled with galaxies. I just love galaxies. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I know what you're I know, David. <laughs> we have that comet uh, interference thing. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, well, you know, like was talked about in previous episodes, I mean, the, the great Andromeda Nebula, right? I mean, we, all these things were faint fuzzies before, and it's so neat to understand the nature of, uh, of the universe. Um, have a deeper un uh, understanding, not, you know, we're just scratching the surface, but uh, I, I'm, I'm just really, through. I just can't wait, you know, I'm jumping around here, but James Webb, oh man, that's, uh, that's going to be fantastic. I know I, I was looking at that, that image again with the uh, diffraction spikes, uh, you know, with, because of octagonal, uh, uh, or not octagonal, sorry, hexagonal uh, mirror cells, but you see those galaxies and I'm just like, it gets me excited. As soon as I see those galaxies in that field, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's going to be really fun. Yes. Yeah, here we are zooming, zooming around. Oh, so neat. Well, hello, David. It's good to see you. How are you doing these days? We're doing okay. Wendy's doing a lot better. Good. I was pain from her shingles and her treatments, her cancer treatments are coming on pretty well. Good. I'm glad to hear that. As always, give her our best, of course. Thank you. She'll probably be in in a little bit. Yeah, good. Hi, Carol. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, speaking of shingles, uh, that's not the most fun thing to have. Uh, I have a family member who had that not too long ago, and it took a while, but uh, thank God for the proper medication to help along the way. Yeah, absolutely. She's Wednesday's doing okay, and I'm glad you, your relative is doing no better. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to hear Wendy's doing so well. Yeah. That's good to hear, yes. Yeah, my dad got uh, shingles, and I, I just got the first uh, shingles uh, vaccination uh, last end of last year. So I still have to get my, that reminds me, I have to get my second shot coming up here. Yeah, we used to not worry about that uh, particular uh, malady, but <laughs> that's another yeah. thing to be concerned with. Yep. Vaccinations work. As we can see with this, uh, it's so nice. You know, I'm here. I'm traveling right now this week uh, in Denver, and uh, this is my third time uh, since um, since the uh, kind of the the uh, opening up of of the travel restrictions on our company, and um, and I can tell you, walking around Denver, uh, it's so nice to be able to you know after you get out of the airport, you know basically uh, most people are vaccinated. You're walking around and um, no need for masks. Uh, it's, you know, obviously if you're in a crowded area, it's still a good, good idea, advisable, uh, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's nice to see things kind of uh, where we're vigilant, but at the same time, um, we're able to move on. Vigilant. It's been a long time coming to get to this point, hasn't it? Really oh, it has. It seemed like it has lasted forever. Yep. Yep. But it's nice to see all the, uh, you know, all of our events, uh, the astronomy. Um, we we're just talking about the star parties that are planned this year. It's going to be great to see those and, 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 and then complement those with our virtual star parties and really just make it super awesome. You know, combination of in-person plus, plus uh, virtual, it's, uh, it's going to bring a lot of nice dynamic. It really is. <clears throat> so 
So how's everyone's clear skies going? Uh, how's, how's your spring? Are you getting some clear nights, everyone? Yeah, it's clear here today. Oh, yes. Almost the none. Sprinkling. <laughs> it's, it's about cloudy about 90% of the time here these yeah. days. Uh, the good yeah. old Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, the churning, churning of the spring. Yeah, yeah. We uh, here, I, I, you know, I leave Seattle, Seattle, like I was mentioning earlier. For the last four months, I got three nights of clear skies. One was high humidity, fogged up my my lenses, but uh, uh, those were the my nights in Seattle. And then I come to Denver, and it's been really nice, like super clear, beautiful. some pretty high elevations near the city there too, to go up into the mountains for very clear air. Oh yeah. Denver's one of my very favorite cities. It's a great city, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of good stuff. And here comes Wendy. Uh, how's she doing? She's doing fine. She just said hi. Hi, Wendy. Hi, hi Wendy. Wendy. Oh, Wendy. Hi, guys. Good to hear you're doing better. Hello. Well, I put it like this. I'm standing. I'm functioning. I'm good. <laughs> oh, sweet. You're in good spirits. That's good to hear. Excellent. So what, what's coming up here? We, we are, you know, I today is the day that... Uh, uh, that uh, Margaret Burbage died uh, in 19, or in, uh, I'm sorry, I put down 1920, it's 2020, a little typo there. Uh, she, um, uh, but she was, uh, she played a major role in research uh, that showed that heavy elements are constantly built up from lighter ones within stars. She also did important work on rotations of galaxies, which led to some of the first estimates of the masses of galaxies on, and on quasars. From 1972 to 1973, she served as head of the Royal Greenwich Observatory, the first woman director in its 300 year history. Uh, so uh, Margaret Burbage uh, did incredible science. She uh, also was a champion of uh, getting women um, in, uh, in, in the field of astronomy and science in general. So just, uh, you know, it's, it's good to, um, to remember someone that did uh, such important work. But uh, what's gonna roll next is a kind of an interview with her on a documentary that was put together by NASA uh, uh, with uh, her role with the Hubble Space Telescope. So here we go. Some of the most mysterious, quasars. Space telescope scientist, Dr. Margaret Burbage. Well, they are very fascinating and mysterious objects. On a photographic plate, they just look like ordinary stars. But uh, when we break up their light and analyze it into its, its rainbow of colors, we see that they're rushing away from us at enormous speeds. And in our expanding universe, that means that there must be very, very distant, near the edge of the visible universe. Now, uh, yet we still see them, uh, even at this, these vast distances, and that tells us that they must be creating and emitting enormous amounts of energy. To be visible from so far away, a quasar's light must be very bright, as brilliant as 200 trillion suns. And yet, quasars appear to be no larger than our solar system. Well, we have no way to explain uh, anything so compact being able to produce such an enormous amount of energy. And that's, that's the real mystery of the quasars. Much of the light reaching Earth from a quasar is ultraviolet light, light that doesn't penetrate our atmosphere. What little of a quasar's light does reach Earth shimmers because of the turbulence in our atmosphere. The Space Telescope will overcome both obstacles. 
It has a spectrograph that operates in both visible and ultraviolet light and is particularly good for studying very faint objects like quasars. The spectrograph breaks light into beams according to wavelength. The beams tell us a lot about the object that produced the light, its temperature, its chemical composition, its energy state, how fast it's moving, and whether it's moving toward us or away from us. The Space Telescope also has a photometer that can measure rapid changes in light. Since it's above the atmosphere, we can use it to precisely measure the quasar's fluctuations. These two space telescope instruments, the spectrograph and photometer, along with the telescope's cameras, will finally put quasars within our grasp. Well, I hope we'll be able to discover the secret of the immense energy that the quasars are producing. Might we find out something new about the laws of physics from studying the quasars? I speculate on the relationship between quasars and galaxies of stars like our own Milky Way. I sometimes wonder whether the quasars represent the birth of, of galaxies and uh, or perhaps the even possibly the death of an earlier generation of galaxies. Uh, anything might be possible. Hello everyone, welcome to the 89th Global Star Party. Uh, we've got a uh, special dedication to Margaret Burbage, who, was, uh, who passed away in 2020 on this very day. She was 100 years old. Um, some of the information uh, that I was able to put together, I, I really want to uh, do a shout out for Shelley Bonus, who actually met and knew Margaret Burbage and her husband. Um, and um, as well as many other iconic astronomers at Mount Wilson Observatory where she worked. Um, so that was, uh, it was great to uh, uh, get that. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't be on tonight, but uh, I will have her on at some other time and we will talk about uh, some of the history and stuff about Mount Wilson. Uh, a feature of this program also will include uh, uh, John Briggs, who is currently the, the new secretary of the Alliance of Historic Observatories. And we are kind of doing a sequence of inviting uh, people from those observatories to give a little bit of a talk about what's going on uh, at those observatories, you know, what, what happened, why they're, they're still functioning and how they uh, you know, embrace and nurture the communities that they serve. Um, so we're very pleased to be a part of that at Explore Scientific. Um, and, uh, you know, and we have just an amazing, fantastic lineup uh, here for our 89th, uh, starting with David Levy, uh, who is uh, uh, always here with us to, uh, you know, give us a feeling of the importance of uh, why we do astronomy uh, and to give us some historical perspectives through uh, some of the writings that uh, he brings up, uh, especially with like his favorite author Shakespeare, and um, but uh, also through uh, poetry and you know kind of revealing the beauty and the aesthetic of, of astronomy in the night sky. So, uh, David, do you want to you want to come on with me now? Thank you, thank you, Scott, and welcome everyone to our 89th Star Party. It's really too bad that Margaret Burbage couldn't be here herself in person tonight, but uh, I have a feeling of her presence. I remember 
uh, we were leaving Kitt Peak after an observing run, and uh, we saw this um, middle-aged woman walking from one telescope to another. And the person I was with said, that is Margaret Burbage. And you just had the feel of astronomical history walking right before you. I did get to know her husband, Jeffrey Burbage, pretty well. And um, the two as a couple, I think Margaret was the better astronomer. Jeffrey was mostly well known as the longtime director of Kitt Peak National Observatory. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me all. And uh, today's poetry will come not from Shakespeare, but from William Wordsworth. And I remember quoting from his poem, Stargazers, a few weeks ago, <clears throat> and telling you the story about how my <clears throat> professor at Queens uh, said that his only comment was Wordsworth wrote some wretched verse. There was a comment into one of the published versions of that poem recently. And the comment was that a lot of academics really were very narrow-minded about the uh, worth of the poets they studied or didn't study. <clears throat> and uh, But I didn't think it was that case with Dr. McKenzie. I think he was very, very broad-minded and uh, certainly was, <clears throat> was very special very special to me. So the poem that I'm going to quote for you today is one of his most famous, Wordsworth's most famous, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. It was written at Townsend, Grasmere. The daffodils grew and still grow on the margin of Oldswater and probably may be seen to this day as beautiful in the month of March, nodding their golden heads beside the dancing and foaming waves. <coughs> I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or vales and hills. When all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched a never ending line along the margin of a bay. 10,000 saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they <clears throat> uh, did the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills, and dances with the daffodils. Beautiful. Thank you, Scott, and back Beautiful. to you. Very wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, um, we are uh, uh, always pleased to bring on the Astronomical League. Um, uh, the Astronomical League, as I've mentioned many times, uh, uh, but I, I'll mention it again, they are the world's largest federation of astronomy clubs, over 300 clubs. Uh, over 20,000 members uh, growing every day, uh, which is wonderful because uh, they offer so much to the astronomical community through their observing programs, through their recognition programs, uh, through their conferences, their magazine, the reflector, uh, which uh, you know gives you all the details of what's going on with their community. But um, they're grow they based in the United States, they are growing worldwide and uh, you too can become a member of the Astronomical League by becoming a member at large and all you have to do is go to astroleague.org. Um, tonight we're honored to have the president of the Astronomical League with us, uh, Mr. Carol Orge and Carol uh, will conduct our Global Star Party door prizes. So I'll thank you so much, you, Scott. And, uh... Thank you for those nice words. We really appreciate all of your support over the years and the support of all of our my colleagues on tonight as well. And David, it's hard to follow you. You always give us so much inspiration and particularly this spring season uh, talking about the connection before we hit the the, uh, the skies at night talking about the flowers as well. So that's very appropriate. I would, uh, I'll switch my screen here and
Okay, uh, any uh, instrument that involves looking at the sun, we have to have protection. And that's why each time we do these, we show the screen encouraging you, well, uh, really strongly encourage you not to look at any instrument uh, without proper protection uh, if you're looking toward the sun. Sorry, but uh, we are still seeing you. Uh, it's not coming through. Let's see here. I thought we were there. Sorry about that. How about now? Not yet. Top, which is a little fun and a different but tonight. How about now? Not yet. You you have to go down to the um you'll see a green share screen button. Right, I got that. On Zoom. And you click on that and then you pick the um, application you want to share and then you commit to it. Right. We can see you, Cameron, uh, at least. Um, yeah. yeah, we see, we see well, Carol. Well, well, we can do without that. There we go. Okay, it's oh, working we now. Go down. Sorry about that. There there we go. Equipment, it's not quite the same. Okay. okay. Yeah, when you get a new computer, it's sometimes yeah. you get a little. Okay. All right. There's our screen that uh, talks about the precautions uh, earlier. So we've talked about that. Oh, okay. The answers from the last star party, which were on uh, March 29th, 2022. The first question was, when astronauts come back from space, they're slightly younger than if they never left. And the answer is true. And that's a, a nice objective, isn't it? Number two, getting real deep into trivia, Pizza Hut delivered a pizza to the International Space Station in 2001. What topping was featured on this pizza? Hmm. Uh, item A would not be my favorite. B, maybe. And D is pretty good as well. But the answer to this one is C, salami. I would not, anchovies I could do without, but I'm sure some on this program probably like anchovies. They're not my favorite. So it's probably also the world's most expensive pizza. Yeah, that's yeah, I'm sure that's right. <laughs> I, I'm not sure how it was all delivered, but I didn't get into that. <laughs> right. Number three from that last star party. If you weigh 200 pounds on Earth, how much would you weigh on Mars? This is so refreshing to see B as being the answer, 76 pounds. Uh, it, that's that's <laughs> the way we would hope it would go if we're going to space. We should have some bonus for making that very long trip. <laughs> And the answers from that last star party were a few that are on this broadcast tonight, uh, starting with John Williams, Cameron Gillis is on the broadcast, Josh Kovac, Israel Monteroso, Paul and Kathy Sue Anderson, Rich Kraling, and Max Valeris. And for the March prize winners, we draw prize winners each month for, from all the entries from the four star parties. And the uh, winners for that, were Rich Kraling, Michael Overecker, and John Williams. And now we get to the questions for tonight, April 5th, 2022. And when you see the, or when you think of the answer, send them immediately to secretary at astroleague.org. Question number one, which four letter word beginning with an N is a star showing a sudden large increase in brightness, then gradually returning to its original state over a period of weeks to years. Again, submit your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. Question number two, Titania, Miranda, and Bianca are all moons of which planet in the solar system? 
Again, send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. The final one. In space, the Big Bang machine is another, is another name for what? In space, the Big Bang machine is another name for what? Hmm. Secretary at astroleague.org is the address to send those entries to. A little over two weeks from now, we will be featuring John Wasikvich on the uh, Astronomical League Live, that's the monthly program that uh, uh, Terry Mann uh, uh, hosts for uh, uh, the league. And he'll be talking about the Lagrange points and the James Webb telescope. And that's been re very relevant lately, as we've heard about that uh, special zone where it's parked out in space. So that should be extremely interesting. Along with myself, uh, Terry Mann will be here, along with Scott and David Levy. And we encourage you to Tune into that. It's very relevant to the situation we have now with the superb optics we're already getting, uh, are seeing from with the pictures, early pictures coming from the James Webb. And as I think we've mentioned before on this program, Alcon 2022, the National uh, Convention of the Astronomical League, is a go, a strong go. We have people daily uh, registering, uh, registering for that convention, so we're very pleased about that. This is for the first time in three years. Uh, even though we had a superb virtual meeting last year, but it wasn't, as we've said uh, in our pre-broadcast uh, 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 discussion day, it's not quite the same as getting together, but it sure has uh, been a good experience in reaching many more people than we could otherwise. And the dates for that are July 28th through 30th of 2022. And we encourage you all to come to Albuquerque and see us at the Embassy Suites. It promises to be a wonderful convention. And we will uh, have uh, many uh, well-known speakers on Sunday at the end of the convention. The very large array will be a featured uh, trip. So I'd encourage you to uh, go to astrolake.org to get further information. And with that, back to Scott. Thanks very much, Carol. Well, great. So yeah, definitely, uh, if you've not been to an Alcon event, uh, you're going to want to uh, put that on your list of events to attend. If you can't attend, you know, certainly tune in to uh, their Facebook page uh, because they'll be live casting uh, the event there as well. So Scott, if I could say one more thing, uh, sure. I was going to say it and I forgot about it. one thing we do at our national conventions is give awards for what we call the Master Observer Award winners. That's an observer who is uh, from our multitude of choices for observations. They've gone to many different programs, had samples all the way through, whether it's nebulae, uh, galaxies, the whole gamut. And we recognize those at our national convention. So I would encourage anyone who has not received your plaque for a master observer to make sure you get a hold of us and uh, uh, sign up for being awarded that uh, plaque at the National Convention. Now back to you, Scott. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Well, our next speaker got turned on to astronomy when he was only 14 years old. Uh, he was uh, looking at the beautiful ring planet of Saturn. And then he saw an apparition through a telescope of Comet West, probably by the naked eye as well. And uh, that really uh, hooked the guy and uh, addicted him to astronomy like nothing else. He went on to write his own magazine called Deep, Deep Space Mo Monthly or Deep Sky Monthly, excuse me. And uh, uh, that led to him being eventually the editor in chief of Astronomy Magazine. Uh, of course, I'm speaking about David Eicher, uh, and, you know, he is coming to share uh, his love of, uh, of astronomy through the lens of crystals and minerals that we see here right on planet Earth. So, um, David, I'm really happy to have you on each, each Global Star Party. In fact, you're on most of them uh, at this point, and we're really, really pleased to have you. Um, so what do you got for us tonight? Thank you, Scott. I'm going to talk about calcite tonight, which is a very common mineral, and it's different colors and forms. 
But uh, first, let me mention a couple of other little things, if I can, quickly here. First, just to echo what David was saying uh, about the the Burbages. I mean, when you when you met them, when you were in their pre they were really a a very very English power couple in astronomy. And and Jeff Burbage, as you mentioned, David was the director of Kit Peak for a while, but he was also working on you know uh, how stars. Uh, transformed light elements into heavy ones and, and the whole process of how stars worked. And they both worked on um, extra galactic stuff. Margaret there in that clip, in, which I think was from the 70s, was talking about quasars there before, you know, another 10 or 15 years. And it was clear what quasars were then. But they were both into that as well. And then Jeff Burbage, who was, you know, a great big, you know, guy, uh, a mammoth force, um, uh, you know, he was also very interested in sort of alternative cosmological models. And, and mm. it was just fascinating to listen to both of them. And David, I think you could, you know, you really felt like you were in a powerful matrix there with, with the Burbages, didn't you? Absolutely. And uh, especially when I heard him speak at the Texas Star Party, and it was really being in the presence of true greatness. Absolutely. As they say, Margaret was the better astronomer, and I think they're right. <laughs> Agreed. And and she lived long. Jeff lived until he was 85, but Margaret, uh, as Scott said, made it all the way to the century mark. Um, so that, that was a great uh, thing there. And then I also uncovered something from our pal Kevin Schindler at Lowell Observatory here. And David, I didn't have the time to mention this to you, but this is something that you will know better than anyone. But our old friend Clyde Tombaugh was a great punster. You know, you could be when we were there at the Texas Star Party observing with him, we'd be sitting in the dark and about a minute would go by and another pun would roll out and you'd just go, oh, no. Clyde, you know, groaning, you know, at these things. He would just one after the other. Some of his favorite puns were about crows. Hmm. You remember that, David? And Absolutely, do I ever. And there's a list here that, that I can't, that I believe Kevin dug up here. So I'll read a couple of these and I'll save many of them for, for later, but there's a whole long list of them. So, but this is, this gives you a true look at Clyde's humor. I think David, you'll, you'll back this, me up on this. With whom does a crow associate? His cronies. Ah. Oh, Clyde, <laughs> you know, you just say, you know, that was all you could say, wasn't it, Doug? <laughs> where do they meet in a, where, where else in a crowbar? <laughs> oh. <laughs> what do crows drink, old crow? <laughs> Who was the first man to see the crow? Cro-Magnon man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cro magnon man. Where does a crow keep his money? It's really tiny Clyde handwriting here. In mm. escrow. That's <laughs> so that that's just that that's out there. There are many, many more of them, but I mean that is a true sample in Clyde's own handwriting of Clyde humor. One um, thing about one thing about his puns is that. Not only did he pun all the time, especially about the annular eclipse of the sun, did we get a ringside seat, but he um, insisted on a response. If he came out with a pun and you didn't respond, he would repeat the pun. So that's a beautiful planet by Jove, by Jove, by Jove, and you had to groan before he'd go on with the conversation. Uh, Man. It, it, it was exhilarating to spend a night with him, and it could be a little bit exhausting, too, frankly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's a true look at, at Clyde Tombaugh. Um, and I will go on to talk about even more mineralogy. We haven't run out of minerals yet, but I will try to share my screen, and I will try to start a slideshow. And again, we're looking at a rhodochrosite crystal here, which is not what we're going to talk about. That's a placeholder tonight. Uh, but minerals, of course, tell us about how the universe is ordered. 
I believe in a divinely ordered universe, said Thomas Jefferson. Uh, centuries beforehand, Isaac Newton said, truth is ever to be found in the simplicity and not in the multiplicity and confusion of things. Well, the universe is ordered and uh, not by supernaturalism, however, but by naturalism, by the principles of physics. Minerals demonstrate that, and they're because we know through spectroscopy that chemistry is uniform throughout the universe. We have minerals here that we know could very well exist on countless other planets, other worlds throughout our galaxy and other galaxies. Their atoms are assembled in precise ways by electrochemical attractions, inherent properties of the atoms that make them up and guide them into assembling in a specific, what mineralogists call a crystal lattice. Well, calcite is an extremely common mineral and it can be somewhat attractive. Uh, it's calcium carbonate. It's an ancient name, calcite. It was named as a mineral uh, by Pliny the Elder in AD 79 from the word calx, which was Latin for lime. It comes in many, many, it's often white or translucent or yellowish, but it comes in many, many colors, including red and orange and blue and green and brown and gray, depending on various uh, contaminants within the crystal lattice, if you will. It's extremely common and it's a very widespread mineral. It has very highly variable forms and colors. It's a member of the so-called calcite group, the main member and of the calcite rhodochrosite series. That reddish rhodochrosite that's colored by manganese atoms is related to calcite as well. Both are carbonates that are very similar. Calcite, uh, as far as its uh, crystallographic structure, is trigonal. Uh, it has calcium, carbon, and oxygen atoms involved there, you can see. And I thought, as always, I would just show a few examples of what calcite can look at and look like in different forms. This is a, uh, a calcite from an iron mine with a little bit of iron that's coloring it yellow there in it from Kazakhstan. Uh, and it's sort of typical oh, of, the, of, the, of the crystals that you get. Sorry, was there a question or comment there? Well, I was just saying, David, that's beautiful. This is really neat. Oh, thanks. Feel free to pipe in if, if you have, have things. Um, this is a, a little bit more uh, pedestrian locality here from uh, a very well-known mineralogical region in Missouri that produces enormous uh, numbers of calcite and, and, of also, and also of iron, various iron minerals. Here's a Wisconsin specimen. Wisconsin is not very rich in, in mineral species, but this is one of them out in, in the Mississippi River area here. Uh, Lafayette County uh, calcite with galena. Galena is a lead mineral um, from Schulzburg, Wisconsin. Calcite that's colored by cobalt atoms can become very, very vivid pink and purple and other hues. And a recent mineral, uh, recent being the last generation, uh, mineralogical area in Morocco in the Atlas Mountains is very famous for all sorts of species of minerals, including some of the best cobalto and calcite, as it's called, that's very strongly colored. Calcite that is cleaved in a certain way, if you, if you conk it on its head and you cleave, make a cleavage, uh, you can get from certain localities a kind of calcite that's called uh, Iceland spar. Um, and the, this is a Mexican uh, specimen of it. And the reason why it is called that is because it produces uh, optically, it's fairly uh, transparent and produces a double refractive image of things that uh, are shown through it and shows the optical property of, of calcite in that way. Here's more cobalt contaminated calcite. This also from that Moroccan region of the Atlas Mountains. And you can see even from the same site, there are some fairly different uh, appearances and, and crystal structures of the very same mineral that you can get. One of the great areas for gold and silver and for other minerals in the United States and even in the world is, is the Colorado, the San Juan Mountains and, and related areas in Colorado. This is a manganese bearing calcite. I don't know if you can see that, but it's sort of softly pink, the color here from 
from Mangades, uh, and this is from a very famous Colorado old time mine called the Camp Bird Mine up in near Ure, Colorado, very famous mine. This is, you can see the hexagonal crystal structure of this piece here, which is a Chinese, which is a relatively recent find of the last 15 years or so. Uh, and this is an interesting one. You know, we think of the interplay between non-living and living things in the universe sometimes and how we know we're many of the atoms in our body. We have about seven octillion atoms in our bodies on average, uh, each of us. That's seven billion billion atoms. Well, most all of those atoms came from the deaths of either massive stars or the collisions of neutron stars or the deaths of low mass stars uh, like dwarfs even as well, or a small number uh, uh, as far as mass, but a large number quantitatively from big bang nucleosynthesis in the early history of the universe. Well, it turns out that you know non-living atoms can turn into living things. We're all proving that tonight, but this is something that was alive that has transformed itself back into a mineral. This is calcite from Florida, from a famous uh, area called the Rux Pit, Okeechobee County, Florida. And this is a, you can't see, it's turned so you can see the top of the shell just at the very top of this image behind the yellowish golden calcite. But if you turn this piece around, it shows you a complete uh, shell of, a, of an animal mm -hmm. that died, Mercenaria permagna. Uh, and it's about one and a half million years old, this fossil. And what has happened is that the shells of this animal, which are almost entirely calcite, has recrystallized into this calcite crystals as a mineral here. So here you have a living organism on Earth turning back with most of its mass and energy back into a mineral. The reverse. Like a barnacle. Uh, I'm sorry? It's like a barnacle. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so this is kind of the reverse process, if you will, of what we often talk about, that we, as we're living things talking to each other, are made of the uh, previously inanimate uh, atoms of the universe. The reverse can happen too. Here's just to show one more specimen and a rare opportunity from Wisconsin. This is a calcite from the area of Racine, Wisconsin here. Hmm. Um, that is sort of milky colored stuff. Uh, and here is the, the golden yellow, lemon yellow stuff here is calcite. This is a famous area that produces these very showy, lovely specimens of barium sulfate. That's called barite, the mineral that's that dark sort of tan color um, crystal that is on the background calcite. And this is from the Elk Creek area of South Dakota. Here you might be able to see somewhat faintly, uh, depending on our connection and your monitors, that a little bit of this specimen is pinkish. And that's some manganese in this specimen from another very famous uh, Colorado gold and silver mine, the Idorado mine uh, in Telluride. This is a very famous old time mine in, in the West. And this is not what they would have predominantly been looking for at these mines, but this is a, a gang specimen, as it was called, um, that they took home for a laugh. They were really looking for gold and silver here. David, but a nice, what does it mean? There's, it says 29 to 1300 stope. What is okay, that? Okay. Now this is mineralogists, just as we talk about, say, regions within galaxies that we're interested in where there's a star forming cloud, say in NGC 2403, that's a gal distant galaxy in our sky. Mineralogists are very, very interested in the specific localities of things, as exact as they can be about where specimens come from, because that tells them about the composition, the, mineralo the mineralogy, the, the period in which it was collected, all sorts of things like that. So a stope is an area within a mine and a vein even is an area within a mine. So this is from a particular little area, uh, the 29, 1300 stope that is mapped out in this huge famous gold and silver mine predominantly. 
within a particular vein that they were exploring inside the mine. Uh, and this simply tells you where this piece came from very specifically in this case, which is of interest to the collectors. Very interesting. Here's a big hefty chunk of about a fist or a little bigger size chunk of calcite from uh, another famous mining region, Dal Nagorsk, Russia. And you can you might be able to see there are little tiny bits that are bright on the surface of this and it's got little sort of blebs of pyrite, which is a shiny like gold colored mineral on this calcite crystal here that's reflecting light. Here's another sort of more typical crystal, and this is a twinned one. You can see there's one crystal on top that's intertwined with another one on the bottom. Here, a Chinese specimen here that's fairly common of recent years. Uh, and this is a related mineral here, the pinkish stuff called kutnohorite. Now that's from a region in the Czech Republic, what's now the Czech Republic, called Kutnohora. Uh, and it's a calcium manganese carbonate with carbonate with also with some whitish calcite here. This is a South African piece. And you can see there are these sort of very uh, blade like crystals here, just to show you the all sorts of different forms. Uh, they're beautiful. These, these minerals. This is a very similar oh, okay. mineral to calcite called dolomite, calcium magnesium carbonate. Uh, and this is, again, has cobalt atoms to make it very strongly purple colored in it. And, and from a very famous area in the Congo, which is Katanga, which is most famous because it, it, you can read about the prehistoric enormous uh, nuclear ex explosion that happened uh, deep within Earth in the Katanga Copper Crescent millions of years ago, a nuclear reaction. There was so much uh, radioactive mineralogy in Earth there. Couldn't help myself. Here's an, yet another, there are so many, so few opportunities to show a Wisconsin specimen. That's interesting. Here's another calcite from uh, Wisconsin from way out west, the Montreal mine in Iron County, Wisconsin up north as well. Here's more of this unusual, and these are very much needle-like little crystals of kutnohorite uh, with another mineral called aragonite in here, which is inside this rock, like a little geode, if you will, an Italian uh, locality that produces this kind of stuff. And that's what I had for calcite tonight. And again, I will just quickly, uh, very briefly, now this time mention Starmus, uh, and we're going to be holding this meeting, the International Science Festival in September in Armenia. You can see more at starmus.com uh, and it'll have many speakers and a whole lot of rock and roll going on at Starmus, as well as science astronauts, Nobel Prize winners, astronomy, chemistry, biology, and loud music to enjoy. Loud music. <laughs> Good loud music. Yes, pretty good loud music with Brian May, Rick Wakeman, Peter Gabriel, et cetera, et cetera. It's pretty good stuff. Yeah, it's going to be so, awesome. Scott, you're going to join us for the star party. Yes. We'll explore yes, scientific this year for Starma. So we're looking forward to that with telescopes there and with, a, we think, a big crowd of maybe a thousand or more people just at the star party event. It's going to be fantastic. I mean, look at this lineup of speakers, Charlie Duke, uh, Kip Thorne, Nicole Stott. Uh, George Smoot, Garrick Israelian, who's um, uh, one of the founders of the event, of course, uh, Jill Tarter, and my friend and yours, David Eicher. So it's there's got to totally be cool. one. There's there's got to be one runner up in every group of speakers. <laughs> but this is just the preliminary. There will be many more speakers we will announce over the summertime. Yeah, so it's going to be super exciting, and it's something that. Uh, if you can make it, you should go. So, right. That's wonderful. Um, and, you know, every time that we look at the uh, crystals that you show, David, I, I keep thinking, well, how's he going to top this? How's he going to top that? You know, because they're so beautiful, you know, and it's wonderful to be able to take, be, be kind of led by the hand uh, to show um, or to understand what these crystals and minerals are all about. You know, so 
um, I love it. So. Well, thanks, Scott. It's fun stuff. My dad contaminated me with all of these interests. So once you get into this stuff, you can't really get out of it. But eventually I'll get here back into some pure astronomy to talk about, I promise. Oh, no problem. It is pure astronomy. Yeah, it's yeah. pure astronomy. It's, it's just a close up look at it. So which is great. That's great. OK, well, we are going to uh, move on to our next uh, segment here um, uh, with um, John Briggs. Uh, John Briggs is uh, has a, a very long uh, uh, biographical uh, story, but uh, uh, let me just say this. John has uh, been involved in um, has been close to the fire, uh, so to speak, with uh, all things astronomical. Uh, he is a, uh, you know, he is a, a living historian of, of uh, you know, people and artifacts and books and, uh, and all of these things. And um, very, very appropriately, he was appointed the new secretary of the Alliance of Historic Observatories. Um, and uh, he has started a, a series of talks that will include um, all of the historical observatories that are associated with this organization. Uh, last, um, uh, last week we had uh, Kevin Schindler from uh, Lowell Observatory, and this week we have Tom Meneghini, who's the Executive Director of Mount Wilson Observatory. So I'm going to turn this over to John uh, and let him talk about the Alliance a little bit and what he's currently up to, uh, as well as making an introduction to Tom Meneghini. Uh, as always, Scott, uh, thank you so much. It's great to be back again, uh, everyone. And uh, we can look forward to conversations with Tom in, 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 uh, in just a few minutes here. Um, but it, I was uh, uh, very lucky as a young man to live and work at Mount Wilson Observatory for a while in the late 1980s. And Mount Wilson um, really uh, brought astronomy to the American uh, West Coast, uh, Southern West, into Southern California in, a, in, a, in such an amazing way, um, uh, both in terms of how the public became aware of astronomy and, and, and what was going on at Mount Wilson, uh, redefining what we understood about the universe um, and, and inspiring uh, uh, eventually uh, Caltech and uh, Mount Palomar and really so much of uh, 20th century astronomy uh, connected with Southern California and, and starting with Mount Wilson. Um, and I, before we talk with Tom, I just thought I would hold up this book that has just come out. If you, uh, I hope you can see it. It's got a really cool cover, a uh, public astronomy, Los Angeles style, uh, published by um, Griffith Observatory Foundation. And I'm uh, very proud to have contributed a chapter to this book that just became available on the um, uh, observatory website. Uh, and it's really, it's a history book. It includes history of Los Angeles Astronomical Society, um, a lot of history about the creation of Griffith Observatory and uh, our East Coast, uh, United States friends, the East Coast, uh, know a lot about Russell Porter uh, at Stellafane and Russell Porter had an awful lot to do with the creation of Griffith and its design, its elegant design. And a lot of people contributed to this book. It was edited by David Dvorkin and Ed Krupp, Dvorkin being at the Smithsonian and Ed at um, uh, the director of Griffith Observatory. And the chapters include uh, Public Astronomy, Los Angeles Style by Dvorkin, um, uh, the early years of amateur astronomy in Los Angeles, um, uh, by Tom Williams, Los Angeles Astronomical Society by Lewis Chilton, and the Space Age Legacy 
of telescope designer George Carroll. I, that's one I wrote, and especially wonderful uh, Crating Griffith Observatory by Anthony Cook. So anyway, I shouldn't go on and on about it, but it relates to Southern California and a lot to Mount Wilson too. And it's, it's beautifully illustrated, was very ele elegantly designed. So I wanted to show it off a little bit, but uh, with those words, um, we spoke about um, um, the Alliance, this organization of historic observatories that had its first meeting a little over two years ago. And we spoke about that some last week. And we spoke about how the, the formative meeting was at Mount Wilson at the wonderful monastery library room, some uh, very intimate discussions with some real leading astronomers and um, this is going to serve as a forum, um, yeah. I hope for small observatories as well as big observatories to share information and vision of how they might best uh, define themselves in the future with changing research priorities, but of course, ongoing opportunities for, for uh, public education and inspiration. And there are a few places in the world where more of that is, uh, or as much of that is going on as Mount Wilson still. And uh, Tom being with us, um, I would like to uh, have him uh, join in and tell us a little bit about uh, uh, the current activities uh, as, as, as a director of Mount Wilson. And um, uh, it's, it's, opening up as so many other things after the pandemic and it's a very exciting place. So Tom, um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on at Mount Wilson right now? Um, everything, uh, we basically had a two year hiatus on operations and um, demand is overwhelming. We're getting crushed with uh, bookings for telescope reservations. Uh, in January, I was, they were people were asking about tours and visiting uh, while we were under snow. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of pent up demand for people to get out, and I'm glad they're uh, considering Mount Wilson Observatory as one of their destinations. And uh, back to the back to our our um, historical observatories. Uh, I think one of the impetus uh, impeti, if you will, is uh, survival. Uh, we are a hundred, a century old institution uh, with, you know, century old instruments that are, are good, but they certainly aren't cutting edge. Uh, we have uh, old technology that we've updated in trying to make these instruments uh, useful and relevant, even uh, for student research is something I, I personally want to get into. So I'm, I'm really pushing student science, STEM education, um, wherever I can, and trying to find purposes for these old scopes, the 60 inch and 100 inch uh, especially, uh, which I think are, are large enough to be effective and uh, uh, I think can be made useful for student science. We have several groups that are going to do speckle interferometry and other projects up there this summer. Wonderful. And uh, with the goal of publishing their own paper, which they did a couple of years ago. So I, I, I love to have that happen because I like that type of activity. Um, and that's my reason for being with the observatory is to have that happen. So we have infrastructure uh, issues. Um, we're putting in new restrooms because there's only so many trees up on the mountain. So uh, we, need, we need to have new facilities and, uh, and we have uh, garnered a good good uh, chunk of money uh, towards that effort. And so we're gonna make improvements to make it uh, more hospitable to, to larger crowds uh, coming. Uh, we've also diversified our offerings. Um, maybe it's not a new one, but we, we're doing lectures again, monthly lectures up there. And we're augmenting them by opening up the uh, 60 inch and 100 inch for observing. So the attendees uh, for the lectures can, when it's finished, can. Go have a go have a hamburger from a food truck, and then go uh, look at one or two objects in one of our telescopes. And so those are very popular as well. Um, Mount, Mount, have... Mount Wilson is very fortunate having 
that great auditorium uh, right there available for you to use. And, and uh, but I don't know when that was built, but it dates back to the early days of the observatory and is as focused as the astronomers there were on their research, they obviously recognized the importance of having a facility like the auditorium to do what you're doing now. I think that was a Russell Porter uh, construct as well. Um, I did not know that. That's very so, interesting. <laughs> I think it is. I might be. I maybe have the wrong architect, but I think it was. I think it was built in like 30, 1937. That's there when was a was highway there. up there at the time. So uh, Angeles Crest was had been built, and they didn't have to come up a wagon trail. So that was uh, that was there, and it is good. And we've uh, I've managed to uh, tag on to a Chara grant for for. A, a new scope they're getting. They needed a public outreach component. So I've um, tagged on for $100,000 to improve the auditorium on that NSF grant. So we'll be looking to do a new projection system. Uh, we like to keep the character the same, but at least doing the, the restroom fixtures and plumbing and, and electrical systems all upgraded to, to being very reliable and functional. Wow, that's great! I I did I did not know. Is that construction going on now, or are you just gearing uh, we up just, for it? We just we just signed the grant um, two weeks ago, so it'll be wow. going over the next two years. Cool. Hundred thousand dollars won't go very far up there. <laughs> well, it's um it 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 it's sure a start uh, compared to how I know for some years the things have been on such a shoestring there. It's bound to make a big difference. Uh, any kind of difference is, is going to be an improvement, but I, I think we are going to we have it well placed in, in improvements. Um, the other, I guess, program we have is is concerts. Uh, this was kind of a offshoot of one of the one of the passions of one of our trustees um, wanted to bring um, different type of people, not not necessarily scientists, but maybe arts arts related people. Uh, who would who might enjoy the aesthetics of the mountain and the telescopes and so forth? So we have we're continuing our series of um, of concerts in the dome. Those are on Sundays. Uh, we'll do them once a month every month during the summer, and those have turned out to be wildly popular. Uh, I'm trying to get some rock and roll in there, though. Um, <laughs> So many, Shouldn't be they, too hard been, so many strings, so many strings I can tolerate. After a while, I gotta have a. They've been doing they've been doing concerts that I remember up at Lick Observatory at least back into the nineteen uh, eighties, right. and I, I gather they were always very successful as well. Yeah, uh, I think uh, getting to Mount Wilson is kind of more of a, a steeplechase. Uh, uh, it, it's it's amazing we get people up there. I think that in the in the in the numbers that we do, um, because I I don't think we're the uh, most accessible observatory, like compared to Griffith or or um, or, or Lowell, uh, but uh, people manage to get up there. They they dodge the rocks and the deer, and they yeah. get up there safely and back down again. So that's yeah. that's wonderful. Tom, tell maybe you can expand a little bit more what you said about um, a real um, uh, like 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 a pressure having built up for astronomy over the course of COVID. Um, it's, I hear that from telescope vendors and various people that there's been something of a renaissance of astronomy through the pandemic. And you think you see evidence for that too as Mount Wilson comes out of the pandemic. Uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of it's cabin fever too. Uh, people have been, been bottled up so long that they wanna get out and do something. Um, this is a destination that's 45 minutes, you know, up a mountain, which isn't too bad. Um, they get to look over the city, uh, look down on the clouds instead of up at them. So it's it's a it's a it's a refreshing uh, perspective. Um, uh, they have we have walking tours, we have uh, guided tours, we have private tours, we have well, we started engineering tours for the uh, for the uh, for the for the machine heads. Um, we have our, our engineers go through and they go down into the guts of the scopes and the generating machines and everything and they go and it's wonderful. It's, it's wildly popular too. So that's back again this year. We're doing two of those a month up at the... It, it must be true that 
so much of what you do is is uh, 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 facilitated, if not absolutely made possible by a fabulous uh, a team of volunteers. Could you tell us about uh, the size of your volunteer folks and and all that? Oh my, okay, I'm 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 one of them, um, <laughs> and and most of our most of our people are um, our telescope operators, our tour docents. Uh, the people who help with um, uh, sales of merchandise. And uh, I, I think um, we just had our uh, last annual meeting that was delayed for two years, but we had our annual meeting in the 100 inch two weeks ago, and there were 80 people in attendance. And wow. These were all volunteers, either current or prospective. So th that's, that's the type of, of draw we have for volunteers. And we wouldn't survive without volunteers at all. Yeah. We couldn't, we couldn't, we don't have enough money to pay all these people for what they do. You know, I think that right there, uh, as, as easy as it is to take for granted at Mount Wilson, um, it's a lesson that you can teach uh, based on your success to some other observatories. Because, you know, for example, when I worked at Yerkes, in the 1990s, there really wasn't anything like a core of volunteers um, there, even uh, when uh, certain outreach uh, um, uh, activities expanded at Yerkes. Um, it was really quite a novel idea when we had members of the Milwaukee Astronomical Society come and throw a star party for us on the South Lawn of Yerkes. That simply hadn't been going on uh, at Yerkes, but fortunately I had been at Mount Wilson before I worked at Yerkes and I knew about Mount Wilson Observatory Association back in those early days and how important it had been for Mount Wilson as soon as Carnegie Institution uh, redirected its funds down in South America or whatever, and the Mount Wilson Institute had to form. And uh, But I witnessed uh, some of those early days and how so many wonderful things uh, kept going, maybe the certain outreach things may be better than ever, thanks to your volunteers there. So, um, But I think that kind of uh, insight and experience is what uh, the Alliance is going to be all about as observatories like Mount Wilson, Yerkes, Lowell, Lick, uh, others uh, share share a strategy for the future. Do, I, uh, do you figure that's that's correct? Yes, I, it, that is, and I think that's the path forward for for us um, old old uh, gray observatories. That's that's the only way forward. Um, yeah. and, but we find one characteristic is all these people are very passionate, either about astronomy or the observatory or something connected with it. And, and they, they enjoy what they're doing. That's why they do it. And, and yeah. just, for that, just for the pure pleasure of, of um, interacting with people, uh, you know, showing, showing off the observatory. Uh, we've done a lot of improvements, so they've our engineers like to brag about what they've done, and, and rightly so. They've done some wonderful work in upgrading the control systems on those telescopes. It's amazing. Um, and and the people genuinely enjoy it, and uh, the public enjoys in interacting with them. And that's I think that's key. Yeah. The, the, uh, even the, uh, the smaller instruments, like the snow, hasn't that recently been very significantly renovated at, at the site? Yes, one chipping hammer at a time. Uh, <laughs> I think we we uh, we knocked off about eight coats of, of paint off the uh, pedestal for the coelostat, and mm -hmm. got it down to uh, to white metal, and um, did a two part uh, marine coating on it, and it looks beautiful. It's wonderful. It's uh, well, it's like uh, like showroom ready again. That 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 is great. Um, I was very lucky. Uh, in the early, early 1990s to have a chance to learn about the snow and we reactivated it for uh, CURIA, the Consortium for Undergraduate Research and Education in Astronomy. 
that has been an annual uh, summer program for mainly for college uh, undergraduates, but um, it, nobody was learning more about solar astronomy and uh, uh, litro spectrographs than I, when I was there for the first couple years uh, of Curia. And, you know, um, I believe that Hale himself had um, a, a, a particular a passion for the importance of how beautiful the solar spectrum was for people and students to see it and, and it, to, to, for it to um, inspire very intense curiosity about physics and optics and what the heck are all those Fraunhofer lines as a, as a Rosetta stone for the chemistry of the sun. And there is something about seeing the solar spectrum with a high dispersion spectrograph or spectroscope with an eyepiece on it, like you can do with the snow telescope that is simply indescribable. It's, it's, um, uh, and there are, there are a few books out there that convey this, but they're not well known um, nowadays, maybe to many uh, amateur astronomers. That's why I can't help trying to inject a few words here about just how beautiful and interesting and dynamic, surprisingly dynamic, the solar spectrum is when you get a chance to right. experience it with something like the snow. Right, and uh, we, we found out by measurement that, I don't know if you knew this, John, but that uh, um, that grading is blazed in third order. And it is, it is a, a superb dispersion at third order. It is. Yes, I remember. I remember well because the th as, I, as I recollect, um, third when you're using it in third order, um, um, you still don't have to use. I don't think um, an order separating filter. And now these are technicalities now, yeah. but it's so interesting to learn what this stuff is. Getting your hands on an instrument like this as a as a student. Um, uh, but but the, 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 the way diffraction gratings work, it's central to so much of astronomical in, 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 instrumentation. But with a facility like the snow, students and teachers and visitors can really, really get personal insight on these things that is, um, it's a very precious thing. And I wish more people um, could enjoy it too. Um, yeah. There's a book that I that I uh, love, simply entitled "The Sun" by Charles Young, and it was published back in the 1890s. And uh, Charles Young was a real pioneer of uh, solar physics in American astronomy. And anybody interest, interested in learning about how exciting the solar spectrum is, I recommend starting with the book "The Sun." by Charles Young. And I left a copy of it in the snow telescope that I believe is still there in a cabinet. <laughs> I know which I know which cabinet. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh. The one on the top. I, yep. if, I, if I can uh, share my screen for a second, John, I can, if I can try and I'll try and get this up here. This is the snow with its, its new paint job. Right, right on. Uh, here it is. I don't know if that's visible or not there. Oh, it is. Wow. That's Patricia Hill. She's now the the keeper, the keeper of the snow. She's she owns it. Right and on. I look forward to meeting her. Yeah, she's uh, she's an elementary school teacher retired and she latched onto this project and she handles the STEM students, does our lecture on spectroscopy. Excellent. You think she was a PhD in uh, That's great. In, in solar physics. She really does a great job. There's a there's a box there on the lower left. Um, it actually has like a plexiglass window, the dark surface facing us on the lower left. And I, of course, you know, but it's fun to explain this for our listeners. Oh. But that's the uh, the governor mechanism in there for the weight driven clock drive. But one of the interesting features of the instrument is that there are interchangeable uh, gear boxes that slide into ways 
in right inside there. And one of them is labeled sidereal for the stars. One of them is labeled solar for the sun. And if I recall right, Lunar. there's a third one that's Lunar. labeled for the moon. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's not right. For the moon. That's right. Yeah. So the, the gears are ever so slightly changed uh, mm. to approximate the average tracking rate of, um, of the moon and, the, of course, the constant rate of the stars, too. So it was very much envisioned that the snow could be used for nighttime work as well. That I actually have looked at the moon with it and a couple other things like wow. that just because you could do it. And, I mean, who could resist not giving it a try? So. Right. Fantastic. Oh, nice! Look at that. So that that's really uh, cool. That's with a crowd of with a group of students in there. We have the uh, Sela stand, of course, aimed, uh, and you see the the uh, folding mirror there down to the uh, Sela stat and back up. So we are we are producing a, a solar spectrum there on the stage, um, uh, and this is the great beauty of this scope is you're standing inside of the telescope. You're teaching yeah. students and they're standing inside the telescope and that that just, that is so, so powerful that they're standing in a telescope uh, and they can see what's happening with the light and what's happening. And so it's very powerful, very reinforcing. And I think it's one of the best teaching instruments around. Absolutely, absolutely. It produces an image of the sun about seven inches in diameter with an F30 focus from a 24 inch uh, paraboloid. And that's what's being illuminated way far back there in the room. The sunbeam coming off the, uh, the, the two flat mirrors outdoors goes down through this room, hits that um, uh, one concave mirror down at the far end that's so bright there, but then it comes back and focuses um, bouncing off a flat on the ceiling and then down towards that white thing in the lower left, which is the head of, of, a, of a spectrograph, a litro spectrograph that goes down deep into the mountain, that pit um, underneath there is something like 30 feet deep, I think, isn't it, Tom? Yes. Yeah, and there's a hatch. You can open the hatch and there's a ladder that you can climb down in there to work on it. And it was so amazing having a chance to learn about that, um, in my case, back in the early 90s. And I had worked as an observer with the 60-inch telescope uh, in the late 80s, but the snow was simply locked up at that time, and it was just a great mystery. I mean, I knew a little bit about its history, uh, but I, I, it wasn't part of my job to go in there, and I was usually, I was too busy um, to, 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 to get, you know, to ask or, or, or to, to, to poke around in there wasn't appropriate until the time came in the circa 1990 when uh, the summer educational program started and I volunteered to get involved because the, to me, the snow, it was, you know, it was like a, a, the great pyramid in Egypt or something. It was very, very mysterious and when I did finally have a chance to get in and learn about the hatch and the ladder and the spectrograph, uh, all these cool things, all the little the, the gearbox details, um, um, well, it, 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 it lived up to expectations for coolness. That's all I can say. For sure. It's the, it's the land OSHA forgot. Right. Oh, exactly. <laughs> you know what, man? The stuff like that that actually makes it good. <laughs> 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 right on well and and i know we're probably running out of time and i'll leave it to scott to get out the hook you know and pull us off stage here but um my, uh, my dear friend going back through all those years larry webster he continues to be um uh, one of the astronomer engineers who uh, lives with his family right up on the mountain is that not correct tom continuing yes Wonderful. And, and do I understand correctly that Larry recently has been working on a big upgrade for your aluminizing chamber? He, as part of an NSF grant, um, I think what they're going to wind up doing is redoing the wiring loom on it. Okay. I don't think they're going to 
I don't think they're going to do much with the ceiling or the uh, vacuum pump. And okay. I think that was one of the things they were looking at was the vacuum pump, but uh, I think it's it's adequate. So I don't know if that's been scaled back a little bit or not. But uh, oh well, um, um, the uh, the man who pioneered the vacuum deposition technique for um, a tall scope mirrors evaporating aluminum rather than the chemical deposition of silvering on mirrors, as many people here know but I can't resist bringing it up, was a guy named John Strong. And he ended up, and he pioneered this at Mount Wilson. Hmm. And, uh, but in his later years, he went to teach and do research at University of Massachusetts. And I have a confession to make. I have a confession of what was probably one of the, the great mistakes of my life. <laughs> was that I was a student my freshman year at University of Massachusetts, and I heard something about John Strong as a profoundly expert man in experimental physics and telescopes and all kind of stuff. And I actually had a long telephone call with him, but I, and he invited me, he said, I called him up, you know, as a, as, a, as a kid up in my dormitory, I called him up and he said, well, gee, you know, you're very interested in telescopes and optics, and you should come down and visit me in my laboratory. You know what? So I was there for one lazy, corrupted year. I never took advantage of going down to John Strong. And had I done that, it probably would have changed my life. But eventually, though, I did meet him. And he, when he was a speaker at the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston, and along the way, I learned that he wrote a book called Procedures in Experimental Physics. And he was a very close friend of Russell Porter when they were all together out there in California. And um, people who are interested in optics and instrument making and glass blowing and how to make a Schmidt camera corrector and all kinds of things, precision machining, all that stuff is in this book, famous book, but it has become all too obscure to modern students, Procedures in Experimental Physics by John Strong. And I just ha couldn't resist mentioning that, too, because I'm telling you, it's a good one. So anyway, I think I probably I've gone on too long. It's but okay. Tom, thank you very much for being with us. But, and I hope so before we you guys before you guys go, uh, I would uh, uh, I know that the Burbages worked at Mount Wilson, uh, did some very important work there. Uh, Margaret Burbage uh, did a tremendous amount of work at, at a time when uh, you know, it was uh, difficult for women to be on the mountain, and uh, but she did it anyways. And um, uh, you know, what can what can you guys tell us uh, uh, on this day? It might it might have been a challenge for her, given the traditions at the monastery, I suppose, and the oh, yeah. <laughs> the 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 male dominated housing arrangement but i gather she persevered anyway right was uh, was she the one who had to sign telescope time in her husband's name yeah for jeffrey burbage that's yep, true that's the that's one true. she had to get telescope time she had to sign her husband's name to get it and, and apparently she lived at the captain cottage okay which yep. was up there and um uh they could not uh, she, I, I guess at one point she became pregnant uh, uh, while working up at the observatory, but they had to keep that secret at the time, uh, you know, just because of the protocols that were in place. Uh, so, so much has changed um, at Thank Mount goodness. Wilson, uh, you know, and some great uh, women astronomers have, have led the way at, uh, at that historic observatory as well. So, Mount Wilson is uh, certainly steeped in all that history and tra old traditions, but uh, uh, brought in many new traditions, uh, you know, as, as we reach the modern era. Well, Scott, I wanted to mention that uh, when I was reading up on, uh, on some of what she went through trying to get to Mount Wilson, when a lot of the staff there were really upset about the idea of a woman astronomer coming in and taking over time, 
their argument was that there was no bathroom facility available that would be appropriate for a woman to use. And uh, so when Tom was saying that they're redoing the bathrooms, I was reminded of that. And I was reading a paper from the early 80s about how we would never make this mistake again. You know, we know now the, the importance of women. And yet you see with that spacewalk that was canceled last year because they didn't have the right size spacesuits for the women astronauts. It, these oversights, these like this, this approach that we have when we design and build an infrastructure, it, it's, it's, it's endemic and we, got, we really have to work at breaking it. And I'm glad that she persevered. You know, you read all about her at every step of the way, just like with Cecilia Payne, just like with uh, a, a lot of the women astronomers who we now look at uh, with such awe and esteem. They had to work past so many obstacles just to do the work that they found interesting, let alone excel, excel at it the way they did. Yeah, but they, but uh, Margaret Burbage, uh, from what I understand, was uh, uh, very, um, you know, headstrong and 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 making sure that she was doing great science and uh, didn't let anything stand in her way. And uh, and she did get her chance to make her mark at Mount Wilson. So the the uh, talk about spectra of the sun, I'm just really curious uh, to know more about what she learned about uh, 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 spectra of stars. And, uh, you know, because she is the she's credited as the founder of uh, stellar nucleosynthesis. So and uh, that, that, that paper that she wrote with her husband and with uh, Fred Hoyle and a few others is just it's the seminal piece that yeah. really explains the way in which heavier elements were made all the way up to iron. Yeah, and it's incredible. incredible. But while uh, Tom and John are here, um, the summer school that you were talking about, I actually received the flyer for SOAR for this year. Right. It looks incredible. Uh, is there any way I could pass for, you know, 18 to 21 if I shave or something? Yeah, you no, you wouldn't have a problem, really. Why don't you uh, volunteer to, to be an instructor? There you I, go. Yeah, you know what? Maybe I can spend a couple of uh, a couple of weeks or a month in in California. I think I could I I could handle that. Work? It's okay. it's the altitude that I'm not sure my body can handle, but uh, the work would be amazing. Some some adults have participated uh, in earlier years with the younger students. The thing is, when any of us are at Mount Wilson, we are all students, and um, it's especially wonderful when. There's a range of ages present because we, of course, uh, learn all learn from each other in really cool ways. I, I look I look back at my memories of my own time there among uh, the fondest uh, astronomical memories of my entire life. So um, so, yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'll make well, sure wonderful. you get a good room. Make sure you get a good room at the monastery. OK. <laughs> Excellent. That's right. Well, thank you very much, John and, and Tom, uh, for coming on. Thank you for and, having uh, us. Uh, hope to uh, get yet another observatory from the Alliance to come on for next week, if that's possible. So uh, great. So um, we are going to do a transition. In fact, our next speaker is, is Kareem Jaffer. Um, uh, he'll be on there with uh, Koa Tran. But, um, uh, Maxi Filari is, is has got his telescope all set up in Argentina. He's streaming uh, live views through his telescope right now. We thought it would be, you know, since this is a star party, uh, we thought it would be nice to actually show some uh, live views through a telescope in between speakers. That's something you really can't do at a normal star party uh, when you're in the conference hall. So uh, we're going to switch over to Maxi right now and. Uh, uh, why don't you let us know what you got there? Well, hello, guys. How are you? <laughs> Thank you, Scott, for, for inviting me. Uh, well, I I came for my work this evening, and then I, I had to be in the GSP, so I put my equipment outside with my homework uh, clothes and everything, but I, I was trying to do some... Uh, pictures, of course, to the moon, uh, to the, this uh, crescent moon, uh, because I have here, well, right now, no, because it's uh, below of the horizon at this time, but uh, I was practicing the, 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 the polar alignments and everything, and I think it's going really, really fine. 
And then I well, I tried to do some some uh, pictures of a serious star, a practicing focus, and everything. And now I'm in a particular area uh, here in the South Place. Let me share my screen. Um, okay, do you see it? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So basically, or well, here's Stellarium software. Okay, we have here uh, this uh, the south, the the, the uh, southern polar, uh, celestial polar, and of course we have the the meridian here. Uh, right now, I'm pointing to this place nearby the Canopus star. This is this is the a, a really brightest uh, star, like Sirius. Uh, star and we have it here in the summer skies we we call they are like brothers because they are very similar in in the magnitude of uh, both stars and here in in this uh, going more to to the left we have this particular star but it has a nebula behind of that and this was uh, this called the butterfly nebula, but also the Toby Hug nebula, because I think it was uh, his discover. So okay, right now I'm taking uh, well pictures of three minutes, and you can see the brightest star. Oh, it's yeah. like the the Eta Carina nebula, uh, uh, where you have Eta Carina star and behind that star of that brightness you have the homunculus and all that kind of nebulosity well this is some kind of that and i think this can be see by telescope in clear skies well here i have my soul solar skies really pollutional by a lead light but uh, anyway taking three uh, subs of three minutes uh, is, is uh, pretty amazing. For example, let me, well, no, th sorry, it was uh, two minutes, but if I take a single picture of five seconds, this is a live view, okay? I'm using a ZWO Azure Plus uh, connected to, to my Wi-Fi and of course uh, to the camera and everything, mm -hmm. but I'm, co I'm controlling it inside of my house you know nice. Enrico, my friend doesn't like this because it's i'm i'm like uh, I, I like to be comfortable when i do pictures you know i <laughs> spend a lot of hours uh, absorbing uh, cold humidity and everything and now i say okay, now that's all i have to be more comfortable and try to enjoy this particularly job but of course i like to be outside when i walk when i in the in the field or in the the rural skies that's that's worth it but here in the city well it's what i got um well you can see in five seconds anyway you you uh, you also able to see a particularly arms of the of this nebula and well uh, nearby there, we have so, uh, some uh, open clusters. This is the, well, Velocista, I don't know how to say in English, Velocist, I think, <laughs> uh, Cumulus. So if you want, I will be there. Uh, let me see, okay. NGC 2516. So we go to here. Let's put the name ngc we say uh, while well, you're doing that maxi i just have to say i, I love those diffraction spikes They're beautiful <laughs> yes, now i know nice. what to get you for christmas <laughs> diffraction <laughs> spikes <laughs> no 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 it looks it looks really nice no it is really. beautiful you're right yeah but well, right now the 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 Azure plus is a uh, moving the, the mount to this place and doing the plate solving to get centered the the object that I put. Now it's taking pictures, detects 
and now it's say it's centered sometimes it's not but you can you can uh, put it there well what, what was remarkable we maxi was being able to see nebulosity with five seconds of exposure now it's was, amazing because right? it, you can also well uh, this there, there, there is a thing here okay um for example what well, i'm taking also here a five second picture let me uh, because it, it gets the the mount uh, still tracking but uh this software has an auto stretching there you go okay Very let nice. me put the instagram you can see it's really compressed to get the the details in a really short time short time but if i reset it this is the single picture because i have a 100 gain and five seconds it's mm -hmm. particularly you you'll only see the stars a, a few stars but uh, using this uh, tool uh, the, it gets the the auto stretching uh, of the of the picture okay awesome. so this this what, what, what uh, i learned Matthew, is what? that uh, the the, the pix insight is called a screen transfer function so it kind of yeah exactly a live, a live stretch it doesn't actually it, manipulate the data but it gives you a view uh real time in a quick and dirty way on what it could be transformed and then if you save the data you can always post process it later exactly uh, simulate simulates what you're going to uh, seeing or maybe you can get a uh, of course when you get more uh, pictures when you stack it you get more info and you can stretch it a lot because if for example you can see the background if i go more higher it's it's getting shining but the background is starting to get uh, noisy so uh, when you take pictures and stack it, you get more info, and that background is getting more uh, uh, denoising, for example. Uh, well, this is a, an open cluster here nearby. Uh, I think I also in, is in the Carina, uh, in the constellation of, of La Quilla, because we have here uh, the, the principal arm of in the southern uh, hemisphere of the galaxy okay now it's raising up the center of the galaxy but uh, here in the south almost uh, we have here the well i think not the southern cross is here well we have the carina nebula uh i don't know if we have time we can go to another place and of course i will be online here uh, i'll try to be up. in in the GSP, and everyone is watching, and uh, of course here in the audience uh, or and in the the Zoom meeting, uh, you can tell me what objects you can want to to see, because uh, this is not time you you always see this kind particularly objects, of and also of course in the in the in the northern skies, so. If you want, for example, let's go to this another object because I hear I have it uh, the nearby. No, the jewel box is in the Southern Cross mm -hmm. here. So, so, uh, so we'll let the audience uh, choose. You guys um, in the Northern Hemisphere look in the Southern Hemisphere uh, star maps that you might have and um, uh, pick out some favorite objects. Uh, we're going to. Uh, continue doing these transitions and maxi uh does have a um, a longer segment here right after uh kareem and koa so at this point we should probably go ahead and transition and um and uh, keep moving through our speakers um uh who are waiting in the wings here so mm -hmm. all right so um at this point uh we will introduce uh uh Kareem Jaffer, he was on just a little bit earlier talking with uh, uh, Tom Meneghini and John Briggs about uh, Margaret Burbage. Um, but uh, Kareem Jaffer is uh, with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the Montreal Center, 
and he's also a professional professor of astronomy at John Abbott College. Uh, he's deeply involved in astronomy outreach and particularly with a focus on youth getting involved. And so uh, I've got some links I'll be sharing that uh, he sent to me, but uh, I'm gonna let Kareem take it away. Thanks, Scott. And uh, I'm really glad to see Tom here. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I received their flyer for their summer school for students, partly because I gave a talk to the Orange County astronomers and I ended up chatting with John Hoot, who is uh, one of their volunteer instructors for the summer school. And he's been mentoring one of my groups who's doing sonification. And so he's been working with them, providing them with some photometric curves. And they're just absolutely loving this. And uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing what they come up with for their project. But for tonight, I'm really happy to be joined by Kwa, one of my friends here at the RASC Montreal Center. And Kwa and I have kind of fallen down a bit of a rabbit hole over the last couple of days. So I'm going to get to that a little bit from now to tell you about how we got a chance to see a supernova for ourselves. But before I get to that, I want to talk a little bit about the check-in with some of the places that I work with for outreach. Um, as you're all aware, I'm part of Astro Radio Reach Out and Touch Space, and we had a great show yesterday uh, where we chatted a lot about the current space news. And then we ended up having a conversation for about 20 minutes about uh, whether or not there would be life in our solar system found somewhere. And so, you know, some nice divergent uh, discussion that's just fun to have. Um, with the University Lowbrows and with the RASC Montreal Center, I'm currently working on some newsletter articles. But what I want to chat with you about for my check-in is first and foremost, the cosmic generation. And the cosmic generation is one of the groups that Dovid and I have been working a lot with. This is a group of youth that are trying to organize programs for youth by youth. It's an international, global youth organization for astronomy that's based online. And we're really lucky at the RASC to have a couple of members that are in the executive of this club as well as in the Denver Astronomical Society and in other parts of the US and in Brazil. And so their next event is this coming Sunday and it's one of their newer members, Delali, who's gonna be talking about the James Webb Space Telescope. And she's gonna be sharing an understanding of what the James Webb is meant to do, why the architecture of it is so interesting and sharing it from a youth perspective for what they hope to see coming from this telescope over the next bunch of years. So if you're a youth, age 18 or under, and you can be as young as, you know, five, six, seven. If you're interested in astronomy, this is the group of kids to hang out with because they're just like you. They have a passion for astronomy. And at some point in class, their teacher is like, okay, enough about space. We're moving on to something else. They don't want to stop. So this gives them a chance to keep talking about space, sharing their enthusiasm, sharing their joy. So if you follow the bit.ly link here, CG April 13th reg or April 10th reg, That'll take you to a registration Google form and you'll get a Zoom link to join the Zoom on Sunday. The Zoom on Sunday is being hosted by Cosmic Generation. And if you have any trouble, you can always email me. It's uh, Rask Montre or Montreal Rask at gmail.com. That's something that you'll always find for me in the Explore Alliance Ambassadors page. Aside from that, for youth, the other thing we're doing at the RASC is we're launching a second iteration of our Creation Station. Now, last year, Creation Station was our International Astronomy Day event. We opened up a space for kids to share their drawings, their passion, their stories, their poems, anything about space. And this year, we have the exact same setup, but with a special extra category with a focus on the moon. So if you have stories or if you want to draw pictures of what you think space is like, or exploring space or trying to draw some images of the moon that you see when you go out at night or when you go out in the morning on your way to school and you see that waning moon up there, draw it and share it with us and we will share it with the world on your behalf. So rasc.ca slash creation station and this will be launching in May 2022, but it's already open. So you don't have to wait till then to submit any of your drawings, poems, stories, etc. At the Montreal Centre, we have our next public event coming up this Saturday, and I am so excited for this one. This is a PhD student, Olivia Lim, at the University of Montreal with the Institute for Research on Exoplanets. And she submitted, and I love this, a PhD student and a couple of them submitted research projects for the first year of Webb, and hers was accepted. So Webb is going to be spending time researching and trying to characterize the atmospheres of the TRAPPIST-1 seven planets that mm. are all terrestrial planets. And she's leading this research initiative. 
She's going to be talking on Saturday to our Rask Montreal public event audience. It's going to be a Zoom webinar. And as always, at the end of the webinar, we're going to promote everyone to panelists so that we can just chat away the night talking about astronomy. We also have our next Citizen Science series next Wednesday. And we have Kwa, who's going to be chatting with us tonight, as well as Blake Nancaro, who was with us about uh, two weeks ago, talking about the Rask Observing Programs. And he's going to be talking about double stars. We also have a fantastic event that I'm happy to invite everyone to next Thursday on April 14th at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We have crater sketching with Bettina Forget. Bettina is a local artist, a past president of the Montreal Center, and she is the director of the Artist in Residence program at SETI. And she is an incredible, incredible sketch artist. She did a a overview of the 30 craters named after women on the moon for a wonderful exhibit that has toured the world. And uh, she's going to be sharing with us some of the tips and advice that she has for sketching the moon. So sketching the moon is a nice transition to this rabbit hole that Kwa and I fell down. And so to tell you a little bit about it, I want to tell you about last Saturday, because last Saturday was the start of the current lunar month, right? It was that waxing crescent. It was the start of the Ramadan month for Muslims, where many, many Muslim sects fast in different ways, some from food, some take the esoteric uh, meaning where they fast from uh, different bad thoughts and bad actions. There's a lot of generosity and a lot of giving. And so I have a fair number of students that are Muslim, and so I thought I wanted to catch a picture of the crescent moon to share with them in class. So I went out on Saturday night to a park, and I got a really beautiful picture of the crescent moon, and I was joined there by a couple of Canada geese that are on their way back up here to the north to spend their summer with us. And so it was a nice, peaceful night. And then I remember that I had a group that was, they wanted to do some pictures of Orion to create a star trail. Now, knowing that Orion is setting earlier and earlier, and knowing how few clear nights we've had, I decided to go ahead and start taking some pictures of Orion for them. So I just started to take a few pictures and I knew that the ISS was gonna be passing close to Betelgeuse. So I was ready and set up to take that beautiful flyby of the ISS. And so of course, an airplane came in the view at the exact same moment. And so I didn't actually manage to get the ISS by itself, but what I got was this uh, wonderful view of the ISS passing from the top right and a plane passing from the bottom left past Sirius and past the belt. That's an amazing Still, picture. Yeah, I love the picture. I mean, it really shows kind of that juxtaposition of the night sky with everything we deal with here on Earth, right? Yeah. So I went back to our clubhouse. You know, I, I packed up for the night. I came in. We had a Zoom clubhouse going. I sat in and I started chatting with everyone. And I was on Facebook at the same time. And Gary Palmer, one of our VIPs here at the Global Star Parties, had just posted this picture of a supernova. This is supernova 2022 EWJ in NGC 3367. Cool. And he had posted this picture on Facebook and I looked at this and I started reading up on it because I wanted to know about this supernova. So the supernova itself was detected just a week and a half before that on March 19th. And it was detected and characterized for its spectra. And you can see that it is a type two supernova because you have that beautiful emission spike for the hydrogen atom. And that's where I really wanted to kind of connect this with Burbridge because uh, her work on characterizing the spectra of stars and an understanding of what that meant to what was happening with the nucleosynthesis at the core of those stars and how it is that you get the heavier elements when the actual star explodes and becomes either a neutron star, a pulsar, or a black hole at the center, those type two supernovae really give us those heavier elements that uh, David Eicher has been sharing with us, the, uh, the effect of having these elements generated by these supernovae and what we're ourselves made of, that's, that stardust, that, that stellar exhaust that we are all composed of. And so here we're seeing a supernova happening in real time. Now, NGC 3367 is 120 million light years away. This galaxy is less than one and a half arc minutes in size in our view. Gary has a four inch refractor, beautiful, beautiful setup. And he took seven 300 second images to get this. So I started chatting with him online, talking to him a little bit about this, and he's actually done more work since then. And last night, he sent me his entire field of view processed 
much, much better. And you can see the zoom in showing such amazing detail on that galaxy. Wow. It's incredible what he was able to put together over the last couple of days. Wow. But at that time on Saturday night, when I saw this first picture of his, I shared it with the clubhouse and I told them, I said, look, there's a supernova. And they were like, oh, that's awesome, but we have clouds. And I said, I know. So I want to find a way to look for this supernova. So I went online and I found the Virtual Telescope Project had looked at this same supernova a week before on March 23rd. So it was discovered on March 19th. The Virtual Telescope Project and Gianluca Massi had looked at it on the 23rd. Gary imaged it on the 20 or on the uh, second, first of April, first of April, he imaged it. And so I thought, well, let me look at the resources that I have available to me. And I went on to the LCO archive and Los Cambres in the archive, I found data from the 0.4 meter telescope in Chile. And it was RGB filters plus some infrared dated March 28th. Now the type two supernova that this one is, is a type two P. It's type 2 linear, that one dips, dims away very quickly. The type 2 plateau actually holds on to its brightness for a short amount of time. So my thought was by March 28th, if Gary was able to see it on April 1st, we should get some good data. So I did a quick and dirty uh, image processing of the RGB filters, combined them in GIMP with a very simple workflow. And I managed to see the supernova myself. And I was really, really happy about this, but I knew that my approach for processing was really quick and dirty. So there was, there, there was better ways to do it. So I shared the file with some of our RASC Montreal Center members, and I invited them to play around with the image and see what they were able to come up with. So Kwa, who's on with us tonight, did a pre-processing with Cyril to get rid of some of the noise and then use GIMP like I had used and got a much nicer image. And then Russell got us all beat when he used PixInsight and got just a beautiful image of this galaxy using PixInsight. Now, at that point, I was finished with my part of this rabbit hole. It was just past midnight on Saturday night. And unfortunately, I appear to have taken Qua off of his normal nighttime schedule. So Qua, let me pass it to you. Hello, I'm on now, and I will share my content. Starting broadcast and... And you see me, you see me now? Uh, yes. Fantastic. All right, so I guess to, to, to segue into that, I'm, my name is Kwa, I've been on here um, on the Global Star Party before. Uh, my shtick, I guess, is deep sky from downtown because um, we're raising a toddler. I live downtown and and trips out to dark sky sites are, are precious, precious commodity. So uh, we've got something like, uh, I'm just looking it up on, on clear uh, on clear outside. Um, Montreal, downtown Montreal is something like 12,000 um, micro candela per square meter of artificial brightness. Uh, I looked up my closest metro station, our, our closest subway station here, we're over 10,000. And I, I'm willing to bet, actually, that's that's worse than any place in this country. Um, so that, that's what I do. Um, and, uh, and also what I do, I, I'm really kind of um, very limited in what I've got. Uh, I, I shoot with, you know, um, drinking, drinking straw telescopes on um, on a star tracker mount. So uh, the season of galaxies, galaxy season is the cruelest of them all because all I can really do is, is you know, galaxy clusters and, um, and, and wider field sort of things. So on the night of the 23rd, um, I decided that I, I, I'd try a test framing um, and, and some filter testing uh, on, my, on my balcony, uh, Bortle 9 um, here in the plateau, downtown Montreal. Um, and I got about 76 minutes, uh, exactly 76 minutes of, of data on the other LEO triplet. So that's M95, 96, 105, and you know, whatever bonus galaxies you get into the frame. Um, it's nothing to write home about really, because 76 minutes with this much sky glow and, and with you know, my fairly basic gear, um, it, things, things get really, really grungy really fast. And it takes a lot more um, 
exposure and integration time to really tame that noise. Um, so, you know, I did that that night um, and then cue the endlessly cruel nights of endless cloud. Um, and then this past Saturday at, uh, I think I checked the email, it was 11.35 Eastern Daylight Time. It was early yet. And uh, oh, Karim sent us this, this data that he was able to gather from, the, from, from a robotic telescope in Chile. Um, so I guess he, he shared this image with you already. And this is you know, what, I, what I got is uh, a 60 second integration um, with RGB filters. Um, and you can very, very clearly see the supernova, uh, the Kaboom star uh, in this frame you know, to, to the left of the, of the galaxy core. And then um, as, as I was you know, thinking about things you know, like NGC 3367, that, that name rings a bell. Um, I was like, hey, it's one of the bonus galaxies in, in my wide field. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I pull up the wide field again. Um, and, and then I uh, try a zoom and enhance, as you were. Um, and, and I don't know if you can see it, because I can barely see it here on my screen. I don't know if it'll show up. Uh, you can see the on... galaxy. Okay. Um, but you'll have, to, you'll have to believe me that to the right of the galaxy core, there's a tiny little one pixel thing. I can see it. I can see yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so Amazing. That, that, yeah, that particular moment for me was like, wow, kaboom star. I caught it accidentally <laughs> um, with my two inch, you know, <laughs> uh, drinking straw refractor. Awesome. Um, and so that, that, was, that was approximately uh, my, my distilled reaction. Um, and, and of course, and Kareem asks if I can zoom and enhance any more. My answer was no. Fine. But what I can do is I can invert the image and I hope you can see it a little bit more clearly there. Yeah, and, you can see it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and actually at that point, for a hot minute, um, Kareem and I wondered uh, if, if, if the 23rd of March was early enough uh, for accidental co-discovery credit, but of course it wasn't. But it, it's nice to dream a little bit uh, here and there. But you know, it, it's, I like it's, the it's red, amazing. Red writing is really cool. Yeah, <laughs> very, very Mount Wilson-ish, you know. Yeah, very authentic. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> this, this was what was it? At this point, it was maybe two, two in the morning. Uh, I think two in the morning. Karim checked out yeah. at what one thirty. And, and I kept going because I'm like, no, I, I can do this. I can find it. And, and, and uh, yeah, so it, like I said, it, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful honor to, to witness the death of the star, you know, this far away. And even in, even in the visible spectrum, like it, it appears, like it, it rivals like the entire galaxy core in, in terms of brightness. And, and that is one of those really amazing things. What magnitude was it? It's a 15 and a half apparent magnitude. Fifteen and a half there to you sixteen. Go. You, you, yeah, exactly. With a two inch, with the, with the imaging of these days, you can yeah. make a two inch act like an eighteen inch. It's amazing. It's and, uh, and this is in the middle of like a light pollution sink. Like it's ridiculous how bad Montreal yeah. is, and this is what he's able to do from his balcony. I'm in awe. Yeah, I, I looked it up recently, awesome. and and uh, I put in my I punched in my postal code, and then for comparison, like I, I was born in Hong Kong, and I pun punched in. Uh, the coordinates for Mong Gok in, in Hong Kong. We are worse than that. Then I punched in the coordinates for the Shibuya crossing in Tokyo, the, the famous scramble sidewalk. We are worse than that. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> so there's no uh, excuse, everybody. All yeah. you guys watching, wherever you mm -hmm. are in the world, <laughs> there's yeah. no and excuse for you not hooking a camera yeah. to your telescope. And that's and our and lesson for tonight. Photography. If and, Quark and can do it, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and here I am waiting for the skies to darken uh, tonight. Hopefully when I, when I go back outside, it'll still be clear. And this time I'm serious. Uh, I'm, I'm going with a three inch this time. This is the, that's an uh -oh. ST80 over there. Giant apple. Watch out, out, watch out. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, everyone. That's awesome, Qua. Oh, thanks, Qua. Really cool. incredible. And we've actually been having more fun since then because last night Russell went out with his C6 and started to take data of that same area of the sky and pulled out the supernova himself. And so 
we're we've, we're kind of all turning our attention to this to see how well we can we can not just spot it but also how much you can characterize the photometry of it if you can uh what would be amazing i thought would be to actually get a spectra of this ourselves but it's so small and so i mentioned this to gary and gary's like well i have access to a couple of bigger telescopes let me see what i can do so we might be seeing some spectra of this supernova coming from gary palmer over the next couple of days or from the virtual telescope project wonderful Maybe Tom Field, uh, when his segment comes up, he can talk a little bit about this uh, supernova. So that's very cool. Wonderful. Okay. So uh, I always get energized by such things. You know, it makes my mind uh, stretch to think about, okay, it's 120 million light years away. That thing exploded. Then uh, we're getting the photons now, um, you know, and then I start thinking about how many miles there are in one light year, roughly 5.9 trillion. Uh, I don't know how many zeros it would add up to, um, to take 120 million plus five point, or times 5.9 trillion. But uh, if you want to know the miles, that's it. So, <laughs> plus it's actually even further out because the expansion of the universe. So exactly, and it's kept moving your since mind. Then. I don't know what it does, but it is beautiful to know that these these candles, these beacons uh, exist and that we have learned so much about the universe from observing them. So much of that worked out originally at uh, Mount Wilson Observatory. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, we have been, uh, we started doing some transitions with Maxi Filares as we went from speaker to speaker. Uh, so I'll let him transition into himself because up next is Maxi Filari segment. So with the astrophotography to the max. Maxi, you want to jump on? Well, thank you again, Scott. Well, that's a, a, a pretty good presentation. <laughs> that's a really good nickname. And I and also I saw another one in the chat in YouTube, a uh, Max Division. <laughs> oh, okay, Max Vision, yes. Max Vision. That, that's that's really good. Uh, well. Uh, right now, uh, I see that Cameron uh, wants to to see some uh, places that we have here in the southern hemisphere. Uh, right now, I am pointing to um, a planetary nebula. Let me share the screen um, here. OK, uh, right now, I'm in the place called C90 because it's the Caldwell um, a catalog, uh, but also it's NGC uh, 2867. And it's uh, because I have this field of view, I have an eight inches uh, F4 telescope, and my camera is uh, almost APCC. Uh, here's a 60 seconds picture of the that planetary nebula is pretty really small, but uh, I think a, using using a, a a normal telescope and trying to to find it, you can you can see it uh, this particular place. Uh, these are non-stellar, but these are these are wonderful. I love the planetaries visually as a starting point. You know, as the sky mm -hmm. is getting darker. And um, and th this is these are this is a beautiful look at the beautiful shell and it probably if you had a longer focal length like you say this is more for wide field but uh, then you 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 might even be able to see some uh, some structure in it but uh, but thanks Maxi I, I appreciate that <laughs> no that, that's no problem uh, Cameron uh, I don't know if this is taking vision because I'm just. Uh, trespassing to my cell phone and also to this software and well the guiding is is guiding but let's uh, stop this let's also you can you can do the way you do planetaries i found and they have such high surface brightness you can go for like 10 second subs uh mm -hmm. you know really short and this just stack the heck out of it and it's amazing it will it will help uh Average out the uh, the see, seeing and the noise, um, uh, and that will that that really helps on on the structure. Yes, yes, it, it's a really really good tool. Uh, let's 
get try to go to the Tarantula Nebula is here in the large Marginia cloud because he uh, Cameron asked me to to take forward. But uh, from where I have my scope, more down here I have my my rooftop, and I don't know if I could able to to capture. But we are nearby there, so well let's wait for this picture because I want to see the focus. There you go. Now I think the focus is a little go blur, but okay, that's it. I, I don't I don't have the this uh, tool that I can get focused from here, but you can see in this planetary nebula, it's uh, they have some kind of core and uh, white places. But okay, let's go to NGC. 27, 2070. Let's see if I can go there. Okay, right now is the the moment uh, pointing to this place, and well. Yeah, you'll be able to find out pretty quickly if it can do a plate solve. Uh, yeah if there's shadowing or whatever then you, you'll see if you got it but i yeah i noticed that too maxi i didn't know your horizon but uh i saw a tarantula nebula just like uh, our orion nebula is going down over the horizon so it's uh and see if you yeah. can catch it but yeah. that would be nice no no it's it's kind of impossible here right now i think yeah it's okay really Thanks. really low but i think the tarantula is I can get, get there. Well, it did the place also. <laughs> let's cross our fingers. And okay, let's reset this. Put auto. Ah, here we go. Let's take another picture. All right, you got it. Thirty seconds. Let's close the histogram. Well, in this case, it's get a uh, move it because when the mount. Well, when the camera started to take pictures, it was still the mount moving. So we had to wait a few seconds and then you, you can do the, the a shot. But oh, this is nice. pretty, pretty amazing to, to, to find some kind of places. Uh, it helps a lot, pretty a lot. Okay, let's wait to upload it. Well, I because I using the Wi-Fi connection and it only works in this case with uh, 2.4 uh, uh, in gigahertz. Well, here we go. Is that a 30 second sub? A 30 second sub, exactly. Yeah, you started with a five second preview, right? Uh, I think it goes uh, with a one second because it, it only has to find the the stars and then goes to play solve. But uh, in a 30 seconds picture, uh, here you have a lot. And also when you go, well, in more seconds, it gets more uh, details. You have here a lot of clouds and dust. And- I'm amazed how green it is. That's really neat. That means it's oxygen, right? Oxygen it's, three. It's a lot of oxygen here. Uh, also yeah. uh, hydrogen but a uh, oxygen too uh, maybe a two minutes so uh, then uh, yeah, what to the small magazine cloud we i cannot be able to go but uh, if you want let's take a, well i found um this particular area let me Find it. I don't know where it was. It was pretty high, but uh, here. Uh, okay. The pen nebula. I can only have this kind of shape because I don't use uh, filters. I don't have narrow band filters. But, well, uh, these places are also good to, you can need 
uh, too much info to get uh, there. But if you want, I can go to the Eta Carina Nebula. Well, that goes without saying. We have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that also, we have the Liberty Statue Nebula, the Running Chicken Nebula, because uh, I don't know what they call it like that, but well, he, we have the Southern Cross uh, and the Jewel uh, Cluster Box. Let's see. The see. Omega Century is not up yet, right? It comes later. No, right? I, I, I have to. It's here. It's oh, nearby of the Southern Cross. And, and of course, you have to do the. What's the name of that galaxy? I already forgot. Yes, Centaurus A. Ah. Centaurus, yeah. Centaurus A. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I had a shot a couple of days ago, or a couple of weeks ago, of these places, and they are pretty amazing. Uh, well, let's hear. Let's see how it goes in a two, set, two minutes sub. Oh, I'm already happy. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Max. <laughs> no, I'm easily uh, easily happy. I mean, compared to, you know, I love visual, and this is a wonderful enhancement. I was just saying earlier, mm -hmm. we get a well, lot of what, rainy, rainy days. What, what's so in you, this nebula in the, the field and with pretty good uh, telescopes? It's really, really good. Well. Look at how that noise how went down. Mm-hmm. And the, the background is starting, well, I have the light, light pollution here, but anyway, I was able to, to capture, well, you can see this kind of clusters. Here we have a lot of nebulosities, uh, more like violets, you know? Well, I, I can only do this kind of zoom because I, I don't, uh, if I use in my fingers in the cell phone, it's okay, but here I have only to do double click. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Are you using TeamViewer, right? Uh, no, no, no. I'm using uh, BlueStacks uh, uh, and I download the, the CWO. Oh, BlueStacks uh, 5, 5, version 5? Five? 5.5, uh, 5 .5, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't been able to get it connected to the network. It's kind of weird, but anyhow, uh, I, I can run stuff on BlueStacks and, and everything, but it doesn't recognize the network. Anyhow, I'll figure it out. But um, mm. that's good that you yeah. got it working. This is I, this is. I only did it in fifteen minutes, I think. Oh yeah. Seventy-two. Let's go to the Candida Nebula. And you see, twenty-three seventy-two. Oh, I don't want it. It's in the other place of the meridian, but I think <laughs> there's no cable. Uh, I hope there's no Which cable to connect. <laughs> Which mount are you using, uh, Maxi? Um, right now, I'm having a N N E Q six of Skywatcher uh, ah, okay. connected to yeah. um, a Q mod uh, that I use uh, using. Uh, in the uh, a couple of months ago, it, it's a homemade uh, AQ mode, but it works and also works with um, with this uh, little red box. <laughs> of oh, I know, I know, it's so nice. I mean, with this the ASIR Pro and the Plus, uh, they, they're uh, they really make it so nice for for this type of thing. What you're just doing, I mean, also. You can re it really helps you organize your your uh, images, including all your calibration frames and all the folders and the naming. Um, it's a lot like Nina, except it's of course it's all self-contained. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a really nice tool. Well, here we have it, but it's more down. Let's get centered to this place. This is the pencil nebula, right? Uh, no, this is the Carina nebula. <laughs> the... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, because it zooms in. Yeah, sometimes you get it off to the side and you see glow in the corner. And then you have to. This place I, I get centered. Yeah. Okay. So here we have the data Carina star. And behind of this place, let me. 
is that the Instagram? Uh, it's, I don't know if you can see some kind of a, a blue color. Well, that's the homunculus nebula. Uh, I don't know if I can go. No. Well, it's there. <laughs> but let's take a zoom of 60 seconds only. That's, that's all going to be OK. Uh, let's see if the is working. Uh, then, so if you want, it's uh, interesting. Well, you know what? Uh, that was uh, the the one second preview, right? That you showed. So, uh, mm -hmm. it's interesting. Uh, the it's more diffuse, even though it's quite bright. It's more diffuse than the Orion Nebula. Orion Nebula in a one second preview, you're going to have the, still the central part around the trapezium, uh, quite bright already. Uh, quite concentrated, and yeah. so seeing this, uh, you can see it's it's bright, but it's it's spread out, and so as soon as you get the longer sub, it's going to pop. I bet once once you get you're doing a one minute or th a thirty second. Uh, this is one minute. Uh, it's, yeah, that'd be good. To be that'd more be fast awesome. in in the presentation, but uh, you can see here is like a. In, in the diagonal, diagonal, digamos, let's say. But let's see what, what I get. You know, watching this place also with telescopes and filters. There, there you go. go. There it is. All right. Ah, man. this is totally awesome. Look at that. And you have some nice salmon pinks in there. Oh, that's so nice. Nice uh, cluster. Such a rich area. It's so nice to see this, you know. I uh, like I say, I never uh, I've seen pictures of it in the past, but seeing this kind of semi live, it's like mm -hmm. you know we're right there enjoying it together. It's, it's really cool, really yeah. cool. I, that's what I kind of um, what I would try to to do. Very beautiful. Uh, here's another places. Here is this. Uh, they are like. Uh, lava uh, lamps, you know, uh, that's with that shapes uh, going in floating and like oil. And... Beautiful. And you know what the nice part about the Ada Carina, when, when, uh, just looking at this sub, okay, this is a one minute sub. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you just start stacking a pile of this, these guys on and you're going to have a fantastic picture and you don't have to worry about blowing up the, the core. Like in Orion, the biggest challenge is the core. Like I said, it's so bright, you mm -hmm. blow it out. You can't you can't see anything. You have to do some fancy you're, stuff. You're only going to, to, to burn the, the star if you go more yep. to, with more exposure. You have to be careful with that. But in, in the info of the nebulosity, it will not happen that because, well, maybe in this place, it's get more... Uh, more brightest uh well no but you can just look at the sub right i mean uh, all stacking is going to do is remove the noise now make it mm -hmm. cleaner so so if you if this one this is already one minute it will be interesting right. in the future doing like a longer see how far you can push it to get that signal to noise even more and exactly. then just start stacking that'll be really cool oh it's beautiful well we have also you, the, the liberty statue nebula oh you're welcome Cameron. Uh, but I think this uh, our H uh, region, uh, and I could not able to to get more too much info. Mm. But we have here this open cluster called the Wishing Well cluster. Uh, this well, is a pretty a pretty shiny cluster. Uh, watching this place in a telescope is amazing. Uh, NGC 3552. Is that, is that red? Uh, that's your image image uh, frame, right? That's that's your from, image from Stellarium. Yeah, uh, but the, but the red is the actual uh, uh, field yeah, of view, right? Filters. No, yeah, you yeah. Yeah, yeah, the the red quality is my field of view exactly. Yeah. Uh, it frame it nicely. Yeah. That's the good stuff of having an F4 telescope, but... Well, you know, yeah. that's another thing, by the way, I, I want to say, I'll, I'll say it again in my segment later, is uh, 
the biggest thing that I discovered with equatorial, you know, besides the obvious, you need to have an equatorial uh, for, for imaging. Uh, the real thing, the real benefit is the framing. Uh, you can consistently night overnight or any time the frame will be the same. Um, and, and, and that way you can stack over multiple nights or whatever you want. And so that's, that is really important. Whereas if you an alt azimuth is going to be field, it's going to be rotated all the time. You can't reframe it properly. Uh, so it's, this makes it really, really good to, to be able to just, Hey, you're always going to have that field of view. If you center on that object, bang, you know, so it's really, mm -hmm. um, reliable and repeatable. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, we are running a little bit behind right now. We should probably uh, 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 transition yeah. to uh, Libby. I'm Thank gonna you. Let Max, Maxie, I'm going to let you introduce Libby. Um, okay. And, um, well, and then uh, you can uh, transition more images as we go from speaker to speaker. So mm -hmm. That's okay. Well, uh, our next speaker is uh, our currently uh, invited um, Libby in the stars. Uh, hi, Libby, how are you? Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Well, uh, Libby, it's all yours. All right. So I haven't been on a star party in a while, so uh, I picked together some of my favorite poems about like the universe and everything to read today, and I even made one of my own. So uh, I'll get right into that. So the first poem I have is... Uh, the Light of the Stars by Henry Wadsworth uh, Longfellow. I won't be reading the full poem. I just picked out a couple stanzas out of all of them. Hold on just a second. My cat's at the door. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so um, I just picked out um, two stanzas to read. Um, the night has come, but not too soon. And seeking silently, all silently, the little moon drops down below the sky. There is no light or in earth or heaven, but the cold of the cold light of stars. And the first first watch of night is given to red planet Mars. So that's what I have for that poem. Um, I just picked out a couple short ones. Um, next poem I have is called A Night Piece by William Wordsworth. Um, the sky is overcast with a continuous cloud of texture close, heavy and wan, all widened by the moon, which through well is indistinctly seen, a dual contracted circle yielding light so feebly spread that not a shadow falls, conquer conquering the ground from rock, plant, tree, or tower. And then another poem I chose was um, Winter Stars by Sarah T. Zell. Um, this is really cool and it really touches me a lot because she talks about a little girl looking up to the sky and that's how I remember a lot of my childhood and everything. And like, it's on like clear nights whenever I can go outside and look outside um, and just like, even with just my plain eyes, or there's some nights where I get my whole tent outside in the driveway and my neighbors are like, what is she doing? <laughs> so yeah, um, I went out at night alone, the young blood flowing beyond, beyond the sea seemed to have drenched my spirit's wings. I bore my sorrow heavily. When I lifted my head from the shadows shaken on the snow, I saw Orion in the east, burned steadily along as long ago from windows of my father's house dreaming the dreams on winter nights i watched orion as a, as a girl i love another city's light years go dream goes and youth goes too the world's heart breaks beneath its wars all things are changed save in the east the faithful beauty of the stars so that was that poem um i, I wrote my own um, technically poems don't have to rhyme, so don't, don't try to, <laughs> I didn't really try, um, to make mine rhyme a lot, but I did write my poem about, you know, our universe is bigger. Um, look in the sky, a whole new world, to see an adventure beyond the reaches of outer space. 
See the awes on each other's faces. The universe awaits you. An even bigger step for mankind. The big blue sky during daytime. Wait until night. The universe prevails. The wonderful sight. Tiny humans, big universe. Be on your lines. That was the one that I wrote um, myself, which I know it doesn't rhyme, but it, it's a poem. <laughs> Um, yeah. I just wanted to say it is uh, so great to be back and have like the world, you know, is reopening again. And it's like uh, I'm going, I'm taking two trips this summer, one to space camp in Huntsville, Alabama, Expedition 39. And then um, I'll be going to the Nebraska Star Party and speaking there too, which I'm extremely excited for this summer. Um it's all I can, I, I cannot stop talking about it. I recently got a new science teacher and an old one went and she didn't know. And I was like, I'm speaking at a convention this summer. I'm so excited. And she was just like, oh, wow. <laughs> She's like, you need to stop talking about space for two seconds. But I'm so excited to come and um, come to Nebraska. And I'm always up for a good road trip. And it'll be so nice to see everyone there. Um, I've yeah. even gotten a couple of books from, um, Clayton, um, Clayton Anderson, astronaut, and um, it's been so nice to have those and everything. Um, I take them to school with me every day. <laughs> um, my teachers are always like, oh my gosh, is that a real astronaut signature? And I'm like, yes. Um, but it's so nice to have everything back open. And the whole idea that I wanted to talk about for this presentation was really, you know, uh, with everything opening back up again and, you know, like we're still on watch, but everything's open back up again and everything. Uh, last year I got to go to a uh, planet training at space camp and it was both of my friends first time. So just seeing them watching it and like, they were both like, oh my gosh, why have I never seen this before? Because it was so cool to see them, you know, react to a planetarium before. And even when I went to my first planetarium when I was little, picking my brother up from space camp. It was just like so much fun because I mean like our universe, the way that we see our universe is like for telescopes. But another way is for like, you know, like sci scientific digital, you know, platforms that can show us a rough draft of what most of our universe looks like. Cause we have no clue who how big our universe is. I mean just our universe is huge. It's ginormous. So it's kind of hard to look at it all from our little tiny earth. We're so tiny compared to the big universe that's out there. So uh, I've been to a couple of planetariums before and I wanted to talk about those and how much fun it was. And like, I feel like every single time I left the planetarium, the next day I went home and got out my telescope. <laughs> I was like, it is so much fun to see this stuff. And then um, even just seeing it through my telescope, like, you know, that is the real Saturn I am looking at through my telescope. That is a real Jupiter. Those are Jupiter and four moons. I even have a photo um, of Jupiter and you can slightly see all the moons around um, around Jupiter and it's so pretty and everything. And I flaunt it off everywhere. I'm like, do you see this picture? As of Jupiter and the Galilean moons. <laughs> and like, um, it's so nice everything's been back open. Um, and I'm so glad to be in the star party. And thank you for having me on. I think we lost Scott. Did we? No. Oh, okay. I was waiting for him. <laughs> he did chime back yeah. in. <laughs> oh, well, it's great seeing you again, Libby. No, and I was writing. Ahead. So I, I was yeah. just, uh, I was thinking, Libby, honestly, this is what I was thinking. I was thinking about you, you know, let's propel, you know, 20 years ahead. Okay. And just thinking of you growing in science, uh, doing something that you love and, uh, but I can imagine you on your first spacewalk, you know, and uh, 
thinking about maybe uh, your early times on Global Star Party. And we'll, we can all say, yeah, we knew her then. So, um, yeah, I hope you know, to my see first that. time that I went to a star party, it was downtown in my town. And my mom just took me. I was like, I wasn't really into space back then. Um, I mean, I looked at the, the sky and thought, oh, cool, space. But like, I never got into it until like I came to my first star party and I was like, oh my gosh, I love this stuff. I'm addicted. Like, <laughs> that was a turning point for me where I was like, oh my gosh, right. where, yeah. where can I go and like get more telescopes and stuff like that? And even to the first telescope that I bought on Facebook Marketplace for like $25 that I still have today. It's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I even go back and look at my old videos on Explore Scientific of the tutorials and I go back and I read the comments. Um, I got a lot of comments about my shiny jacket protecting me from the aliens. That's one thing I'll always remember. Sure. Yeah, I have a question for you, Libby. Um, did you mention that a teacher told you stop talking for space for two seconds? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I... We recently just got a new science teacher and I went up to her and like the second or third day that she was teaching there. I'm like, hey, so like I'm kind of a big astronomer. I own a bunch of telescopes and like I kind of like have a couple books signed by astronauts. Do you want me to bring them? And she was like, yeah, cool. So I started bringing them. And then like after a couple weeks or so, she was like, OK, um, do you have anything else than like astronomy? And it's like, nope. <laughs> I was like, that's it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I was, my comment was going to be that it's your passion for astronomy that, that drives you. And it's like, you have to tell her if she says, stop talking about it for two seconds, you have to look at her in the eye and say, lady, that's something I'm incapable of doing. <laughs> um, yeah. so you, I will I'm talk space. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's that kind of passion that leads you to discovering things even further. Yeah. So it, yeah, I, I would, I wouldn't, this is the one case where you just kind of have to look at your teacher and say, I'm sorry, but this is where my, this is where my heart is. Now you learn other areas of science and then you can relate them to how they also play out in astronomy. So, you know, that's. Yeah, all my teachers are like very amazed by like what I do and everything. And they're like, even like, they're like, bring more books, bring more books. <laughs> Right. So yeah. I always show up to school like books. <laughs> With tons of books. And all one other quick question, I know I have to move on. Did you start that uh, astronomy club at that school? Um, so I did have one meeting and then um, when I, um, so I actually reached out to the principal and I said, hey, I would like to start the club. But then I kind of backed out on it because, you know, if I start a school club, I have to have a teacher with me 24-7 everywhere okay. we go. Okay. Um, if we were to travel out anywhere, um, if we were to travel out like anywhere, um, we would have to have a teacher with us, like everything would have to be for school. And I kind of didn't want that. So I just posted on my page and um, we didn't have people the first meeting. It was just my friends who came, but we did come across this like little three-year-old girl who came and we decided on the club and the name of the club. And then um, I've been waiting to host another one. Um, I do have more people on my Facebook page who are saying they'll come and join and everything and my area and everything. And another thing I've been wanting to do is start it virtually because I know there's a lot of kids like all around the world and not just in my little corner. I don't live in a huge city. So I'm wanting to start it virtually too. So I've been trying to work on that. Oh, that's but great. We, have, yeah. we had yep. a little kid who came up to our, uh, astronomy club meeting I still taught to my friends how to use a telescope and told them you know like this is this don't touch that and stuff like that so don't we had this finger girl. on the eyepiece yeah, yeah. <laughs> well that, that's excellent yeah I'll... I was like I like to look at stars not your fingerprints so anyway Great. um we had this little kid who came up it was a little girl and she came with her mom and then we, she just started drawing with us because my first activity planned for the first meeting was to just draw your favorite planet. So she came and she draw, she drew her cat and then she draw, draw, drew her favorite planet. And so it was so cute to see her. And then 
she came, her mom said hi, and then she hung with us, like, the whole meeting. She was, like, five, four. I can't remember her name, but I have a bunch of the drawings from the club back in um, my club basket, and I've been waiting to host another one. It's been really cool, and then we've had all this snow, and then everything, but now that everything's a lot better, now that it's springtime, I'll be able to host again more. Oh, yeah. That's great. Well, Libby, thank you so much for coming on to Global Star Party again. And uh, uh, we're going to take about a 10 minute break right now, and then we'll be back uh, with um, with more programming uh, with um, Marcello Souza in Brazil. So uh, give us about 10. For those of you in the chat, this is your chance to get your uh, words on the big screen. Hey, Adrian, good to see you, man. Good to see you again, Cameron. I've seen your your great uh, escapades. I know you're doing pulling triple duty on a lot of things, but uh, it really showed uh, that was great work you've been doing. A lot of those shots. Just really yeah, nice. It's you got been, some good, some nice dark skies too. It's been fun to uh, just get out there. Um, even if sky's not perfect or the clouds come out, um, it's just great to take whatever, whatever I can get. What do you mean, uh, even if half of your awesome pictures have clouds coming through them, and it just gives so much texture to them? They're amazing. That was nebulosity. Was, nebulosity. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yep, that the story behind that being, you know how whenever it's too cloudy, you can't image, you can't, you know, the very object you might want to shoot will be behind clouds, so, you know, you can't take frames. Well, if you do an entire wide field, I said, why not shoot with the clouds, and then in post-processing, I'll see what I can get. And, and the stuff turned out pretty good, because you had some, especially at dark areas, things from the Milky Way or like Nebula that's in the same plane just shine through the clouds. It's something you just don't see. Um, you go, you know, to anything less than say Bortle 2, you just don't see, you don't see M5 shine through the clouds like that. That's, uh, that was pretty awesome for me. And um, the type of images you can get um, within just 30 seconds, you know, they ma match the type of images I have to do a two second or a two minute composite shot to get similar images. I go, the ones in the South, I can just go or in dark skies, 30 seconds, boom. It's, uh, it was amazing just to You're, you're talking to some people who've never seen really real dark skies. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like you're taking us there and transporting us there, which is awesome. And That's, Derek, we see you. It's great to see you. And, uh, Bortle one to six are forbidden there. Yeah, well, we're at Bortle nine thousand here in Montreal, so I totally get that. Hey, Tom. It's over. Tom and Daniel, hey good to see you. Hey, good Daniel. You. Hi, Karim. Astro World. Oh, um, welcome. TV. Thank you. This is this is the uh, we're currently just in the uh, chatting stage. Uh, sure. This is the coffee break. Adrian hosts our coffee break by making everybody else feel bad about our our awful skies and how oh, wonderful the skies. are. <laughs> he gets uh, to I'm get sitting in Bortle. I'm sitting in Bortle seven thousand skies. I, oh, you know, I have to drive roughly three hours just to get to a sky that begins to show you what's really out there. Three hours. That's it. That's it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, I, I I actually consider myself fortunate. Hey, Adrian. Let me let me just let you know. I I live vicariously through you and your images. So I'll tell you that. <laughs> Because <laughs> I wish that I could get some. I mean, it'll take me like forty-five hours to get the shots that you get because of my light pollution. So I was so yeah. happy to just get to see uh, to just get to see Orion. And yes, Harold, we're 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 able to travel and uh, able to share our adventures, which is really awesome. Actually, uh, speaking of which, is David Iker still around? Uh, he's not on screen. He is logged in, though. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm wondering if he's still here. I have something to uh, share with him, uh, if he is. But it doesn't look like it. That's okay. 
All I know is I just booked my hotel for Cherry Springs. So. Oh wow. So uh, first time in four years I'll be there because it's just been such horrible weather there. But um, I'll be I'll I'll be going there from like I think the first to the sixth in June. So. Uh, Josh, oh, Josh got clear nights. That's, that's yeah, fantastic. But his computer's taking all the time downloading. So hopefully <laughs> that'll finish. Yeah. That, once it, my uh, buddy Josh. Josh, Josh has some great pictures too. Yeah. Oh, and fantastic. I will. I did see the note respect Bortle 7 through 10 skies. I'll try my hardest. But um, I made the choice to be mobile and to know where I could go, where the skies, the the contrast in the sky just changes right there on the tip of the thumb of Michigan is where it begins to change. And then if you go further North, you're in that zone in a lot of different places in Michigan shooting over the lake helps because that's the one place you don't get light pollution is directly over a large body of water. So you notice the clouds are darker underneath when you're looking over water you can look on land and you can see some of the towns lighting up the underside of the clouds. So it's uh, so I do try and shoot in the higher Bortle zones. Um, there's some, I think I have a picture that I'll share. It'll be like an hour from now, but I do have a picture taken in a, uh, a lesser inferior Bortle zone. So I don't, I do try not to, not to ignore you know the Bortle Four Dark Sky Parks. I think you have to be, you have to be dark enough to see a few different things naked eye. I don't know. No, you know, if, if if it's not dark, you just imagine. You just are like, you know, I, that that looks like that looks like it's a globular cluster. I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll take a picture. We'll see what comes out. Uh, uh, Tom, actually, what are the what are the skies like over there? I live in Seattle, so there is no sky. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. You know, uh, people you had me at Seattle, Tom. You you can drive into the mountains in just a few, you know, half That's an hour. True. hour. That's yeah. true. You can just get over the mountains and get just great skies. But you know, I look at some of the images that you all do, and then I look at the amount of integration time. You know, like the, in the backs of some of the magazines, some of the showpiece images too, and it's. 10 or 20 hours of imaging. And I don't get that much in a month, even in the summer sometimes here because of the skies and the clouds. And my wife's planning a, a deck party in late June. And I'm going, are you kidding? It's still going to be raining in late June. So Tom, I was just telling the guys earlier, um, <laughs> I'm in Seattle too. And over the last four months, we've had three clear nights. And one of them uh, it just fogged right over and just cleared all, all of my optics. So yep. basically, I know exactly <laughs> how you feel. But that's yeah. why we're saved by the imaging here. You know, you, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking, you, you, you get whatever images you can, and that keeps you through the, the winter and the cloudy yeah. nights. Yeah, plus, well, you know, I was out at the Bush School, a local school here uh, with some kids uh, last fall, and it clouded up, and we had a video camera pointed at Vega capturing a live spectrum, and you couldn't even see the star, and we were still getting a spectrum, which is just astonishing to me. I think you were mentioning, Adrian, that yeah. that kind of thing happens. It, it's yeah. remarkable. The, the starlight, the starlight cuts through, and that actually gives me an idea. I took a picture like that, uh, where I had a lot of cloud cover, and it was shooting right in the face of um, brighter city lights in the back, and. Um, you still can see, you can still see the dippers. To most people, there are exactly oh. 24 hours in a day. <laughs> the ground only moves during an earthquake and the earth rotates just like it does on a globe. And generally speaking, that makes sense. But scientists who like to find out exactly what's going on know the ground actually moves around quite a bit. Days are never quite 24 hours and the earth actually wobbles on its axis in a very particular way as it revolves around the sun. Scientists know all this by using a technique called very long baseline interferometry, which is basically a fancy term for using radio dishes to very precisely measure the Earth's orientation. VLBI was originally developed back in the 60s to take pictures of quasars. Early on, though, someone realized that because quasars never really move, you could use them as reference points, throw the whole process in reverse, and figure out how all the telescopes were moving relative to one another. Basically, when a quasar emits a radio wave, that wave reaches different telescopes at different times. For astronomy, you'd use a computer to imitate a giant telescope and get a good picture of the quasar. But if you instead pay close attention to the time differences, you can use geometry to figure out how far apart the telescopes are. 
and by making lots of those measurements, you can start to see how the ground beneath the telescopes moves around, when you have to adjust your clock, and that the Earth wobbles on its axis as it moseys around the sun. So the next time you feel like you've had a long day, or that your house is a few millimeters from where you last left it, you can switch on a bunch of radio telescopes, point them at quasars, and find out just how right you are. Right. Pretty cool 3D video. Definitely. And I like the music. Yeah. Hey, we Damn were, it, man. We were playing with a 60 inch a few months ago. One. 150 megapixel camera. thousand dollar camera though <laughs> well nice hello everybody uh we are back after our 10 minute break here and um right. you're watching the 89th global star party um and uh we are going to transition to maxi who's going to show us a live view for a minute and then we're going straight to marcello souza down in brazil um so maxi you want to uh take it away We still have Maxi. I'm not sure we still have Maxi. I Maybe see he wants to go up. get a sandwich. Mm, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll go well, straight to Marcello we'll call, then. We'll call Audible. And maybe we don't have Marcello either. No, Let's we see. have Marcello. I we have Marcello. Him. Yep. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Are Hi, you Jeff. there, Marcello? <laughs> yeah, yes. I'm here. He is very hot. Nice to see you. That's nice a cool shirt you got on. He is very hot today. Oh yeah. That's what I hear. So what's happening in, in Brazil uh with uh, your astronomy activities? Ah, we are planning many things. The in, in April is the global month of astronomy, yeah. Then we are planning a lot of activities here this month. And uh, uh, we are organizing our international meeting right, that will happen in, on April 22, 23. Right? It will be a hybrid event, right? but you have also a presential part with uh, the participation of students here in a theater in our city. And uh, we are we are also making plans for the total eclipse, total lunar eclipse on May yes. 15, 16. Uh, it will be a big event here in our region in Brazil. Uh, we have uh, many seats that uh, we will have telescopes there for the population. Then I hope you have a uh, Mm -hmm. uh, last time we had 10,000 people participating. I hope that this oh, time goodness. we have more people involved. Uh, I Today, I was remembering uh, a book that uh, was the motivation, main motivation for me to, to study astronomy. I made physics, but I worked with cosmology. But uh, since then, I work with uh, the astronomy popularization and teaching. And this book is, I think that's for everybody. Uh, it's a fantastic book. I wish I have here my original edition that I bought in 1908. I don't remember the year, but I was very young. Uh, then I will show uh, some curiosities that uh, motivated me. Right, to study more. Uh, and this is one. I will talk about Mars, curiosities about Mars. And I, I, it's not changing what is happening here. Oh, yes. And these are the two moons, the small moons of Mars, Phobos, and the Deimos. And uh, 
a curiosity about these two moons that uh, when I was very young, that uh, was something that uh, I tried to understand is this book, uh, Gulliver's Travels, mm -hmm. uh, written by Jonathan Swift in 1726. And in this book, he, oh, sorry, I come back here. In this book, he have information that uh, for me, when I was very young, something that uh, I tried to understand more, how that he made this prediction. Uh, he predicted that uh, the Laptans have discovered two lesser star sat satellites mm. which revolve around Mars, whereof the innermost is distant from the center of the primary planet exactly three of his diameters and the outermost five. The former revolves in the space of 10 hours and the later in 21 and a half hours. This is something that uh, for me was fantastic because these are the actual information about the satellite, the two moons, Phobos. The distance is 2.676 mass radii that he predicted three times, considering the center of the planet then is two tower, he predicted two and a half times the distance, the main distance and the orbital period that you know today is almost eight hours, no less than eight hours, seven hours and almost 40 minutes and he predicted 10 hours and Deimos have here the distance is 6.9 and he predicted five times uh, the mass aid and more than this then because he predicted the distance and the, the optical period he predicted 21 hours and a half and the, act, the actual is 30 hours. This is something that uh, and the they were only discovering in 1877. That is something that he, I believe that he can send the numbers to, to using lottery because he, they had the idea of two moons around Mars, 100 years, more than 100 years before the discovery of the moons. It's something fantastic. We have an explanation why he imagined that Mars have two moons. Right? I believe that he used the same idea that he, the Earth has one moon, and he knew in his time that he, Jupiter had four moons. Then he can imagine that you have two moons on Mars, and in Saturn probably eight moons, something like this. Né? This may be what motivated him to make this prediction. But uh, the distance and the orbital period is something fantastic man, that he made this prediction more than 100 years before the discovery of the moons. I don't know if everybody knew about this, but this is uh, something that motivated also students to know more about Mars. Man. This is something that is fantastic, this prediction made by Jonathan Swift in this book. I believe that everybody knows about this. No? It's something for me was a big curiosity when I was very young. And what motivated me was these missions, Viking 1 and Viking 2. Uh, and that landed in 1976. Mm -hmm. And this book, that uh, is my reference here. Cosmos. Cosmos from Carl Sagan. This is the original one that I have until today. I have a lot of tapes here to protect. And this was, for me, something fantastic. It was very expensive. And it was very difficult to me to buy here in Brazil. That's a fantastic book that until today, I ask uh, the students to read this book. Even we have many things new about the, the planets, new information about them. And this is something that 
was amazing. The first pictures of Mars. You know? I didn't believe that uh, I, I was seeing the image of another planet. Mm. Only when I, I, I bought the book that it was possible for me. Now the students can see everything online just in time né? that uh, when I arrive. And then uh, these are the pictures, fantastic pictures of Mars yeah. taken by the Viking. Uh, yeah, this is for me. Until today, I show these pictures to the students when I talk about Mars. I begin yeah. with the images of cosmic results of the mission, uh, or Viking missions, and something that uh, is fantastic. You, you can see here images that we have trash there. Right? Since this moment, uh, we begin to pollute Mars. And this is another fantastic image. I remember when I saw for the first time this image. Né? This is the region of Sidonia on Mars. Mm -hmm. Until today, if you add, put in the Google Sidonia, you see a lot of information about E.T., some cities there. And because near the image of this face here, you have regions here that you have the mountains, like pyramids né? here. And, but see, this was in 1976. Now this dark circles here uh, is part of the image that we didn't receive here. You know? Then during, I had to wait 20 years to see a new image of this region. Only here is near, you, know? you see like a face, in the master face. Until today, today when I, show this image, a lot of students uh, didn't know about the, this image because he, they are very young, you know, they didn't know about this image. And uh, this was responsible for this book. That's a fantastic book by Carl Sagan, that's a demo on haunted the words. Uh, that's very important also today, uh, because the subtitle is Science as a Candle in the Dark. We need this today. Uh, and in this book, what motivated him was this image. And in 1996, the Mar Global Survey took again images in this region, right, Sidonia. And here you see the mountain here. And when we see near, this is the mountain. <laughs> A lot different. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. You see that uh, the shadows that uh, give the idea that you have a face there. And here, probably, here, this city here, near, you have a lot of, like, uh, the pyramids here. And something that motivated the, the series on TV, that is the stargates, no? that they come from pyramids, something like this. All natural mountains, no? that you have here on Mars, but uh, that uh, many people imagine in this moment that you, you found something different on Mars. These are the real image of the mountains. You have to, we had to wait 20 years to see this image. That's only 1996 that you received this image of the mountain. Oh, wow, look at that. Very interesting. And this is uh, the face of the of Mars. Marcello, do and, we know about the height of, of that feature on Mars? The, the no, no, I don't, know. I, don't, I, I don't know. But it's not uh -huh. difficult to find this information. It's not mm -hmm. difficult to find because it's a very famous region. That is Sidonia, it's a very famous region. And also, we have a smile in a crater, a crater here in Ma on Mars here, this smile here. I will show here, here, this smile. <laughs> then you can find every, anything that you want there. Right? And like it when you, you look to clouds in the sky. And it, another thing that is fantastic for me that shows the technology that you, we have is this. These are the, when the opportunity was on Mars. This is the, the, 
uh, he arrived here in this crater, the Victory. And here we have an image of the, this robot here, the rover here, wow. near the mountain. Yes, here is a region that you have here in Brazil that received this name is Cold Cape, that means. There's a city near us here in Brazil. And here, I don't know if you see the rover here in the image. The image was taken by uh, another uh, spaceship that was uh, in orbit. And the, he can show him. Ah, sorry, he's here. Uh, it's very small here. In the, but I will show near. Here is the rover. Now, it, this was 10 years ago, probably, or more. Then you, you can see images in the surface of Mars with uh, one meter of the resolution in the camera. It's something that was fantastic. We can now we can see everything that is in the surface of Mars here, near the rover here. An image taken by an, a satellite that is in the orbit of Mars. And here you can see the rover moving. Oh, yeah. This is something fantastic here. Mm -hmm. It's like the, a science fiction movie. Right? Yes. You can see something in surface, in surface of another planet. Yes, that like we're something. controlling. Yes, it's amazing. Yes, yes something that's almost unbelievable. And here are the three rovers. Right? <laughs> that is fantastic. And something that... I ever talk about Mars, and I, I have the opportunity to talk with the students here. Uh, they ask to talk about Mars and the, the possibility of life on Mars. Why we don't have water now on Mars? That we know that uh, now we have a very weak uh, 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 magnet field on Mars. This is what uh, was responsible to Mars to lose the water for the space because you have, don't have protection for the radiation of the sun. No? And this in million of years, the, the water. And this is a fantastic image of the surface of Mars. Mars is a place that I, when I have opportunity, I want to, to know the news about the, what the, they are discovering now about Mars, that is something that uh, it probably is the next step for, the, for, for us. No? I hope that soon we go there. And it, here are the news about our projects. These are the characters of our animated cartoon that uh, will begin to be transmitted this week in Brazilian TV, local TV. We have four, and each one is received the name in honor. Now this this one is Jaci, that is the name of uh, the godness of the moon for the Brazilian uh, indigenous. Jaci, this is Luis Cruz in honor of the name of our uh, astronomy club. That mm -hmm. is name of a uh, astronomer. That is a Brazilian and from Bel Belgium. That say in English, I don't know. Belgian, right? this is a country in Europe. Here is Catherine, that uh, we in honor of Catherine Johnson from NASA. And this is another character is Apollo, right? that's God, the son of Zeus. And here is our, that we talked like last week. That is the our first app about the variable stars that is available in this link that I'm showing here. And these are the our team. This is our full team that is developing all the projects that is developing apps, developing animated cartoons, and the all the educational material about astronomy and space exploration. This is our group here in Brazil. That we have, we have the support of the United States Consulate here in Rio de Janeiro, that is supporting, the, supporting us here. And these are the activities we have in schools. We ever give to the students 
a newspaper about the the first time that the man arrived on the moon, and here have received also a material from NASA. And this is part of our presentation in schools yeah, for the students. And the uh, Stephen Hamid sent to us many glasses. We are giving to all the students they receive solar glass to see mm -hmm. the, the sun. Here in our activities, we go outside when we have the sun. It's clear and they look to the, to the sun. And we are now organizing the international meeting in, on April 22, 23. Yeah. That will be an online version of the event. This week, we are making contacts. We begin the contacts for the, the speakers. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank and you I, so I, much. Think, I think that we are near to, to finish the next edition of the Skies Up magazine. We, have, we are receiving articles, and I think that soon we will have all the material for the next, next edition of the Skies Up. That, that is a fantastic magazine. Thank you, Thank very, you very much, Marcello. We look forward to it. That's great. That's great. Okay. Um, so do we have um, do we have Maxi here with us at this point to show us another quick live view? Perhaps he's still having dinner. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fine. Okay, so um, uh, thank you very much again. Our next speaker is uh, Tom Field. Tom is uh, when I first met Tom, I thought he was the most enthusiastic. Uh, guy I'd ever met about uh, 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 studying spectra uh, through amateur telescopes. And um, uh, at a few star parties, uh, he was demonstrating his, uh, his RSpec software and uh, how you could actually see what's going on in a, you know, in a star uh, with an amateur telescope. That's something I really did not think that you could get much data on or that it would be very interesting, but it turns out that it's extremely interesting. And if you really want to know what's going on, you want to go beyond the beautiful picture and you want to see what's really happening uh, in stars uh, that you can observe uh, through um, a pretty simple equipment. Um, uh, you know, look no further than uh, Tom Fields R spec. And so, Tom, I'm going to turn this over to you. And uh, thank you so much for coming on to Global Star Party. Well, you're welcome, and thanks for that kind introduction, Scott. I appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, everybody, and uh, some of my friends I see here, uh, Marcelo and Karim, and others. It's nice to see some some people i've met over the years yeah kareem i think company. it's better with a mustache your daughter should put that mustache back on <laughs> so <clears throat> you know the title of this gathering i looked at when scott sent me an email and uh it's the universe within and beyond and i was thinking well within we can talk you know nucleosynthesis and we're all stardust and all that but I was thinking, you know, what is it that draws us to this activity? And with the visual imaging activities, you know, we're just drawn to the grander and just the sense, as Scott was saying earlier, these just enormous lengths of time and distance. And somehow that makes us maybe feel small, but it also makes our troubles feel small. And that's one of the advantages yes. of this star stuff. But I wanted to do some science in addition to the visual imaging I was doing, which is how I got into this. And I think a lot of the time when we think about getting into new activities, and it was like this for me in uh, like 2009, I was scared, basically. I Look, I, I break just about every piece of hardware that I touch. I, you know, telescopes die on me. I have a lot of trouble with hardware. And I was never much of a visual imager and I was never, you know, I didn't get a degree in astrophysics or anything. And what I found was that all of us, or many of us, and these days I hear it a lot from many of you out there, want to do some science. And what I found was, as Scott was saying, it's surprisingly easy 
My biggest challenge, you know, I, I have a small business, but my biggest challenge is just convincing people it's something that they can do, that they can capture the specter of stars. And in terms of this universe within, what I found is the more I understand the objects I'm looking at, the more rich my visual observing is. So in fact, if you think back to the first time you saw the Orion Nebula, think about it, where were you? or the first time you looked through a telescope. For me, it was a star party in, in the city in Denver. I was all excited. I got up to a dob. Somebody was running the dob, much like many of you doing outreach. And they were talking about this great thing we were gonna see. And I looked through, uh, maybe your experience was like mine. I was really disappointed. Oh. I was in the city. You know, I had no idea what I was looking at. And, you know, it, it was just, I was crestfallen, excuse me. And so I'm just grabbing a little prop here. The reason I tell that story is because if your experience was like mine, why would you ever go back and look at the Orion Nebula? Well, partly we've gotten better. We have dark sky sites. We have better telescopes. This is what I wanted to show you. Averted vision, right? We can now look at things <laughs> through averted vision and see much more clearly. We understand how to do that kind of thing. These, uh, Scott's going to start selling these because they're a real <laughs> right. observing tool. <laughs> so, I need to find out who the manufacturer is. Yeah, probably overseas. You might have trouble getting probably. them. There's going to be a run on them after this presentation. <laughs> so, I thought those were eclipse glasses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought they had diffraction gratings at the pupil. It looks like there's something there in the center. That's right. Yeah, there is. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so <clears throat> But I'll tell you, even though we have all those advantages now when we look at, at things like the Orion Nebula, I think one of the reasons we go back and enjoy it as much as we do is because even if it's just this smudge like it was that first time I saw it, we bring our understanding to the eyepiece. Over the years, we've all read a little bit about it being the birthplace of stars and you know, it's stellar nursery. And when we bring that understanding, then the visual experience gets richer. And that's what spectroscopy did for me, was it complemented the visual observing, uh, you know, the, uh, the visual imaging of, of which I did very little. Uh, and so what I, what I got was this little inch and a quarter grading. And I'm just delighted. I've never done this before. I've, I've talked a lot on Zoom, but I'm just delighted at the possibility of showing you how a grading works. Look at those lines there. Yeah. So this is like a prism. It, you know, it's pretty transparent. You probably wouldn't want to drive your car wearing this as a monocle. I'm just saying, you know, talk to your insurance agent before you go down that route. But you can see those lines and those lines, just like when you look at a rainbow through a prism, will allow you to understand what's in that gas tube or what's in a star that's, you know, millions of light years away. Wonderful, and, wonderful live demo. Wonderful demo. Yeah, Doing that absolutely. With your camera and the tube behind. Brilliant. Absolutely well, brilliant. I, I, oh, thank you so much. I was, I, I'm thinking, why haven't I been doing this all these years? They're brilliant. Well, thanks. I really appreciate it. So that's the kind of thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to do spectroscopy where I showed people, including myself, what was possible. And so I just, I have a handful of slides here, but uh, let's not get carried away with slides. But I, I wanted to show you what happens and the way you can use a grading like this. You know, you can screw it onto the nose piece. If you just have a DSLR that's tracked, then you can screw it onto the nose piece or a Fitz camera or, you know, video camera or still camera, or, you know, filter wheel. So this isn't hard. You know, I think there's lots of obstacles to getting started in something new, especially something with as many syllables as spectroscopy. I'm, I'm telling you, this is off the record now, but in my next life, I'm going to choose a field that has far fewer syllables. It's too hard to pronounce. <laughs> so when we put this on the telescope, we get a rainbow spectrum. That looks like this. That's it. That's the whole thing. It's beautiful just in itself. But if you look really closely at some of these, you'll see like right there, there's a gap. And now whether there's lines or gaps depends on some physics, which I won't get into. You can see those bright spots on those rainbows. 
But that's what they say, like 70 or 80 percent of the professional research that gets done in astronomy gets done with spectra. Whether it's detecting ET, including the face on Mars, you know, if we discover ET, it's likely to be done spectroscopically. We'll detect the gases on these planets. But even if we're not imagers, even if we're, you know, personally not imaging, knowing something about spectroscopy can enhance our experience. Uh, what I did that first night right here in Seattle was I, I used, I actually dug it out. It's the first time I've seen it in probably 10 years. Um, this is the, the Logitech webcam that I, you can even see some of the duct tape residue. And I put a, a, you know, eyepiece barrel on it and put it on my C8 right outside that window in my backyard in Seattle. I came in at midnight, you know, my, my blue jeans, the, the knees were grass stained because I was looking at Vega in August, but I was right here in Seattle. In a few minutes, I'll show you what that spectrum looks like, but it looks something like this. So that's the kind of thing. So I, I was starting to say one of the obstacles is people think this stuff, what are the obstacles? Expensive, wrong, like a $200 grading. Hard to use, hard to mount. No, you screw it onto your nose piece of your camera most of the time. Hard to understand. No, I'm a knuckle dragging programmer. Uh, you know, and, and the cool thing is you don't have to know all the deep, deep astrophysics to, to do this kind of thing and observe it. And you don't need a huge telescope. Heck, even an ED80, you know, can do this kind of thing. And we were talking during the break, if some of you weren't, uh, weren't around, about observing in the city and how you can spot things sometimes through the clouds uh, with a CCD. I was out with some school kids the other day and or last fall, and it clouded over. We had a video camera pointing at Vega. And the spectrum just stayed up on the screen, even though it was completely clouded, a live spectrum. I'll show you in a few minutes also some uh, outreach examples, just really quickly some of the science. These differences here are fingerprints of the elements. And these are called spectra. And we actually name these, but that, that's hydrogen alpha. That, what, that's robin egg blue, hydrogen beta. There's hydrogen everywhere in the universe. And so when we see these, we can use them to study what we're seeing. Tiny bit of science here. You'll recall the Bohr model has electrons jumping around in, in atoms. And when they jump, they absorb or emit light. So when they jump between these two orbits, you get red light. There's that robin egg blue and hydrogen mm. jumping from orbit four to two. And there's another jump there. So that's all we're observing. And I'll be really honest, I don't know any other molecular or subatomic physics or any of that to do what I do and have a great time. And you can see what happens. You, you have basically a grading in your light path and you get that rainbow and then we study it. And as you saw this earlier, the kinds of mounts that we can use. So what can we actually do? Because that's what we wanna do. Again, coming back to this universe within, we're in this, I think, you know, as humans, we're learning machines. You watch a two-year-old or a one-year-old or you know any child, and they're just in learning mode. They're sponges. And all of us are self-selected. The fact that we're here listening to talks like this means that we've really embraced that inner, inner learning machine. <laughs> and that's why I enjoy this activity so much. This is a, just a wonderfully colorful view. Wow. And shows us something just just this is really the bedrock of the science that we read about in the magazines. These are separate images captured at different times by Torsten Hansen. Look at the instrument here, a 20 centimeter Newtonian with a video camera. And again, the details here, we won't get into a lot of the details, but the stars go from hot to cool. And so you can see the hot B stars here and then A stars and then down to the cool K and M stars. But look at the differences. This is how we know what the star temperatures are because these stars are different temperatures and their spectra are different. Isn't that amazing? So we can do this with a backyard telescope. It's a big, it's been a well-kept secret, not deliberately well-kept. I've been shouting it from the rooftops for a decade now, but you can capture this kind of data. I'll be honest, I, I photometry never really captured my attention. I'm delighted the AAVSO has jumped into spectroscopy 
Uh, Stella Kafka, when she was there, Arnie before her, uh, they now have a, a database for uh, spectra that you can contribute and will be used uh, scientifically. So there are opportunities for us to actually contribute with spectra. I'll just show you one quick thing here. Notice that this robin egg blue line is strongest on that star. It's weaker here, right? And weaker there and doesn't even exist on these really cool stars. So that's how hydrogen lines like these, like these, excuse me, can help us understand stars. So what about that? Can you see that feature there on your screen? I doubt it. I can barely see it. It may be averted imagination on my part. But there is a feature there. And when we plot this data by intensity, so that peak there is because the star is really bright, right? That's an intensity axis there. And then this dip there is because of, there's a little dimming there. So th we plot the data. That's really what it's all about is looking at graphs. It's not for everybody. Somebody, some people prefer to be with pretty images. So I'm gonna move really quickly here. We have very little time. Uh, but I wanted to show you some examples of the kinds of things that we can do. Here's a star party for those of you who do outreach. Uh, again, this is in France. This is Marseille. Uh, they're doing a gas tube here like that one behind me, which I'm going to turn off. So it lasts. Um, and for those of you who are teachers, this makes a great activity uh, in the classroom. I've just run over my AirPods here. So uh, if you set up a small telescope, and Scott was mentioning this, it was at the Table Mountain Star Party, I think, Scott, that we first met on this. We set up a, a again, it was a Explore Scientific small telescope with the jury mm -hmm. and um, just pointed it at Vega. It's like a crowd magnet because it's colorful, it's live video, it's moving around. In fact, just really quickly here, I wanted to show you how easy it is to get data. This is an image that you could get off your telescope or off of your DSLR. It's in my RSpec software. But I, listen, it's late. Nobody wants to sit through a software demo. But I wanted to show you. There's the rainbow. There's the spectrum that came off the star analyzer grading. And if you just bracket that region in with the software, over here you get that intensity graph I mentioned. So that peak is because the star is really bright. And see that little dip right there? That's that gap right there, that dimming. So those are the absorption lines. This is from that first night out with my C8. And listen, I, like I said, I'm a knuckle dragger. I break things. This is actually a video I shot that night. So um, there is a video playing. You can see the, the spectrum jumping around here. And even over on the right here, the spectrum's jumping around because my scene's changing. But those dips are from the hydrogen on that distant star. And there's lots of things we can do to, to measure that data and figure out what it is, but we don't have time for any of that. So let me turn that off uh, and just show you a couple more examples. Um, and that's certainly not the one we want since we saw that. I wanted to show you just a couple, listen. When, oh, this is cool. Yeah, when Janet Simpson from the UK sent me this, again, I have a confession. I couldn't, I, honest, I, honestly, I couldn't remember what a wolf a star was. Like many of you, I'd read about them over the years, but you know, a lot of things go in one ear and out the other. But my experience has been once it's your data, things start sticking. And so again, quickly, a wolf a star is a late stage star that some of you here can do much better explanations of it and understand far more than I do. Blown off the outer shell, the strong stellar winds create, and here's the, the intensity graph, and look at that graph. We've got carbon, carbon, carbon. What's going on here? Well, remember, stars burn through the elements, so to speak. And at some point, they're, they're consuming carbon. And this is like the soot, as if, of that star. And we're seeing that with a DSLR on a mechanical tracker. Right. And Wolf Ray oh. stars are very rare. And yes. uh, uh, I had recently read that they are the source of fluoride. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's only a source couple of fluoride. Hundred. So the fluoride that's in our teeth oh. comes from these stars. That's that's amazing. Really amazing. We can look at the spectra of comets. Again, beautiful little string of gems and see the, the carbon, the swan bands. Again, really quickly here. You know, earlier, I think Kareem was talking about supernovae. And just real quickly here, uh, I think most of us are familiar with Doppler shift where things change in wavelength as they're moving. 
So if something's coming towards you, the wavelength's going to be shorter, like a train going through a station, right? Hi, everyone, it's coming towards you. Laura, when it's moving away. Suppose we were looking for some those features in a spectrum, and instead of finding them there, we found them over here. That would mean that it was blue shifted, the object was coming towards us. So here is a supernova, again, the shortest supernova presentation you've ever heard. Two stars, some gas from one goes on the other and it blows up. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can dilate that and you can talk about it for a lifetime. Tom, I need you to substitute for my class. <laughs> There won't be a quiz on this either. Demonstration I just saw. Yeah, no, I know it was a little fast. But... <laughs> like a small town blinking, you miss it. Yeah, yeah well, it's, awesome. it's like supernovae in some ways. So uh, in uh, M101, there was a supernova. And we know supernovas are, as, as Scott was mentioning, just enormously bright. There's an image of one that was local to us uh, at a different time. You can see it. There's a spherical expanding shell around it. There's a spectrum that uh, David Strange captured. And again, just to give you an idea, the kinds of uh, sensitivity we've got, just a nine inch telescope, less than 15 minutes of integration time. And that spectrum had a deep dip in it. So again, there's the spectrum, there's the star, there's the rainbow in mono, because we're more sensitive in mono. And there's a deep dip that's that gap right there. Now, uh, again, there's a lot, lot more to this that we can discuss. I, I'm gonna move pretty quickly here just because of time. Uh, I apologize that we can't really get much further into that, except to remind you that Adam Reese used type, and his team used type 1A supernovae for the work that they did on the accelerating cosmological expansion and won the super, and won the supernova, yeah, won the Super Bowl? No, we'll get that right yet. Won the Nobel Prize for that work. I think the instrument they used might've been a little more than this star analyzer grading. What about, again, last example? measuring the spectrum of a black hole. Of course, black holes don't emit light that we can see, but the accelerating matter that's accretion disk that's spiraling in, it gets very hot. So here, David Hayworth down in Portland, Oregon, captured this spectrum. There's two little dots of light there. Let's zoom in on it. There they are. So, and there is the spectrum. Now this guy, Martin Schmidt was 24 years old when he looked at this. And like any good science, he tried to prove or eliminate what those lines were. And so he compared them to Vega, which by the way, is what was in my software a few minutes ago. There's those hydrogen lines that we'd expect to find on most stars. And there aren't any lines, there aren't any peaks or dips up on this data that match that data. So he went, ah, there's no hydrogen on this object, whatever it is, except there was, and he figured it out massively red shifted because this object was so far away. This is the kind of thing that you can do with a backyard telescope. This doesn't take hours of integration time. In fact, a lot of guys and gals like doing this in the city because it's much more immune to light pollution. So again, David calculated the red shift. You can see he was pretty close to the published value. Uh, and um, again, we can talking about age of objects, this light, you know, two billion light years away it originated. What astonishes me is that light that's so old can still have this data embedded in it. It's all around us. Every night you're out under the stars, all that data is just washing over us. Mm -hmm. So the amazing thing is that that light still has that information. Many things or most other things in the universe don't age so well. There's Martin Schmidt a few years ago. Now I've been accused of throwing him under the bus and it's true, I'm jealous of his full head of hair. But anyway, just to finish up here, how do you get started doing this kind of thing? First of all, I, I was gonna say, take my word for it, believe me, but ask around, go to our forum and be convinced that this is something you can do, which you can. If you've ever captured an astronomical image, you can do this and I'll help you get there. Um, so diffraction grading, you need some sort of camera, you may need a spacer, and you may need some, oh, you do need some software. This is my software you've seen splashed all over the footer there. There's some freeware out there. It's what I started with, uh, and then I decided I, I needed uh, need to write my own. So that's how you get started. My site has a ton of information. I continue, and it surprises me, Scott, that after all these years, I can continue to be as astonished by this. I think, you know, just to sort of recap, that when something's beautiful and it captures our attention, 
that beauty doesn't really fade. I mean, when you smell a rose next week, it's, it's as beautiful as this week when you smelled it. And I think my enthusiasm comes from the same sense of wonder and beauty that we all get looking at the sky. And spectroscopy has surprised me in how much easier it can be than what I expected. Easier, cheaper, more exciting, and less demanding of intellect, thank goodness for me. So thanks again, I know I moved fast, maybe took a little more time than I should have. Uh, I'm here to answer questions uh, from my site anytime you want. Thanks for uh, inviting me, Scott, I appreciate the opportunity. Yes, absolutely. Well, I did uh, uh, throw out uh, your website out on the uh, on the chat, and I do recommend, you know, they start with the 100 line uh, uh, grading and um, uh, which looks like that. It's on a, uh, you know, standard inch and a quarter uh, uh, filter ring and um, will fit on a number of cameras, as, as you suggest, and uh, and get the software. And if you think you need the little spacer or something later, uh, you can do that, but you can get started directly with uh, what he's recommending, and um, uh, I think it's fantastic. I've seen it in action myself, and uh, uh, absolutely, you know, get started in uh, doing some spectra. You know, join the ranks of of uh, research astronomers by doing that, and uh, uh, you know, his software makes it uh, easy, and you're going to have insight to what's going on inside of a star. You know, you'll see. You know, I, I, I wish I was doing this when uh, Betelgeuse was uh, going through its dimming effects and stuff. You know, what would I have learned myself, you know, instead of just uh, reading, uh, you know, the science forums about it. So totally, totally cool. Tom, thank you again. I, I am so thrilled that you uh, joined us here on Global Star Party and you're always welcome back. So Thanks. great. OK, so. Uh, our next speaker um, is uh, uh, Jason Wallace. Jason, I, I, I wanted to start um, putting on, uh, uh, inviting presidents of astronomy clubs and people that are, uh, you know, working directly with the Astronomical League uh, and or the Night Sky Network. Uh, and tonight's special guest uh, in this series that I hope to continue on is, um, is Jason Wallace, and he is going to talk about the Richland Astronomical Society. Jason, I'll turn it over to you, man. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Scott. I want to thank you for inviting me and uh, giving us a chance to talk about our club. And uh, I think it's a little unfair. You had Tom go first with a wonderful speaker, <laughs> you know, so Tom, I'm definitely going to be looking you into are, some of the spectrum stuff. <laughs> you are equally as passionate, I know, so. <laughs> Thank you. Right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen real quick. Let's see if I can share it here. Still kind of new at Zoom, so I do apologize, guys. It's okay. Uh, let me know when you can see my screen. It's oh, coming up. Get to the beginning here. It's coming up. Okay. We can see it now. We see it good. Okay. Is uh, the thumb video kind of in the way, or is it okay? Just like that, looks great. There you're in presentation okay. mode now. All right, perfect. All right, so these are kind of the, the different organizations we're affiliated with. You know, we are affiliated with Night Sky Network. We are, let me see if I can get my pen here to work. Uh, Stu Pen, laser pointer. So Night Sky Network, affiliated with that. Astronomical League, we've been with them for, I don't know how long, a very long time. We actually have one of their officers come down and speak almost at every star party. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this as we go through the presentation. And we were very excited about joining Explorer Alliance. You know, we just joined that about last month. So uh, thank you, Scott, for uh, letting us join into your organization. Appreciate thank that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. So next slide, a little bit about myself. Scott asked me to talk a little bit about that. So so my, my first scope, you know, was a Tasco uh, 60 millimeter. Uh, my older brother actually bought it when I was about 10 years of age back in 1983. Uh, there really wasn't any World Wide Web or anything like that to learn anything off of. There's only the library, and our library was very faint on almost any kind of documentation for astronomy, uh, mostly just words and, and no real star maps. So uh, the next one, you know, we got my first look at the galaxies was actually in ninth grade. Uh, my science teacher, Gary Cole, he had a 10 inch cave. I don't know if you guys remember those old scopes, you know, they're, they're pretty nice. They're still nice today. And I, we actually still have one at one of our other clubs. Um, first club I joined was actually in 1996. 
the Columbus Astronomical Society. Uh, I soon had to leave due to college and kids and it was about an hour and a half drive back and forth. And at the time, I just didn't have time or money to, to stay involved. And it was a very sad time for that. Uh, later, I joined RAS with the Richmond Astronomical Society, became a board member in 2020, still in today. Um, so this was a very uh, nice club. And I'm gonna talk about that a little more as we go through. Also joined uh, CAPAC in 2015, which is the Crawford Park Astronomy Club. I'm a board member and also the president of that club. Uh, I built a couple telescopes in my, my short time I mean, in astronomy. You know, I built an eight inch, I'm working on, currently working on a 32 inch, which is an F3. Uh, should have that done in the next couple months, I'm hoping. And of course I perform on average about 35 outreach events each year, which many people perform a lot more, but I'm happy to do that because my true love is uh, outreach and looking looking at stars and galaxies and just enjoying astronomy, to be honest with you. And off to the right hand side are just some of the different kinds of scopes I own currently. You know, many scopes I've either given away to people or, or fixed up and donated to different things. And left hand side is my eight inch I made for my daughter, the Adam. In the middle is my uh, 32 inch I'm working on currently. And then of course, me and my wife is the last picture with, uh, she has a 12 inch Dob and I have my uh, 16 inch dob there in front of the observatory. Wonderful. Yeah, so here's like an overall picture of the Warren Rump Observatory with the Richmond Astronomical Society. We actually preserve, take care of, and improve upon. You know, so as you can see here, this is the big dome that holds Big Blue. So I'll talk about that shortly. We have where we store all of our, our own scopes and the club scopes inside this building here. Plus, this is an education center. Uh, this is the actual clubhouse here. And here is actually the, the Bob Jett uh, dome that we, uh, we, ded we did a dedication to him last year. And it holds a, uh, a Mead LX850. So it's a very nice telescope used for astral photography. Um, this is right off our website to school more information about the club. You know, we are a nonprofit organization formed in 1960. Uh, to, form, to promote the advancement of astronomy. Um, we had 36 inch mirror, uh, diameter mirrored uh, Newtonian telescope conducting an active club education program, regular monthly meetings and public nights. So beginning of every uh, month, the first Saturday of every month, we actually have a public night in our meetings that we talk to. Uh, this is a list of our current presidents and board members and also officers. I would say every one of these people probably know better about astronomy than I do. You have Dolores as our president. She is one of the best people you're ever gonna walk into on public nights. You're gonna walk up to the big big blue, you know, the dome itself, and she's the first person normally that you're gonna meet. And she's gonna give you a ticket to get in, but she tells you about what we're looking to for big blue. She tells you about a little bit about the club. Very pleasant person to talk to, you know, you got Eric, he's also a board member and he's also the chairman. Um, very smart and, and very fun to talk with the outreach programs. Uh, we got Dan Wade, he will he sets up all of our video and, and voice and all that stuff and runs the boards for that. Richard Curling, you guys probably all seen him on every single one of these uh, star parties that are held by by this this uh, site and, and uh, he just won a, won a thing on Astronomical League as well. Just a little bit ago, I saw him winning door prize. Uh, Raymond, he's, he's one of our treasurer. We got Bruce, he probably has his master's already for astronomical league. Uh, he's probably one of the people you can talk to and he can point about anything you want in the sky and give you a conversation about the first time he's seen this stuff. He's probably seen more than I've seen in a lifetime. So, so great guy to talk to. And as we go down, then lastly, you got me at the bottom. You know, great team. Absolutely great. This is our, yeah, this is our big blue. This is what we're known for in, in, in Ohio. We're wow. the largest, yeah, the largest privately owned club telescope that I'm aware of um, that you can, in Ohio anyways, that you can physically look through the scope and visually see things by the public. You know, so the public can actually touch this telescope. We we raise them up in that scissor lift that you see in the back up to 16, almost 20 feet high up in the air because the eyepiece is actually up here on the other side. You know, so it's a great thing to look through. 
Um, I was actually looking in last year, I was, at, I was looking at globular star clusters in Andromeda is what I was doing when I was doing one of the Astro League uh, 50 globular stars projects. So it's a great telescope to see things in. You know, it is, an, is on a Newtonian mount, which you can see here. It is uh, 36 inches, automatic tracking. We use a kind of an older program. I know a lot of people on here maybe know of it. It's a Megastar 5 is what we're currently using. Um, we love that program on here because it operates very, very well as a system. We just never changed it. Uh, focal length is a 6.3. Um, so it's not considered a fast or a long exposure scope. So it's kind of right down the middle. You know, great for a little bit of everything. Excellent. Yeah, and then a little bit about our outreach here too. We, we post everything on Night Sky Network. And you can see the picture right over here. There's one of our planetariums. I haven't got a chance to do a planetarium in the last couple of years due to COVID. <laughs> you know, it's kind of depressing. You know, I, I enjoyed going in there and doing a, either I would have a, a video showing that would, that kind of goes through everything. And then I'd go through some, some different objects like uh, maybe Indi, uh, Indian uh, constellations and telling the stories behind those. So something a little different than, than the traditional. And then, you know, people, kids and people love that. We attend a lot of schools and do that as well. And I was actually first introduced to Planet Tamers by, by uh, Dan Everly. He's been a very big mentor to me about doing a lot of outreach. So appreciate him. He's been in business for over 50 some years in outreach. Uh, so anyways, where I talked about the first Saturday of every month, the club meets and we have outreach right there. We can get a chance to look through Big Blue or have a, uh, in the, in the actual education room, we do a talk. One of the two will, will occur. Um, every fourth and fifth Saturday, we're actually at Lobo Park, which is another public outreach event. Um, we do public schools. Uh, this is just mention a few. There are many others. Galleon, Mansfield, Ontario, Crestline, Galleon. Oh, I don't want to get listed Galleon twice. Apologize, guys. <laughs> uh, Shelby, and we do do many others. Uh, parks, we have Crawford's Park, Richmond Park, Morrill County, and many others there as well. Uh, camps and wildlife reserve. We have Hidden Hollow, Mahegan, Mount Gilead, Campgrounds, Lobo Park Nature Center, and others there as, as well that we, we actually go to. And then we do a lot of private events. So a lot of people go out to Night Sky Network and they actually actually post a request for an event. And we actually will, 90% of the time, we try our best to go to support that event and get people to go to it because it's all volunteer. And you see here, this is just some of our calendars that we posted. You know, March was pretty much getting filled up. April is just now starting to fill up. And we're gonna go over a very big uh, outreach thing we're doing in, doing in April too here in just a little bit. Um, Fantastic. This go a little bit about outreach. Either it's your sky or no sky at all. You know, we are going to do something to keep you interested and make sure you have a good time when you're up there. You know, inside right here, we actually have Raymond. He's actually showing us one of the soft telescopes, sleuth telescopes. You know, I can't remember what galaxy we're looking at there, to be honest with you. It's been a while since we've been in it. But you can tell it was all indoor because it was all cloudy outside and you just couldn't see anything. So it's neat to be able to see through some of those telescopes, you know, in around that area. Um, and then, over here, I kind of lighten the picture up because it was taken at nighttime. So it's a little bit graniated because I lighten the, lighten the picture up. But this is at nighttime, we're all pointing things, we're starting to line scopes and things like that. Yeah, it's, it's a very good event. And what I like about this, real quick story for you how it works, is you come in and you park anywhere in this area or clear over here on this side, and you walk up these steps. When you get to the top of the step, you're usually gonna meet 99% of the time a guy named Mike Ryman. And Mike, he will he will have two scopes setting up here. We have a C8 and his manual dob, his 12-inch dob will be setting up here. And then he's gonna start talking to you because he wants to be the first person to grab you. As soon as you walk up the steps and show you, here's what's in my manual scope, which is normally a brighter object that you can see um, at nighttime. And then his C8 normally has his computer set up and he has some actual photography going on. He's showing what the what his scope can see there. He's telling you about them. And then you'll walk and run into me. Usually I'm about right here in this area with my, with my scope. And when you walk into me, usually I'm, I'm, gonna point, I'm pointing at something that's going to be pretty bright in the sky because I want you, your first time, to be that wow factor. 
Now, I know like, like uh, you know, we just heard a little bit ago, you know, that first time you look through a scope, eh, sometimes you get depressed from what you see, you know? So I'm gonna pull up something, for example, like uh, M13, but I'm not gonna say the word M13. I wanna tell the story behind it, you know? Here we are, we're looking up at the, the Hercules constellation and in, in here, there's a little hidden gem that back in 1714, Imran um, Haley actually said you can see it with your naked eye. Today you can't because of all the light pollution, especially in Ohio. You know, but through the scope, you're gonna you're still gonna get the chance to discover this gem. And when you look through here, you're gonna see a hundred to almost a million stars all in one spot. And we call this the Hercules cluster. And, and, and I like to give them the name versus M13 because when they go home. People aren't going to remember things like NGC 6205, but they're going to remember that name Hercules because they watched all the cool shows. And they're going to say, hey, I saw the cluster. And they might say 100 million stars for all I know, but the excitement is what I want to build in them. And usually they do come back and they enjoy the stories and the information about what we're looking through the scope. And as they move down the trail, they're, they're going to run into either, it could be my wife, you know, with her manual Dob, and she's teaching them how to use a Dob. Or you could run into Terry, and Terry is another one of those people that amazes you when you talk to the guy because he hand draws star maps. And uh -huh. yeah, there's actually uh, uh, pictures, and there's a guy who came from California one time to actually see the star map that he drew that we actually have hanging in the in our, our education room. Wow! And, and it's up, it, it's up, That's and the one he drew. Huh? Yeah, and you got to see, if you have a good chance, you have to come and see this because he drew of uh, the whole entire, basically the universe, the nearby universe, you know, that you can see, and he hand drew it all, and different colors represent how far away it is and the, the distance. Wow. He could go into it a lot better than I could, and he's currently working on one that is 13 foot by, I believe, 20 feet. Uh, okay, Jason, <laughs> I, a challenge here. You need to bring him on the show. Yes, so, yes, and, yep. and I want to do that. He he's an amazing guy. <laughs> okay. Great. Yeah. Yep. So like I said, and then when you get to Big Blue, you're walking up here to, to give you a ticket to tell you what's going on in Big Blue and what we're looking at. And then you get raised up in the lift and you get to look up and see whatever we're seeing that at that time. It's a great thing to do. Okay, so I'll keep on going down this little bit here. Okay. Okay, and this is kind of what drives me to is the outreach part. And these are my grandchildren, three of my grandchildren. I actually have five. Uh, one is still uh, just turning one this month, and the other one's still in the belly of one of my one of my daughters. <laughs> but you can see their excitement. They all love astronomy so hmm. far. So I want to keep digging that in, you know, because I love spending that time with my grandchildren. Um, this Jason, is a little bit how, if you ever have a request, uh, you go ahead. Okay, if, if you ever have a chance and you want to come to Ohio and you want to re request a, an actual observing time with us, uh, this is where you can go to, to request it, you know, to request a program, you go to Net, Night Sky Network, and of course the website right down here below, nightsky.jpl.nasa.gov slash club that's um, interquest, you know, you can go through that, but that's where you can go to and you can just click on our club, which is 644 is our actual ID, and you can request a time and a place when you wish to have us do observe. Or you can see our calendar that we current our current times we will be there. And you're more than welcome to join us and have a good night with that because we do charge nothing. Um, we just love seeing new people arrive and come to us and, and spend time with you. So if you get a chance, Please visit the site. Please come and visit us one of our public nights. You'll have a very good time. Wonderful, wonderful. I did I did post a couple of uh, links uh, to Warren Rupp Observatory and also the Night Sky Network uh, link for um, for joining. Great. Okay, uh, I'd like to see uh, some people join the organization and help support uh, Warren Rupp Observatory. You know, really one of uh, America's great uh, uh, observatories dedicated to amateur astronomy. So, you know, you look at something through a 36 inch telescope and it will blow your mind. So, um, yes, absolutely. 
Uh, the, the remark I wanted to make, Jason, is that you are, uh, you're so lucky to have so much of your family involved in astronomy, you know, so uh, you don't see it very often, uh, but uh, it is wonderful to see and it must make for, a, uh, you know, a great experience for you in particular. Uh, so see your grandkids and your wife interested in astronomy like that. Yeah, that, that's one of the wonderful things I love about it because when my daughter came to me on her 16th birthday and said, Dad, I want a telescope for my 16th birthday. And, you know, that just blew my mind at that moment, you know. Sure. So, so the first scope I bought her was a 10-inch dob, you know. And, and, and of course, we took that scope together as a team, and, and uh, we started looking at stars, and it was a great experience. And from there, the whole family caught on board. So that's wonderful. So I really enjoyed that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. Jason, thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, uh, what's going on with your group, with your, uh, your, your experience in astronomy. And it uh, uh, looks like you have another slide here for the Mohican Under the Stars event. Yeah, I just got like two more, I believe. Yes, because this is our big outreach that's going on this month. It's April 22nd to 24th. It's called the Mohegan Wildlife Weekend. And uh, we'll be actually be at nine different locations during this this event timing. And Terry Mann, the president of Dark Sky Association, she will actually be the keynote speaker. who will be speaking at our observatory during this time period. So definitely want to put a thing out for this. So if you're in Ohio, you know, you're anywhere around the Columbus area, Mansfield area. This is kind of like to the north eastern side, middle, central. Uh, come down and visit. Check out this website right here. And it's going to tell you all about all the events going on daytime and nighttime. And like I said, we'll be spread pretty thin, but our plan is to try to be as many of these nine locations as we can. And of course, you can come to the observatory as well. So we have awesome. that there. Great thing. Great people. And then this is our Hidden Hollow Astronomy Conference coming up September 23rd to 25th. Um, just kind of go over it really quickly because I know we are short on time, so I apologize. Um, we actually have our, on September 23rd, our camp opens up and we'll have vendors, displays, raffle tickets going on, our education, we'll have refreshments going on, the uh, 1700, which is five o'clock. We'll have dinner, basically this is on your own, which will be a food truck and many near restaurants all about five minutes away. So lots of food availability and normally we have Plenty of leftover food from the night before when, when we're up there uh, as well. Um, we'll have MUFON speaking, be Tom, uh, Camp Law to close September 24th. We started getting into more of our speakers. So we have Bob Morrow, he, about Bob Knobs, he'll be talking about how to calmate his scope. We have Madeline Wade, undercovering the invisible, observing the universe with gravitational waves. We have some lunch going on. And then we come right back with Gary. Uh, Cater, and he'll be talking about the Russell diagram, the Rosetta Stone, and the stellar astronomy, and Les Wade exploring neutron stars and exteriors of interiors with gravity. Terry Mann will be talking. My wife was talking to, to her a little bit uh, a couple of days ago. She, she was still in Alaska, so she's going to give us her idea what she's going to talk to. Um, and of course, then at the end of the day, we got the raffles. You know, normally we have several raffle prizes. Those be given out, and then 25th is just talk, chit chat, and we all leave around noon. You know, sounds like so, a great time. So we can't wait to see some more people invited and come into it. Um, this is just a few pictures of the last hidden hollow we had. You know, from the past. There we all know Molly. She's been on this one several times. Just a couple of pictures of a few people going through the yard. Mm -hmm. This, of course, we had a planetarium at one time. Um, us eating dinner together, just, just sitting around, having a good time during daytime, had seen some people do some talks, and at nighttime, we're all setting up our scopes. <laughs> I think that's at every star party. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then very lastly, we have, of course, on here, yeah, it's just how to contact us. You know, if, if you go to our actual website, well, if you go to Night Sky Network, you can get to our website from there. But if you just type in WRO.org, they'll take you to our website and you can register or you can just see a little bit more about who we are and what we do. And of course, our address is there as well. And our very last item is, of course, 
one of these days we're going to convince and get you Scott up here to, to our back to our to one of our <laughs> star parties. I want to go. I want to go. I want to look for that big telescope. This year, yep. uh, you know, uh, I um, I recommend that you guys get in touch with uh, with either myself directly or with Kent Martz and uh, make sure you request that door prize and we'll make sure that we uh, repeat uh, what we did uh, before. So, yeah, we really appreciate, appreciate it. And I think the last time that you were there, we only had a 31 inch scope. Now it's a 36. Um, and it, it, we basically got it because we had an accident with Samir. So, oh, <laughs> it wasn't, well, it wasn't a pleasant experience. So now it's bigger. Yeah. Yeah. So that was bigger. It, it wasn't a, it wasn't on purpose. It was a complete accident, you know, but it was, uh, it did allow us to go to a bigger telescope. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. If all well, accidents it could turn out that way, that would be great. Yep. Jason, thanks again, man. Thank you so much. And, uh, uh, you know, of, of course, um, you know, if you guys have any uh, updates, you want to come back and talk about uh, Warren Rupp or any of your events, uh, you're absolutely welcome to come back on Global Star Party. So thanks very much. Thank you very much. And we look forward to coming back and I will try to get some more people to do some talks for you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Okay. Well, up next, uh, we have um, uh, the uh, uh, Daniel Higgins and uh, Scott. Is it Scott Watson? Is that right? Scott Cole, excuse me. Here we go. Let's get you guys yeah, on. Let's get you guys on. Here we are. There we go. Yeah. Are we good? Yeah, yeah uh, we're good. Let's see. No one not good? Almost good. Oh, okay. There we are. <laughs> so thank you guys for coming on again. You're becoming regulars on Global Star Party. And uh, I've been uh, listening in. I, I put on just, just almost like as background music, okay, uh, the Astral World TV uh, YouTube channel. So it was fun to listen to you guys and uh, your banter back and forth. I loved it. And um, so, you know, you guys have one of the best shows on uh, on the internet, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm really Thank honored you. you guys come on with us here on Gold Star Party. So. Hey, thanks. Thanks, guy. We, we love coming here. I love coming here. I, you know, and we're just going to keep, we're going to keep on coming and hanging out as long Absolutely. as you let us. Absolutely. And, uh, we'll, ro we'll rotate around. And stalling uh, the virtues of uh, Astral World. Absolutely. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I'm not as lucky as our, our, our friend Jason, who was just on talking about his uh, astronomy club. I have a, I have a niece. Uh, her middle name is Star, S-T-A-R-R. And, uh, you know, so what, what did I do? The first thing I did was, uh, you know, I asked her first before I made the decision. I said, you know, would you like a telescope for your birthday? She's like, what are you, what are you kidding me? My middle name's Star, right? <laughs> so, so, so I, yeah, I'd love a telescope. So what I do, I said, all right, cool. She's into it. I buy her a, a, a 6SE. I spend like $700 on a telescope. That was about six years ago. It's been in the closet ever since. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's been, uh, has not been uh, my luck getting other parts of family into most people awesome. in my family. Yeah, most people think I'm nuts, you know, going out in the cold and and freezing or getting eaten by mosquitoes and stuff like that. But um, but yeah. So so Scott, I mean, this is your first time on uh, Explore Alliance. Yep. Hey Scott, how are you? Uh, doing? Hello, hello. Yep. Scott Scott is another one of our uh, one of our hosts. We do the shows twice a week. Uh, Scott, uh, tell uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and what you do and and uh, all that. <clears throat> well, I'm a uh, I'm a professional photographer by uh, by trade, and uh, I do I've, I did a lot of landscape and uh, terrestrial work uh, for many years, and of course, you know, headshots, portraits, stuff like that. Um, and uh, I, I had developed you know a pretty extensive. Uh, business in that. And I got to a point where I, I was looking for a new challenge, um, you know, and uh, astronomy is, is something that has always been very interesting to me. And I've never been one to be uh, accused of, of dabbling uh, when it comes to, you know, getting into a hobby. And so I, <laughs> uh, I jumped in with both feet 
um, getting into this uh, into this hobby. And my my very my very first scope as an adult, I had a very small scope as a kid, but it was a toy. You know, um, uh, my first scope as an adult was a C14. Um, and uh, I, I went. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm yeah. sorry. First, I, 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 I C14. He said, he said C14. <laughs> you didn't say C4. Yeah. You didn't say C8. You said no, 14. No. Yeah, Scott is a constant butt of uh, uh, so many jokes right now <laughs> on the show, and has been so since he he purchased the scope. And yeah. for some, like when he says he jumped in with both feet, no, he jumped in whole body. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, this this is my this was my attempt at getting at least uh, one inch yeah. closer to the C14 is my first telescope. So you know that's right. That's, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, I think, think this my first like a finder scope on your uh, yeah. C14. I, I think like my that. first scope was a kaleidoscope. I think if I remember <laughs> right. So. <laughs> Well, and I, I, uh, I, I very quickly realized that I was in the deep end of the pool and uh, I was fall, I was tumbling down that rabbit hole that we uh, that we joke about, you know, in our on our show you know, about that that deep rabbit hole that that astronomy and astrophotography is. Um, and so I, I very quickly started to develop relationships with other astrophotographers um, and men and women that that were in the field. Um, and that led me to um, uh, camera concepts and uh, um, pointed me towards Dan. And, you know, that 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 just I mean, Dan and I clicked right away, you know, and uh, uh, we've been friends ever since. Um, and it led to other people like uh, Tegan Grable, um, yeah, uh, of course, our our, uh, our wonderful host, uh, Pete Myers. Pete helped me a great deal early on. And one of the things that I found, uh, and and Dan and I both share, I, I uh, uh, we talked about this numerous times, is developing a community of people that um, you know were passionate about imaging and wanted to learn as much as they could. So uh, that's the whole backbone behind what Astro, uh, uh, Astro World is all about, uh, is you know, putting together a group uh, of, of individuals, sharing ideas, open ideas, you know, and, and talking about you know, what it is that we're doing and helping each other and new people that come on board. Uh, because I, one of the biggest problems that you see is, is people, they, they jump in, and they buy these scopes and all of a sudden they realize they're in waters that they're way over their head and yeah. the scope goes into the closet and it doesn't get touched again. Um, and it's, it's sad, you know, it, that, that things like that happen. So we wanted to, to develop a, a group of, of people that were passionate about it that could help people to, as our friend Pete says, buy once, cry once. Right. That, yeah, you're going to spend some money in this hobby, but, you know, if you do it the right way, you probably won't have to do it multiple times. <laughs> and right. that, that can be a real problem. It'll you know, be the least people... expensive way to get into uh, astrophotography is to do it right the first time, you know. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's I, our I, whole that's our whole point. Yeah. And, and I, I think one of the things that I'll, I'll, and this is something that I talk not only in, in the store at Camera Concepts, but um, but on the show quite a bit as well, is that, you know, you really need to be very, very honest about what your final goal is. What do you yeah. really want to take a picture of? Do you mm -hmm. want a picture like this behind me? Or do you want a picture like Adrian has behind him? You know, they're, they're, they're two different types of compositions. So, you know, Max has got a wonderful picture, just like Adrian, of, of the Milky Way behind him. Or do you want M42 like Cameron has? You really want, there, there's a right tool for the right job. Right. And we can help you get there. It's just that you really need to be dreadfully honest on what you really want, what your expectations are, or else you're going to be really, really in a world of pain. <laughs> yeah. you know. I like what you say about passion. Now, do you find folks coming on the show that you can tell are looking to get these great images and it's mainly for posting online and seeing how many likes they can get? Do you run into anything like that where you temper it down to, well, what is it that you really want to do and are you passionate about the night sky? 
I mean, you're, you're always going to get those, those people that, that are looking to do it the least expensive way that they can, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I mean, I, I personally, I can certainly understand not wanting to throw $10,000 at something that you don't have any experience with, you know, and a lot of people think spending a thousand dollars, you know, to do this is a lot of money. Um, you know, so yes, you do get people like that, but the most of the people that we see, they are, they're passionate about, you know, perfecting their craft and understanding that this is, this is something that is, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to get at a master's level at it in a month. (laughs) You know, this, this is something that if you want to challenge, you found it. Um, (laughs) This, this will definitely challenge you. You know, and as a professional photographer, I can tell you that astrophotography is a whole different animal. You know, um, it, it requires a, it, an understanding that there's a steep learning curve, you know. Um, so a lot of people, you know, the ones that the ones that want to cheese out, they don't they don't stick around very long. You know, the, the ones that want to perfect their craft, they're the ones that come back. Um, and they come back regularly and Dan's right. You know, I get the, I'm the, you know, I, <laughs> I get the butt of jokes, you know, I, I moved actually from New York down here to Florida and that move damn near killed me. Um, uh, it, it was rough. <laughs> it was really rough. You know, so, you know I, 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 I gotta say yeah. just to, just to that point, I mean, yeah, you know what? There are some people that are throwing out pictures uh, for clickbait or whatever you want to call it that just want the likes and stuff like that on Facebook. And I get your point on that, Adrian. But yeah. I, I, I look at it from another point of view, I guess, a little bit that this, no matter how long they're doing it, they're still pointing their telescope up and they're still taking a picture of something. And they're Very still, true. you know what I mean? They're still forwarding something of their vision of it, no matter whether that's for a month, a day, or an hour. It really doesn't matter. It matters that that they're forwarding the, the passion of astronomy, even if they put it out just once. You know, even if you, they just put know. it out once and, and that's it. You know what I mean? And and you know what? We we don't wish that on people. We don't wish we wish people to stick around, you know what I mean, and, uh-huh. and get better and, and throw out wonderful pictures yeah. like 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 everybody has behind them, you know. Uh-huh. You know, that you know that, that's what that's what we all want. We want everything to get better because you know what. Sooner or later, like somebody just took a picture of a, of a supernova, supernova, um, yep. you know, missed it by two weeks, you know, for discovering a supernova. But you know what? That's the type of stuff that you kind of like you dream about. You know what I mean? Yeah, it drives you. And that, you yeah, it, you know, okay. I asked the question largely because part of my imaging, you know, I went through that where at first it was cool to get people liking photos that i took but things didn't really snap into shape until just what you guys were talking about figuring out what your goals really are when it comes to doing it and as i started getting some goals even if they were small goals or you know larger goals then all of a sudden that started to melt away for me and i was no longer trying to chase that i now i'm taking the pictures there's something that i'm looking for excuse me inside it so i was really glad to hear you guys mention you know with what you're doing helping folks to lock nail down what is it that you want to do and what is it you're getting out of when you're doing astrophotography and i thought that was you know a really cool point well yeah. one thing has happened go ahead uh, never never in time before that uh, we have such a large variety of uh, equipment available uh, at all different levels, uh, very advanced capabilities, and you can really make it your own. You mm-hmm. know, it's, it's really nice to be able to, instead of having to go straight to the top, you can, you can do incremental and customize and gradually grow it and, uh, and then make your own. And there's also a huge uh, guidance from this community uh, and and the meet, the capability to do that, which is uh, which is wonderful. Yeah, and, and you know what? If you if you ever seen you ever seen the movie What About Bob? <laughs> baby steps. <laughs> Take your baby steps, and you know yeah. it, you know, and that's it. You know what? You know what? Now that's not to say like to what Scott said. These are buy ones, cry ones. You know, you you may you just do your due diligence 
about right, what yeah. your goals are and figure out some realistic costs of what your budget is and, and get that balance between budget and expectation because that is where you got to have that balance. So, so, you know, you know, you got, you got to have, okay, I want this, but my wife will divorce me if I do that. So it's got to be somewhere <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> you, you, you know, so, <laughs> so it's got to yeah. be there. And, and even, even if you don't have that, uh, uh, you know, situation uh, where, you, you know, maybe you can buy what you'd like to buy and there's not going to be a problem with that. Uh, you know, you will go through, you know, we're on a journey. And so, yeah. You will you will have certain types of gear. I mean, think of yourself as going on. You're an explorer. You're you're outfitting yourself for the exploration. So, to an astronomer, that is going to be gear. Those are our tools. And as you, you know, as you learn more, you're going to want and need more tools. Okay. So that's oh, that's bringing uh, out the big guns. <laughs> yeah. So what do you got here, Daniel? That, I just ah, finished putting this together. This beautiful. is the uh, 127 carbon fiber. 127. Right. <laughs> With the uh, 268 and the uh, seven position filter wheel, and I'm getting a little heavy here, so I'm going to put this down. <laughs> but uh, I just finished putting that together today. So well, that's uh, the other thing is, thank you, you know, Daniel. With, it, with imaging, uh, you know, what, what you, start, you start realizing is, uh, you know, in the early days, you just bought a whole bunch of telescopes because you wanted to try different things. But now you can actually use all those telescopes um, because you're going to want to keep the imaging train uh, fixed, you know, keep your flats calibrated. So you start building an arsenal of, of, uh, of, uh, of scopes starting with the basics. You know, start with the small refractor, you know, get the basics down, and then you start to expand and maybe you want a longer focal length you know, um, telescope, uh, you get the bigger mount. Uh, so you can grow uh, more than ever before and continue to use, it's not like your old equipment becomes obsolete. You actually just enhance uh, uh, the experience and broaden it. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Ooh. But um, uh, if, if I could real quick, we do, I, I, before we go, if I know, I know it's getting super late, it's 11 o'clock, uh, but, um, I'd like to talk a little about, we do have a bunch of guest, uh, guest appearances coming up uh, on Astro World that I'd like to go over real quick. Um, and if I could just do this. Real yeah, we've quick. got Bob Denny. Bob there Denny's tomorrow. Yeah, Bob Denny's going to be coming on. It's on the screen right now. Bob Denny uh, tomorrow night. And we also have a, uh, a, a raffle giveaway that we're doing tomorrow night as well. Um, yep. And then we have April 13th. We got Charles Bracken. Um, for those of you that don't know Charles, he's done plenty of books, including the uh, Deep Sky Imaging Primer, which is one of my uh, tabletop books that I, I love. Um, then on May 4th, we have Richard Wright uh, from Star Zone Software, uh, formerly of Software Bisque. Um, and uh, May 13th, we have Eric Coles, who's an astrophotographer and also one of the, uh, the main people over at the Astro Imaging Channel. Um, so the, we, so that's what we got going on, uh, so far, uh, we guess we have a lot coming up and, uh, th that's just the next, uh, <laughs> that's the next five weeks. Um, uh, one other thing, and if I could show this real quick, um, and one thing we do at, uh, at Astroworld is, um, image of the week. Uh, yep. we've been, we've been doing this for about a month now, and it's becoming really, really, um, an interesting, uh, aspect of what we do. Um, and basically you could just put an image in here. Um, we have this week, this, so this is this week's entries here. So we got uh, a couple of people here that have entered, um, for this week's, and then you could vote for whichever image you think is the, the winner and then if it's a uh, a tie we kind of go to a a wheel spin uh, thank you sean nielsen for the for the wheel spin um and then we have picture of the month nominees so these are the from the from the weeks from the month before the four winners and then this is who's winning so far so we got uh we have about eight days left of voting uh before this up to the 15th so right now chris is in uh in the lead with four votes um, for the Rosette Nebula, which is that guy right there. 
So um, actually that guy. And, and it also has all the previous winners as you go across and some rules. But th that's really one of the things uh, that, that we've been doing that's becoming a real big, uh, real big um, part of kind of what we do. So um, yeah. And then uh, the, the, the long-term goal there is, is to take uh, all of the pictures of the month you know, and um, uh, turn them into a uh, an Astro World calendar uh, that we can yep. then present uh, back to people. Um, and uh, my wife and I are, will probably be instrumental in in, in developing that. But are, are we need the raw data first, so <laughs> we'll get we'll get the we'll get the year into it, or you know, or so into this project, and and we'll see. Because we, we've already got some absolutely amazing pictures from people. Yep. Some of these some of these astrophotographers are there's they're they're giving us stuff that's just really impressive it's very impressive they're very yeah. talented so that's a lot of fun so that, that's what we do yeah. and, and basically you, you saw the banter that we had with you know the, the conversation not banter but the conversation we had with adrian cameron scott all that that's exactly how the format of the show is um it's unscripted it's having fun and sometimes we end up talking about Stuff that has nothing to do with that. <laughs> nothing at all. We go Next off thing, the rails regularly. <laughs> you know, the, 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 last time we were talking about how many Academy Awards Dune got. I mean, you know, so so uh, you know, it, it, it's 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 real interesting sure. on, on how things go at the end. Well, because, that's that's how they go at real star parties too. So right. And, yeah. and speaking of which, I'm very looking forward to this. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Thank God. I'm finally going to a star party. I'm finally going to a Woo! star party after three years of not going to anything or two and a half years of not going to, I was a staunch, I, I went to, I went to, you know, I drove all the way down to Staunton river for the star party about three years ago. Okay. And in a, in a, it's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. You can look it under my name. There's a video of it. Me and Charlie Walsh who was the, the, one of the, one of the old hosts from, for the show. Um, drove down the Staunton River in his suburban truck. He busted a hole in his gas tank. Oh, we're dripping gas all the way down. We, we were in the middle, all the way down. Don't light, light a match, man. Five. All the way. I mean, you could see it. It's going. We had to stop every 150 miles to get gas. And oh it was bad. It's, it's like a sim. And, and we're sitting there. We're dri dripping gas all over. You know what? We get there. We get. We're about. We're about. 50 miles away, let's say. My buddy, uh, my buddy Dennis, uh, um, Dennis, who runs a TDO Observatory down in, uh, in, uh, in Charlotte. <laughs> he goes, Dan, I hope you're not coming down here. I said, why? What's going on? He said, yeah, you know that hurricane that rolled through? Yeah, well, they closed the entire park, so you may as well turn back. I said, dude, I'm literally like 45 minutes. I've just drove eight and a half miles, of, eight and a half hours of driving. I smell like a gas station. Oh, my the whole God. Thing, it was just so bad. But oh. I'm, so, I'm so excited. I booked my hotel. I'll be staying up in Cherry Springs for, you know, any, about three days, but I booked for five. So we'll see. Uh, we'll it's see those little I'm experiences doing. that add character to your life, you know? So uh, uh, yeah, that's, a nice way, your that's life. a nice way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but what kind of oh, idiot will yeah. continue to drive I-95 when you know you got a hole in the gas tank? I don't know. But uh someone who know. loves astronomy, that's who I, I, I just wanted to I was meeting like five, ten people there, and then the only one that called me was a person that lives a half an hour away from the place. But whatever. Anyway, so I have a uh I have a picture of that rig if you want to see it. Let's see it. Yeah. Uh, Hold on. Share. Oh, nice. So this Whoa. Is, so this is your beginner telescope. Yeah. Yep. That's a well, nice that's beginner first telescope. And, and, it's and, not and, just and, any old C14. It's an edge. Oh, yeah. It's an edge. Yeah. yeah. It's an edge. Yeah. yeah. And he's got it's a, a six-wheel. So. Look at this thing. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. And if Mars, you notice, Mars rover. Yeah, everybody says that. Um, <laughs> down at the bottom, it's it's got the the goal zero um, uh, battery pack. That's the goal yeah, zero okay. one thousand to power everything. Nice and, and um, uh, Farpoint actually built this. 
when they built this JMI wheelie bar for me, they um, they they custom built the the battery tray to to accept that big battery. The yeah. other thing that they did that you can't really see it, but down on the on the bottom of those those straps that hold the tripod to the JMI wheelie bar, mm -hmm. uh, they innovated some uh, uh, some clips to mount. Uh, down there, and I was the very first person um, to get a JMI wheelie bar that had these these clips and this this custom. This this thing was Pete Myers put helped put this thing together for me, um, and they they worked tirelessly to 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 get this uh, to where it's at. I mean that whole thing is is bolted together. I can literally lift without the scope on it. I can lift that tripod and that wheelie bar. It's a it's like a portable pier. It's like 150 Incredible. pounds, right, of gear. But 150 pounds? Uh, no, it's more than uh, no, that. It's, it's closer than that. to 250. Yeah. 250. Wow. Yeah. I mean, well, I, you I just I, said I, you I, could I, lift it. Yeah, that's without the scope. Okay. Without the scope yeah. on it. Just well, the yeah, tripod. Just, just the tripod. Well, you know, yeah. but, but you know, Scott's also a brunt of another bad, you know, joke. <laughs> when it's first light. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. We're still we're still waiting for a decent photo from it. You know, he's only had it for a year and a half. <laughs> you know, well, he's yeah. getting ready, you know, it takes time. Yeah. Uh, it takes life, time. life happened, that's for sure. Yeah, that, that it did. That it did. And, so we, we didn't we, get we, first light on the 100 inch for in only a year or so, you know. Yeah, we, we, we've given Scott a little bit of uh, <laughs> uh, leniency uh, because of the there. move, but uh, now he's been there and he actually is, you know, he looks alive at 11 o'clock or 11 15 at night. So now, uh, now there's no excuse, Scott. So, <laughs> so. Oh, no, first lights are coming. Actually, I, I finally got the gaskets from uh, from Farpoint for the, the Monster Moag for all of the, uh, you know, the because uh, I'm running mono at the back of the scope and color at the front. And then, uh, um, you know, the, the Moag has got the filter sliders. And I went through a debacle with, you know, getting the right size gaskets to hold the 36 millimeter filters. I finally got that all done. And uh, so it's, it's, it's ready to start imaging, you know, at the back of the scope. And uh, we just need to get it out and get it set up. Yeah. So uh, you have plenty of galaxies in Virgo to give it some, uh, give it some first looks. Yeah. Is that a full, yeah. full frame yeah, uh, camera playing? there? Say again? Full frame camera? Uh, no, I'm, I, I have two uh, of the 20, the ZWO 2600s. I've got the mono. Those the are nice. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm looking at. Well, that would be just the right sizes. Yeah. You, don't, you, you have just enough uh, extra breathing room to put an OAG. And, oh, and, yes. and, and, and so it's, it's, a, it's a sweet spot. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, APSC, and I, but it's cooled. Yeah. I, did, yeah. I did get first lights on the scope when I was up in New York. Um, and I, I, I got a fairly decent set of images of um, uh, M81 um, and, and it, it, it turned out great. And I, I'll never forget when uh, Tegan, Tegan Grable, I don't know if you guys, you folks, I, I, some people know who Tegan is. He works for Explore. Um, he works for High Point Scientific. And, uh, oh, yeah, Tegan, um, yeah. but Tegan, Tegan's a great guy and a good friend. And uh, he was, he was on with me for several hours and we were, we were getting this and all of a sudden, you know, we, we pulled this image up and he just about lost it. He's like, I can't believe that's a five minute sub, you know, the dust oh. lanes that were in this, it was incredible. It was, it was truly a, uh, it was one of those ones where, you know, you get that first, that first exposure with a scope oh. and it just blows your mind. You're just getting a little so. photon density and just hitting it really hard with that yep. signal to noise with that 14 inch aperture is beautiful. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's going to be fun. Of, it's going to be out of yeah. control. Too bad, too bad the whole Virgo cluster is right behind Scott's house. So, I mean, <laughs> 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 no, just kidding. I'm kidding. Scott's got a good view uh, down there from what he, what he sees. So, yeah, Portal uh, 4 down here. Uh, yeah. So, so now, yeah, now, acceptable. Good. Yeah, That's well, good. now we move from it. hate. We, we, so every once in a while, we say we hate somebody on the show. And it happens to whoever has the lowest portal number. Now that Scott has the lowest portal number, not, not only do we hate him because of his telescope, we hate him because of his guys. <laughs> so, uh, it's okay. <laughs> He's just smearing me with that love. <laughs> yeah, I do that. But, but well, uh, Scott, any, anyway, you, go ahead. Yeah, Scott, Scott, you mentioned your background in professional photography. And I came off of a job having to shoot in a fairly dark theater. Um, so I actually look forward to maybe um, crawling into your mind a bit about some of the jobs that you've been on in terrestrial and people shooting. I could, I'm sure there may be some things for me to learn there. 
Yeah, so, you know, feel free to feel free to get my uh, my contact information from any of the guys that are there. Uh, I I I'm more than happy to share any of my contact information. Give me a call. That's not a problem at all. Please. All right, look forward to yeah. it. You you and it it if you don't have I don't know I don't know where all the connections are at there, but I can certainly get that. Dan's got my stuff. If you if you've got Dan's information, um, you know, you know, it, it's not a problem. You know, it's easy to to push that your way. All right, hey, excellent. Adrian, if you want to email me, whatever, go right ahead and I'll, I'll, I'll shoot stuff. an email. Yeah. Dude. Yep. But, but, easy. Yeah. So come on down and hang out with us over at Astro. We do shows on uh, on Wednesdays and Friday nights, Wednesdays at 9 Eastern and uh, Fridays at 8 Eastern. And plus we're, we're here for a half an hour or so every Tuesday night. So. So thank you, Scott, for having us on. We appreciate it. Oh, it's great. Um, oh, yeah. It's great. We'll it's great. see. You know, hopefully we see you next week and um, uh, we will uh, uh, learn more about Astroworld. You know, yeah, so. that, that, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. We are going to quickly transition to Maxi Filares. Uh, he's, he's got uh, more live views. And then uh, we'll be switching over to Adrian Bradley for some nightscapes. Maxi? Well, well here I'm, I'm here again. Uh, now I'm uh, sharing my screen. I'm pointing and taking pictures of a place, uh, but practically a galaxy is in the Centaurus constellation nearby the Omega Centauri cluster and Centaurus A. It is the NGC 4945 or C83 in the Caldwell uh, catalog. And here's a a soup of uh, three minutes uh, guiding and let me stretch the, the Instagram. Uh, and here we go. Wow. Oh, yeah. A couple weeks ago, this was a, a, an APOD from NASA. Of course, not, not the, this one, but <laughs> this is a. a a, a, a really good a galaxy that you have a lot of uh, clouds and dust to to get uh, too much info and if you take Hello. pictures of 30 seconds only you can uh, also get information here love those foreground stars it's really nice i love that rich star field mm -hmm. and, and also that up. Oh. Be behind this star there's a, a galaxy, uh, I think it's this one. Uh, no, sorry. It's a PGC, PGC. no, NGC 4945A is behind this star. But uh, in my field of view, to get center, I could not get this galaxy, uh, but it's a... Uh, a regular galaxy, small one, uh, brighting, but I was focusing in this place. So right now I'm almost 25 pictures of three minutes. Stands, uh, the GSP is passing by. Uh, so for now, this is what I'm taking now. Uh, now these are just the lights, right? You're not doing the live stacking? No, no, this is only lights. Uh, this is a single light of yeah. three minutes. So yeah. maybe you know I would, yeah. what, what one thing, uh, Max, that I've, I've learned is a good hybrid approach is you can do the live stacking, put in your master uh, darks, uh, flats and bias into the live stacking to get a preview. And then you mm -hmm. save the lights. Uh, it will save each light sub. And so that way, if there's a, you know, um, an asteroid or a satellite or something that comes through, um through the frame or an airplane uh you can always pick that out when you do your post processing afterwards but at least you have a preview of the stacked image yeah. that looks pretty darn good mm -hmm. um that's 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 a good approach it's we, getting, have a, we have a question yeah. what is the software you're using maxi right now i am ah. in my pc uh, using the blue stacks uh, this is a free uh, software that emulate the Android system of the cell phones. And I, uh, for example, uh, put my- Blue stacks, my, okay. Yeah, 
my Gmail uh, account to get the SCR uh, software. And well, uh, I connect to my Wi-Fi through my PC and connect the, the SCR Plus to my Wi-Fi. So in that case, I, I can be uh, online. But also I, I use my cell phone to be outside uh, uh, to do the, the polar alignment and the focus. Yeah, so, what I do, sorry, Maxi, just to add, um, and I'll be showing that later as well, is uh, the beautiful part of both Bluestacks that the Mac, Max is showing is anything that works on your Android, including Sky Safari, uh, Sky Safari Pro, you can run in that Bluestacks. Uh, yeah. and, and in fact, what Maxi is doing is really cool because the SI Air either runs on an Android phone or a tablet. Uh, but he's running it in an emulator on his PC. And that way you can be on the network, uh, on the internet, mm -hmm. uh, as he's doing now and sharing. And at the same time, access all the, uh, those, those apps. So ASI Pro what you, what is, is embedded in there, which is cool. It works the same way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's using Bluestacks to, to transfer the, uh, yeah, I, I, the network I transfer, with his ASI I transfer my, my PC, like a tablet or cell phone to use this app, uh, to get connected to the, to the software. What so I can do, what, there's another way of doing this as well, by the way. Um, if you have, uh, what I do also max, and I've done this recently is, uh, I have my tablet or my phone, uh, on, uh, ASI air pro running natively on the Android system. Mm -hmm. And then you can run, uh, 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 what do you call it? Team viewer. A team viewer, uh, yes. A team viewer. And then a, the advantage. A remote the, desktop. A remote desktop. And the advantage of that is you're now using the processing of the, of the device, mm -hmm. uh, locally. Uh, it depends, you know, you, you, you can do it either way. Depends on what you want to do. <laughs> yes. Right. I, uh, like that. I was. When it was the lunar eclipse in November, I was in the field, uh, almost 15 kilometers, and I was uh, using my cell phone through uh, in, in a software to to connect to my notebook to you and, and move my equipment here in, in my backyard. But I was uh, 15 kilometers from here, so it's really That's good. Awesome! That is cool. So well. Scott, hey, okay. let's continue. So let's transition Scott. over to Adrian. And uh, yes, Adrian, thank you for hanging in there with us. And um, yep. yep, well past my bedtime, but that's yes, okay it is. because um, <laughs> let's see, I'm going to go ahead and quickly share my screen. I'll go through a few images, and what I'm going to use is sort of the theme of my talk um, presentation will be these border zones and shooting in completely different ways and how if you are doing landscape astrophotography or nightscapes as i always call them um clouds don't have to dissuade you neither does the quality of the sky neither even does the sun coming up or going down so as always i usually end with a bird picture scott but look this at that time, that's incredible the uh, bald Beautiful. eagle in Detroit, Michigan, not far from where I am. Yeah. Here in the States, for those of you hanging on from other countries, um, the bald eagle is making a big comeback. And yep. it's easier and easier to see these majestic raptors. But uh, we they can fly. In Arkansas. It's great. Yeah. yeah. It, it, oh, they're the everywhere. Yeah. Yep. They're, so they're we'll beautiful. start with this picture here. Now we're looking at space and we're looking at me setting up an Explorer Scientific uh, PCM8 mount over here. It's my truck. And I'm shooting back at a sky that's clouded out, except here in the Northern Hemisphere, you can see the, uh, the plow, the big dipper, what we call it, the little plow, the little dipper. And yes, this is all cloud cover and all of this starlight comes through. This is with a uh, non-modified camera. So the full frame sensor is pulling in light. So this may not be something you might enter in some sort of contest or, or anything like that. But what this shows you is that starlight is brighter than we think. And that um, you could, there's actually a lot more up there when you put the camera to it 
the starlight still shows through. So if there's wispy clouds, you can still do um, nightscape um, astrophotography or nightscapes. Um, it's, it's amazing what the sensors can do nowadays, eh, Adrian? Yeah. And here's another. You get an idea of how dark a region is depending on what the starlight looks like as you're peeking through clouds. This is a Bortle 3 zone that's just getting away from, it's getting away from astronomical twilight. Um, there's a glow here that, these glows are from nearby cities. There's a glow here that could be Aurora, might not be. Um, compared to dark of night at a Bortel 3 zone and a no doubter, that's Aurora. But this was taken last year. I tried mm -hmm. to get it again this year. Um, these colors are a part of what I was seeing. And notice the color, the kind of the bluish grayish blue of the dark of night. You start getting this um, when you're in a Bortel 3 zone. Um, and yes, this print's available. I put the signature. I don't sign a lot of images. Um, I considered this image really beautiful. A lot of times I shoot for the astronomical value. This is one of those photos that I framed because I wanted the whole picture to be nice. But you can still, if you notice the uh, darkness here. Now, Milky Way photography, this is this would be um, this would be nautical twilight, and this is as the sun is rising. You can still get this is one of those shots where you can still get details depending on how dark it is. You can still get Milky Way detail, and it's a bit of a challenge because most Milky Way shooting happens just like this. This is your typical. You look for the core in the Northern Hemisphere. You look for the core. This is astronomical twilight, the very first vestiges of astronomical twilight. So notice there's a different lighter shade of blue that's in the sky because of the blue color already being scattered out. And um, what does that look like when you go all the way to Bortle 1? There's a little bit of blue in astronomical twilight as the sun's setting and the milky way is already this bright and detailed notice over here you start to get that grayish charcoal color at a border one site the darkness goes it's not bluish gray it's gray and i will show that um in a couple other pictures um let's look at moonrise which is similar to um say nautical twilight you can still get some milky way detail but as the moon rises off frame and you see the light coming up it gives this bluish look to the sky and it there's a moment in there that i've been attempting to capture with all these photos the moment where the starlight is still pr present but the sky's color has changed and as the moon rises, all of that starlight begins to wash out. The Milky Way goes away. Everything, anything that I'm picking up here, those things begin to wash out. You even got and, the sunrise uh, there, uh, you know, hitting the tops of those trees. That's amazing. That was actually moonrise. Oh, 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 impressive. Wow. Yeah, that was moonrise. So, That's a nice Christmas card. <laughs> yeah. Here's moonrise at a Bortle 1 site with the moon in the zodiacal light. This is, I guess, the first vestiges of astronomical twilight. And I took this photo to make it look oh, the way cool. that it looks to your eyes. You yeah. can't tell the sun's coming up here. You can see that this was, this was purposely done as a shorter exposure and a composite with the moon to show this is what that scene looks like. You really can't tell with the naked eye when you're in astronomical twilight. I thought you could, but looking back at some of the images, it's clear that you can't quite see it, but the camera can. Adrian, so it almost looks like a 
lunar zodiacal zodiacal night light. The it was. It, it, it absolutely was. was. The lo- the moon rose within the zodiacal light on wow. that last shot. That's a, that's awesome. Yeah, it was. That was one of the more awesome things I had seen. Here I'm back in Michigan, and we're transitioning from um, nautical to astronomical twilight, and clouds are coming. So this is a similar angle to where I had the Aurora earlier. And um, yeah, the, the best thing to see about this is kind of how the sky changes as it's getting dark. Nice last couple of, the yeah, last couple of images here. We'll, we'll let our eagle friend go. Let's look at this one. Um, full dark of night. Everyone's... Uh, pointing cameras and telescopes and more cameras at the sky. This is a 30 second image. The image that's in the back of me was a minute to contain most of this detail. And one thing I like to do with Milky Way photos is for little Easter eggs to be able to show up in them, like the cat's paw down here and the lobster. I've got a couple of cleaner versions of the image, but in Milky oh, Way photography, you can do a couple of things. You can smooth this out and you can put it in front of a beautiful foreground and, you know, create a an image, you know, a total image. This was more of a, I'm shooting at the Milky Way and that's what I'm going to do. And let's see what, you know, these were among the first shots I saw at a Border One site. You know, Adrian, go back, here. please, 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 Adrian, go back. <laughs> I just want to um, say we don't have much time. I'll oh, go back sorry. In a second. Okay. Yeah, I'll okay, go sorry. back in a second. Um, portal three, you begin to see the river, the Milky Way, and here come the clouds. This to me is still uh, well. This is where I was looking at this image here and barely seeing some of the night detail. Portal, portal three, portal two, and portal one. Um, naked eye. There isn't much. To me, there isn't as much difference to your eyes, but what the camera can get and how bright the uh, objects in space are, even if you're shooting wide angle, there is a pretty big difference. And nothing highlights that. This is taken with a Sony camera. This is, again, Bortle One. Look at all the detail that I'm able to get in a 30 second exposure, half sidereal on a tracker. Um, and there was some, there was a little bit, I think, of haze in the sky where I'm getting kind of brighter. Um, the stars here, the I'm, stars here are bright, but. And I'm making this, photo, Adrian. Yeah, this to me shows you what's capable in, you know, the darkest of skies. This is the sort of image without needing to get other special um, equipment. You just have your regular DSLR. And if as long as it's a nice fast lens at f2.8 or, you know, or faster, and you go for 30 seconds, um, I think I shot all the way up ISO 6400 with this. Actually, let's let's get the real let's get the real numbers. Love the star um, colors. You my ISO Castro. was 8,000, 25 seconds f2.8. This is this is these are numbers here, and that was the result. So. That is, that's where I was prepared to end the presentation. Um, Cameron, I think you wanted to go back to one of those images. Oh, yeah. No, just that one where you had the Milky Way. Uh, I wanted to highlight uh, uh, in the, there's three images that are really are, are amazing. Well, there's a lot, they're all amazing. But um, anyhow, we'll just Let's go to the, the so one, that one. That one with the Milky this Way. This image might... Yeah, nice yeah, this one was a little cleaner. I just shot, I did a panner, I stitched together um, four shots. When you zoom right in right at the Milky Way, when you zoom in on the horizon, that, that's what blows me away. Look at that. Yeah. I mean, you go right to the, you can see the stars and the Milky Way and the structure, you know, as if the Earth is just in the way. <laughs> you yep. know, we're, we're going through space, we're all that stuff it. is there, and you're seeing it. This is nice something clean. I'm sure. That's amazing. I'm sure this is this is this got an NGC number. You know, mm. this is the cat's paw on the lobster. 
which are two things I normally don't see. This has probably got a, these things have probably got designations to them. You know, this reminds you, this image here may remind you of a lot of the deep sky images that you see where you see detail, the wispy detail in the dust lanes of nebula, emission nebula. This is the, this is the galactic core right here. The lagoon gets in the way. I never forget yeah. when I when I first learned that the Milky There's Way was our galaxy, <laughs> you know, and 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 you're actually yeah, that's looking, a shock to some people. Actually. It's, it's, it's go, real. Oh, wait a minute, you're we're I in mean, a galaxy, yeah. you know, and you can see it, you know. So and you can <laughs> see it. You can <laughs> see right to and, the core of it. And, right. and, and when is. I when I got to that knowledge in you know when when as a kid of course you're looking at pictures of galaxies and, and that when you're first starting out and then and then you realize whoa we're right in one of those yeah and you're, you're seeing it real you're close seeing up. It really close up and it's like that is so cool i yeah. love it love it yeah yeah the star cloud was around here somewhere sagittarius star cloud m17 i believe m16 you know the the yeah. precision starts to go away a little bit so i continue to work on you know getting rounder stars in different parts that's the top of the image that i Beautiful. took and and that's to me there's i shoot the images partly for scientific value or you know citizen science value or just discovery it, here's something here it, to me when i shot this and i looked down and i saw that you know i realized okay saw this too because of the process that i use to make sure that the stars are sharp it pulls out things that i may not expect to see that um that just it just enhances learning about what it is and it's like when you shoot for me shooting the night sky it's not just about um you know just uh i'm shooting at something it looks beautiful it's a great start to go there but learning about the subject learning about i mean there's more nebulosity here and dust lanes here that can be learned about there's the self-same image that you take could be an image that teaches you more about what's there you may capture enough data to be able to look into it and go okay what does this real we all know an m17 m16 when you aim closer we know what those how beautiful those really are it doesn't translate as much in this image except to say it's here and the light from it shines as brightly as the rest of this light that I've captured. Well, and, it's, it's, um, it's like you said, Adrian, it's like two levels of beauty. One, one is it's the beauty of the, the, the whole picture. It's like kind of looking at a satellite image of, of the planet Earth. And then you see the beauty of our planet. And then, and then you start orientating yourself and then relating yourself where, you know, different parts of the planet. When you zoom in, and you, oh yeah, this is that country, and there's no borders, but you can see the cities, you can see the rivers, yeah. and the mountains, and, and the clouds and stuff. It that gives you a new it's level of connection, and and you you can really see, start to see your your place in the universe, uh, and it, it, that familiarity yet the vastness. It, it's it's looking at both the big big picture and also, you know, your relation to it. It's it's fascinating. All right, there's an object there that I need to look yeah, up but... and it sits here. Um, <laughs> yeah. And and since we're low on time, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and shut down the image. But um, but yeah, that's whenever going out, there's a number of things Now the image behind me. You're seeing some of the same detail, but it took a minute in a Bortle 2 zone to get kind of that level of detail. It takes 30 seconds to get there, Bortle one. So, so the bottom is line is no matter what Bortle zone you're in, the lighter the Bortle zone, the more time it takes 
to start to see some of the structures that you're looking at and visually um you know visually it's all appealing the brighter things you'll see you'll see more detail in those brighter things if you're able to make the trek down to some place that has a darker border zone and i highly recommend it um if you are able to travel if not um you can live vicariously through us because my my goal is also to do some more traveling um this year and get down and get a few more images and come up with a few more goals to uh see what sort of things i can come that i can create out there well you know and that's the thing adrian there's different apertures different sizes of telescopes different sizes of lenses our own naked eye binoculars at every level of magnification you're able to see similar objects like for example uh, you know the virgo cluster looks looks like a uh, deep field uh, in a 4 inch let's say right um you know uh, and and then but if you want to see stephen's quintet you know you need an 18 inch or you know like a 16 inch so you but you can see uh, a lot of those details at every level depending on their brightness and you're taking the wide field and look at all the detail you can pick out as you start zooming in right uh it's, it's exactly it's beautiful all right guys we need to uh trans transition over to uh to nico maxi i'm gonna let you introduce uh, uh nico thank you adrian thank you excellent adrian oh. you're <laughs> well, welcome now i introduce my my dear friend uh, that he was he wasn't here a couple weeks with us but tonight is going to show us a lot of things that that he's been doing so nico it's all yours hey nico all right hey thank you maxi hey scott cameron hello again. it's good to How see you again you? nico yes it's, it's really nice to be here again uh, there was a, a few weeks off because an, another compromises but i'm really happy to be here well, you, you are a musician and um, yeah, uh, I, you're, you're with a new band, I think. Is that right? No, it's the same band. Uh, I, I, I play drums and mm -hmm. this, uh, this month uh, we are making our practice on Tuesdays and sometimes the, it, 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 uh, it comes late and I, I need to go to bed. <laughs> Yeah, of course. But okay, the, to, tonight I, I'm here. I'm with a little flu, a little sick, but everything is okay. And um, I want to to show you uh, a few things that I was uh, making these days. Let me share my screen. Okay, are you seeing this? Yes. Okay, uh, well, yeah. as, as you know, uh, I, I have a, an equipment uh, with, uh, with an equatorial mount, but uh, I really enjoy and really love uh, to, to use my dots and not just for observing, uh, but uh, to doing some double stars, some uh, quick photograph. And in this new chapter of Dobsonian Love, as I call it, uh, this uh, weeks ago, I was thinking That's and trying picture. to to get okay. Can we do asteroids astrometry and photography and photometry uh, with a a standard Dobsonian with no tracking and no motors? And uh, I found that it's gonna take uh, a lot of work, but yes, we can do it, and I will show you. And we need to, to sort a few more steps, like compensate the, the short exposures because we are working with adoption and with no motors, and uh, you cannot uh, expose more than maybe half a second or less. Uh, and uh, as the objects are moving, you need to be sure about the, the field of view, the asteroid or any object that you are chasing. Uh, you need to be quick because the objects move away uh, and uh, this is really important that you need to, uh, to to find a way to know the 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 position angle of the camera 
at, the, at uh, every second because uh, the, the dog sonia works in altazimutal mount so the north is never in the same place you wait a minute and the camera is not pointing the north no more you need to choose the magnitude that uh, you you can use uh, and that is uh, about the the aperture of the Dobsonian, this is a 10 inch dub. Uh, the, the big aperture helps with the magnitude. And as always, the more important is to enjoy, to persevere, and never be disappointed if you can get the result uh, weekly. And the, the first thing uh, is always a planning. I was uh, finding with Carte Social a few asteroids and magnitude uh, between 12 and 30 uh, to, uh, to, to be uh, no, uh, I, I think a tiny bright uh, asteroid to, to make it easier. And uh, I, I do a several shots, uh, shot, uh, test shots, uh, trying different configurations. And uh, I found that sometimes uh, the, the live stack in Sharkup uh, works really great. Uh, at this capture, I was uh, shooting a 21 gain and only uh, 150 mile seconds exposure. And I was uh, doing a live stack by uh, about seven or eight seconds. And uh, with this configuration, I get an amazing result. Uh, I have a, a good signal, good arrows, and the magnitude was precisely the magnitude I was expecting. Uh, but uh, this method, not it doesn't work uh, every night and in every asteroid because you need uh, the shark cap uh, needs to the live stack uh, a lot of stars to do the alignment of the images uh, because when you look in the top zone you see the stars moving and uh, the live stack needs at least eight stars in the field to do alignment. But if you try different nights and different asteroids, you can find one to, to work with. Uh, so that night I took these three images with a, a the, the, the first two is was a two minute difference and the the third one I wait uh, more like 20 minutes or something like that and uh, uh, I, I was uh, using the, the maxim DL because I for astrometrica to do the the astrometries you need to 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 put the the exactly coordinated and the position angle of the camera and that was i was talking before but the maxim dl if you put an um, approximate uh, coordinated it was it start testing different coordinates and position angles and you can know at the end of this process the exactly uh, location in the of the center of the image and the position angle of the camera and this is the secret to uh, great work with the astrometrica so we go to astrometrica and put these parameters and there you go i was working and i can do the the successful the astrometry of the asteroid. This is the 702. Uh, and I have the, a good photometry with a good uh, uh, the, the expected uh, magnitude and the, the positions as well. As you can see, this is the, the positions that the MPC was uh, waiting in the, sorry, in the, um, ephemeria and i have uh, a little bit difference but uh, this is more than i expected you can see this is my measured and this is the ephemeria of the mpc web page so there you go you can do even uh, an astrometry of an asteroid using your dots on 
and this is really really great i really enjoy to to work with with my dogs and and, and every time i am trying to make okay what else i can do is is really is really fun and as a bonus track uh, a few weeks ago i could able to observe my second quasar uh, and in this time is the HA 1029 is This is from my house with a bottle line sky. And this is a sketch I, I make uh, while I was observing this little point marked there is, the, is this quasar. And this is the information of the quasar. You, you can see it's really far away from us uh, I really enjoy to to chase the, the, this kind of object uh, and, and think how far uh, how far away I, we can not not just uh, take a picture uh, but observe it uh, with my eyes piece uh, it's, it's really nice to, to see what that little dot in the eyepiece is this monster and near the, the start of the universe is, is amazing. And obviously, I put my camera in the adoption and I get this picture. And I, I do the same process that with the asteroid to get the, the coordinates and the magnitude of the, of the quasar. Just uh, to, to make it not, 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 it's not information that you can publish anywhere, but it's really nice that you can do a lot of different things, even with your Dobson in your house, in bottom line sky. And yes, the, 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 the sky. Yeah, no excuses, guys. <laughs> no, there exactly. is no excuse. You can do everything you, you want. Uh, to, just need to, to start to, to sitting and planning and look how to make it, but uh, you can. That's uh, awesome, Nico. I, I, that's how it's from, uh, that's how it starts. Yeah. A that's comment this. from the chat. Uh, this is Barbara it comes from Barbara Harris. Uh, she she is uh, she does uh, research work and um, has discovered a supernova, and she's mentioning that she's very impressed with what you do. So oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. So this was my my little presentation for tonight, and I I hope you enjoy it. Great. That's awesome, wonderful. Nico. Thank you. Okay. Hey Nico, excelente. <laughs> excelente. Thank you. <laughs> so Maxi, you want to do one more transition and then we'll go uh, to Cameron Gillis. Yes, yes. I now point my scope to a particular area. I think maybe in the northern hemisphere you're able to watch it, but it's a, a, a tremendous area. And Nico, I think you're going to like it. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, let's oops, reset this. Okay. Uh, compartir pantalla. Okay. Now here we go again. Right now I'm practically uh, in the in the Milky Way, so I put pointed to. The dragons of Ara. Uh, oh, that nebula is amazing. No way. You can get a picture of that. I want to see it. <laughs> yeah. And I did a single picture of uh, 300 seconds. Okay. Well, that's a nice is, uh, curve. This is the, 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 what I get, but let, let's bring get the black on. <laughs> yeah. Let's stretch it out. Wow. And here we go. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a you know, I just call it nebula. I mean, whenever I see this stuff like Jason Gonzalez type of stuff, which is of course over the top, right? I mean, uh, but but the fact that you can capture this, you know, this is just like what Nico did, just casually like this. This is a very faint object, mm -hmm. um, and and be able to see some structure in it. That's awesome. This is a, only a single so. How, 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 300 seconds. So that's five minutes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but the, I think the, 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 the guiding was really good. 
you can and see you don't the, have an nebula filter I mean, no narrow band filter this is just you know light white white band no no the, no nothing the the comma corrector only and that's wow. all <laughs> yeah nice uh, so i think i'm going to still taking pictures from here yeah to, to the rest of the night i think yeah yeah, yeah. you just hours. you just hit yeah. that in a couple hours and boy you're gonna get some good stuff yeah look at that you're seeing you're seeing the nebulosity come out eek out there and just give it a little more signal to noise stack mm -hmm. it out and you'll you'll have something nice <laughs> so wow. well to for those who wants to see is this place oh wow exactly yes. you can yeah, see the intricate. of course it doesn't fit all the nebula but uh, because of my field of view well that's but, why you need a whole bunch of more scopes right maxi <laughs> yeah i need a, <laughs> an 80 millimeters apochromatic isn't that interesting <laughs> yes this is the I, this is the interesting. I find myself wanting smaller and smaller telescopes now, <laughs> because uh, but but of course the trade off is is uh, you you have to hit it with longer exposure. So that's that's the tricky and dark skies. You can't replace dark skies. But you saw, you know, you can get a supernova fifteenth magnitude with a two inch, right? Yeah. Uh, it, this, that, that's part of the fun. Beautiful. I think I'm the only one that I want a bigger scope. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, the more uh, you observe, uh, a more bigger aperture I want. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, yeah, you want both because you want, you know, we, we all love nebulas, we all love galaxies, and that's two different types of scopes right off the bat, right? You, you, yeah, you, sure. you, you want to dive right in to the, to the uh, galaxy, you've you got to have the long focal length, big aperture. And if you want, uh, that's going to get you all the good juicy dust lanes and all that stuff. Uh, and if you want the big nebula, well, you're going to have to go wide field. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And then there's planetary nebula. That's a, it's an old class. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I make the, the uh, planetary nebula Ghost of Jupiter a few weeks ago with the dolphin. Uh, it's beautiful. You know, yeah, Nico, I mean, Max, uh, Maxi, I mean, that that casual picture that you took of Tarantula Nebula, Nebula that actually surprised me. Uh, that was much better than I, I thought. Uh, in, in such, it was not in a favorable position for you. It was low on the horizon. You had some obstruction, close to obstruction, and you were able to get some pretty good structure. That was, that's amazing. And think about it. That, that thing, that galaxy, or sorry, that nebula is in another galaxy. It's in, it's in the large Magellanic cloud. It's like, mm -hmm. wow. I mean... Uh, yeah. It's a huge, monstrous it's, nebula. It's another neighbor. <laughs> yeah, it's a big. Yeah. Well, the uh, camera, uh, it's all yours. So all right. Can... Well, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, I'm a late night with Cameron Camstronomy here. Uh, sorry for keeping you up. Uh, you can all watch the replay, but uh, I have a lot of things that I want to try to cover in a reasonable amount of time. I don't want to tire everyone out but I have several different things. I have been doing a lot of things. It's been very rainy in Seattle for the last four months, um, but I haven't lost any time in uh, perfecting and learning and uh, making the most of every single clear night that I, I do get up in the Pacific Northwest uh, to continue my sky survey. So uh, let me share my screen here, yeah, my whole screen, yeah. Okay, and I just, uh, there we go. So this is uh, Cam Strani Sky Survey update uh, in Global Star Party 89. So to pick up where we left off last year uh, in my uh, thing, I just wanted to kind of level set with, whoops, sorry, level set every with everyone. Oh, darn, sorry about that. Got a little ahead of myself there. Um, I have done, I started off with visual observations and I've done a lot of them, with, I, uh, mainly with my eight inch uh, uh, schmidt green. So over 3000 observations down to magnitude uh, 12 to 13 magnitude galaxies and, and uh, objects. And to kind of kind of categorize them to see, are they, you know, which are the ones that are cool that I want to you know, do some more investigation on. So it was kind of like a uh, my own sky, uh, personal sky survey 
Uh, and this was all made possible because of go-to technology. I mean, uh, you know, I, I was already in my earlier uh, career or earlier hobby of astronomy. I had an 18-inch dub. I, I knew the sky really well, doing a lot of scar hopping, uh, galaxy hopping for that matter, uh, you know, 15th magnitude galaxies and stuff like that. But there's no substitute, especially when you have limited um, sky time, uh, than to have, uh, you know, equipment that allows you to really focus on the viewing visual aspects uh, and still, uh, you know, get a lot of detail, track the stars, and, uh, and, 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 and do proper logging. Uh, so anyhow, I, I, I went through all that and this was before I got into imaging. And then I, uh, uh, then I categorized those and I, I out of those 3000 objects, um, I, I got 842 now. I, I finished Eridanus. Uh, I got a one clear night where I, where I was, there was a bunch of galaxies that I picked up uh, to finish my kind of my full, um, sky survey and that got me up to 842 objects and I started to uh, saying okay those are the ones I'm going to do for um, doing my astrocam sur survey and last year if you recall I, I did a I started a, a with thanks to Scott and and this uh, great um, audience here uh, you helped encourage me and I was able to uh, have a sky survey uh, episode called Camp Astronomy. I did 20 episodes where we went through, and uh, this is a snapshot, and I'll go to my, my uh, sky safari here. And th this is actually the, uh, the objects that we actually looked through together, uh, moving from uh, Eastern Virgo uh, to, uh, to all the way to, um, uh, to Andromeda and Pegasus. That's where we ended up basically at zero mm -hmm. hour. So if I look at uh, kind of how I, I did the procession, and you can see most of it, I, I did cover the summer Milky Way uh, extensively. And if I look at the uh, go by hour by hour, so this is the meridian. Now I have an equatorial mount. So I have, uh, I'm using the meridian line here instead of the um, uh, alt azimuth view. And if I just continue go through the hours, you can see I was basically going from uh, west to east uh, and I would basically go through, and that's how I did my survey, uh, all up and down until finally we ended up, and that was where I ended uh, for that. And then what happened, of course, uh, I, I, you know, got really busy with work and, and other things, the personal stuff, and I, I just couldn't uh, do that, but I, I didn't stop. And plus it got rainy. It was starting to get to fall. It was around October time frame, and, um, and then I... Uh, basically said, well, time to basically uh, get serious about automating this and upgrading my imaging gear. Because I started off with smartphone. A lot of the objects, the earlier ones were smartphone photography, which is great. Uh, but then you start realizing, well, I want to be able to repeat and have a standard setup. I don't want to have to play around with the uh, focus and all that every time. I like what Maxi did. You, you kind of modified it. A, a, a smartphone and but you got to be able to set it up and then also I was switching my my scope between visual and uh, uh, imaging and I realized you don't want to play with that because of you know getting standard flats and there's a lot of things but basically I started to work on perfecting my rig my imaging system so if I go back to the presentation so now I've been basically working on a dual imaging rig because I had my C8. That was my primary visual instrument. And then I changed that to, so it's the wrong way to start for imaging. But, you know, I, I just dove in and, uh, you know, learned about high, long focal length. You need to have a good uh, equatorial mount. You need to have uh, some form of, um, of uh, guiding so that you can, uh, you know, compensate for uh, the gear um, periodic error. All that kind of detail, and uh, but then I also w had an ED80 um, that was uh, on order that I finally got, and I was basically setting it up because I wanted to piggyback the uh, the ED80 and have a dual imaging rig, rig so I can do both uh, long focal length and short focal length of the same region of the sky simultaneously, um, and so that's basically was my goal 
and then I could start building my catalog based on that. Uh, so be, this is what I was doing last year, uh, where a lot of these images, uh, you know, familiar objects, these are the pictures that I, I did last year. And I was able to do this uh, with this imaging rig on, on the right uh, using a guide scope. Um, and all these images were not processed in any way except uh, using ASI Air live stacking and, and just taking a screenshot on my tablet, frankly. So it, ironically, a lot of the smoothness that you're seeing, uh, you know, and also the, uh, the, the reasonable quality uh, was obtained accidentally uh, because of you know, the binning, the resolution on the tablet is uh, a lot less than, uh, uh, so I didn't realize it at the time, but I do now that I'm basically getting built in binning. So I was essentially uh, by, bypassing a lot of post-processing and that, but the, the negative part is you don't have the raw image. Uh, I wasn't saving the, the FITS files and, uh, and I wasn't able to improve the image and stack it, etc. But this was fine for the time. It's all part of the learning process. But to be you know, able to do this- You got a lot this, of great shots anyways, you know? Yeah, but I got a lot of great, and that's the whole point. And that's, that's, that's the thing, Scott, is it's about the journey. And, and this, the smartphone pictures that I took helped motivate me to say, okay, I need to get an imaging camera because you know, now I can do reliable pictures, right? Uh, every time I can have my rig set up. And then, and like you said, then I, but you still get good pictures. So it's like, ooh, it gets better. Then you start to do this and it's like, okay, ASI Air, that solves a lot of the, um, uh, you know, a lot of the figuring out of, of all the different systems. Um, ironically, now that I've done, done the ASI Air, and I'll get to that, I am actually going to go probably to Nina because um, hmm. uh, the, uh, the, I, I'm actually with a dual scope setup, you can plug in uh, the multiple cameras to the USB hub. One will be on USB 2, the other, the main camera can be on USB 3. So there's gonna be a little slower download, not too badly though, uh, but you can only switch to one camera at a time. Now, what a lot of people do is they get multiple ASI airs, but the problem is if you have a piggyback system is uh, if you're dithering or anything, you can't synchronize. Anyhow, there's a lot of details. And I, I, I would love, there's many, many shows that are required to cover all this, but I, just to give you a flavor, uh, what I've discovered is what I'm doing now, and we'll get into this, is I'm, let's go to the next slide actually. Uh, I went through many iterations. So first of all, this is the rig that I started with last year with, the, with just the basic uh, uh, tracking, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, guide scope. That was just the one, camera system with the ASI Air. So that allowed me to do those pictures on the last page. Then I got my rings and I was using my Mac 102 as a proxy until I finally get my ED80. Cause ultimately, like I said, I wanna have my ED80, which I ended up doing as you can see on the right here. Uh, I, I ended up putting the ED80 in there. Um, and then I, what happened is I wanted to test out the visual of piggybacking the ED80 on my X, uh, on my C8. And then I started wanting to get the sky survey automatic uh, sky survey. Uh, so you can actually set up plans in ASI air where you can, uh, where you can set up an imaging sequence and it will automatically plate solve, go to the next object, do as many uh, lights as you want, darks, flats, uh, not flats, but you know, darks, and then you can actually go um, to the next object and you'll actually save that image sequence and you can repeatedly run that over multiple nights and then you know, gradually build your database of lights. So I was using this intermediate Mac 102 and a guide scope uh, system to kind of uh, play with that uh, as an intermediate step. Then I got me ED80. I, I said, okay, well, let me try that. So as you can see, you start, with a lot of cloudy nights, uh, you, you play around with your gear to make sure that when you are imaging, you, you get, you know, make the most of it, you, you learn something every time. So after all that, and 
all this requires, you know, cabling, balance, uh, you know, you know, new flats, all sorts of stuff. That, you know, uh, looking at the different image scales. Uh, there's so many things that you learn. So I had enough toys, but ultimately I ended up with this thing on the right. This was my prototype. <laughs> but what happened is uh, this is the heaviest that it all got. So this, this, uh, all the stuff, including the the dew shield, dew shields, and the imaging gear, and an extra guide scope on top of it, all to boot. Uh, all this stuff weighs uh, 25 pounds. Okay, which is uh, pretty much uh, working really well, actually, with the Exos 2. Um, you can see the counterweights are almost fully extended. Uh, it handles it quite nicely, and and uh, all the stars are beautifully round and uh, it's a good system but i didn't the problem is this having this uh, guide scope offset really screws up the um the uh, declination uh, balance it throws it off because it's it's off centered so i ended up uh, let me before i go there i ended up uh, getting rid of that and going with an off off axis guider and i'll explain that but what i also want to say on this is i was on the asi with multiple cameras, you can only do one or the other. So what I did is I plugged in the 294, which is on my ED80, to my laptop uh, here with a team viewer and ASI Studio and eventually Nina. And that's kind of my prototype because what you can do with Nina and even for ASI Studio for that matter, you can have multiple instances um, running uh, so you can have multiple cameras on different USB ports and you can synchronize the dithering uh, of, of those. And I, I went for dithering and, I was, you know, was that, that's good. But with a two imaging system, the only way to do it effectively is to use, uh, to use Nina. Um, and so, so I'm going to get there. But for now, as it stands today, I have my... ASI Air controlling my 183 cooled camera on my C8. And I have a, a laptop with, uh, with ASI Studio and, and Nina running on this. And that way, when I'm, when I'm slewing and when I'm taking images automatically with my main camera, which is doing the main plate solve, uh, I can just real time play around with my wide field camera to see what's going on. And then also uh, have fun taking uh, extra images in between uh, the main imaging scope. And I'll explain that when we do our, our little survey at the end. Um, and, and then I have, uh, uh, I, was, I was saying, so I'm using a Wi-Fi router as well to help boost the ASI uh, Pro and that, that, that's giving me longer range so I can be inside the house. And then I have a tablet with ASI Air Pro and uh, we're also, I'm also, the SIR Pro is controlling, I have a new um, electronic focuser. Uh, that's another thing I learned, is focusing, focusing, focusing. It's the most important thing because you can't even do polar alignment if you don't have focus. <laughs> so, uh, you, and you can't plate solve unless you have focus. So that I've spent sometimes uh, too long um, trying to focus. And uh, finally I got, pretty good and you don't want to touch the focus. You're always going to have to do a little bit of tweaking based on temperature, but having a, a, an electronic uh, automatic focuser is extremely, extremely useful. Uh, that's for my main scope. And I'm using a Batonoff mask that I just got for my, uh, my ED80. That's how, that's how I'm going to focus my uh, ED80. Um, so this is my new rig. It hasn't been, uh, Field, fully field tested, but I am really confident that I'm gonna get a really nice setup. I got my focuser, got my 183 going to the ASI. Um, I have I, cool. an OAG field flattener. Uh, and, and here's the cool part about this one. What I learned is I was playing, I spent, it must have been three nights, three different nights uh, when it was cloudy, of course, uh, partially cloudy. So I was just taking advantage of those being able to look at stars, um, to, to use the OAG on the long focal length versus short focal length and all that, boy, it's not so easy. But what I've learned is that I think 
I think I found the right solution for anyone who's out there who wants to use OAGs. You want to use off-axis guiders on wide field scopes only because, uh, but you don't want to go, um, because what you can do is you can put it off. You can put the uh, pickoff prism off the sensor, the edge, and it's wide enough field and it's large enough, uh, you know, uh, view that you're going to be able to pick up a, uh, a star, even in a low, uh, you know, a, a low uh, star field area, like, you know, in galaxy area. Um, with my C8, even though it has larger aperture, it has a heck of a time with the off-axis guider. Too limited the field of view, not enough bright stars. Um, and I can, here's the other bon bonus on this one. I originally had the, uh, the guide camera on a guide scope that was 242 millimeters. Well, the rule of thumb is you should be at least, you know, one fifth to, you know, one quarter of the focal length of your main scope uh, for, because otherwise you're gonna to start to see a little bit of oval. You're not gonna be able to compensate with the mount uh, adjustments fast enough to compensate for, uh, for your uh, guiding, your, your periodic error. So this is nice because it's 480 millimeter focal length, which is one third, because uh, I have a, a, an F6 redu a reducer on the C8. So that's around 1300 millimeters, 1280. Um, and so basically uh, that gives me really good focal length for my guide. Gives me good aperture as well, because an 80 millimeter, even though you're using a pickoff prism, is gonna give me much more light. Uh, plus I can, uh, plus I also have a wider field of view. So I think this is, this is gonna be the one, I think I finally got my system. Uh, and it also helps with the counterweight. You don't have any weird offset. Um, so, so that's what I'm going with right now. And, um, and I have all the different back focuses. And I just wanted to show you guys this picture again, where you can nicely see the sensor. This is a 283 uh, uh, sensor uh, in, a, in, in EDA's 80 folk. And you can see the image circle is just before it clips the corner. So that's nice. And then your pickoff uh, prism is nice and clear and it's uh, perpendicular to the axis so that when you're adjusting for periodic error, you're in line. So I had to make sure this is rotated the right way. There's a lot of details. And then of course, when you do all this, you're adjusting the balance, you're looking where the cables are. There's a lot of things that I've been learning uh, and you can do all this on a, you know, in the daytime. <laughs> um, so, um, so then, then I You're gonna just have wanna... to write a book here. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's where so. I'm gonna I'm gonna get to that. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but no, thanks, uh, thanks, Scott. No, that's that's exactly right. I mean, this is my this is my uh, condensed version, uh, <laughs> Scott. Because uh, so I I hope you guys don't mind that we're, we're I, I'm just uh, no, indulging great. a little bit. And then um, I wanted to also demonstrate that this stuff is not easy if you try to take it all in at once, it's impossible. You have to do it in increments. That's the reason why you wanna start off with smartphone. You start with a small scope, get the cheap stuff. You know, it's not even cheap, it's all good stuff now. Uh, you know, it all works. Uh, you just, you gain the knowledge. And then you also realize, ah, that's why you wanna spend the money on this thing. And ah, this is why, so you don't wanna, it's like anything. I'm, I'm all, as an engineer, you want to look at the system as a balanced system. So when you increment something, you don't want to have like something like super awesome and then everything else. Like it's like getting a really awesome scope and then a crappy mount. You know what I mean? You, you want it or, or under, under mounted. It could be a good mount, but it's, it's, it's overweight. And, and so you try to optimize this gradually, use what you have, and then you start building and building. And then finally, I feel that what I've learned is, you know, I was originally thinking, ah, oh, I'm gonna switch my scopes and go between visual and imaging, forget it. I, 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 these guys, this is it, what you see. That's why I got the automatic focuser. I'm like, this is it, it's gonna be an imaging system now. Uh, I'm, I have my four inch Mac as a visual. I have, uh, you know, I'm probably gonna get a, another daub in the future uh, for my visual, a 10 inch daub or something like that. Uh, so we can have fun with that. But um, but I can 
tell you that, uh, so visual is still there. I love visual, but when you're doing imaging, like I said, it, the few cloudy, the clear nights that you get in, in the Pacific Northwest or anywhere, you capture those images and you have fun with analyzing them later. It's, it's really nice. So, um, so I wanted to show you this uh, autofocusing and also this gives you an idea of my scene condition. So here is uh, on my C8, uh, I, I, by the way, I'm using binning on the 183 because uh, it, it's, it, it, it's pointless uh, going with high resolution uh, native two point something micron because uh, the image scale is like half an arc second. And, and it's like my seeing, as you can see, 5.21 arc second. I mean, it's, it's really bad. Uh, <laughs> so, but this is showing you how the autofocuser works and it's really nice. So I don't have to fiddle around with it, it goes back and forth. It finds the, finds the V curve and it gets to the best. And the best in this case on that night was 5.21. Um, I know better, I've gotten down to 2.7 on other nights manually when it was more stable air. Uh, but this is an example. So you don't have to worry it here. And you know you're getting the best for the night and then and then it can adjust in the future. Then the other thing I thought is I had a beautiful night. I was like, oh, I'm going to have a great time of in imaging. And then uh, all of a sudden, within an hour, I'm not kidding, my corrector plate, even with the dew shield uh, on the C on the on the ED80 and uh, the big dew shield on my C8, it was all fogged up. It was like, whoa. And it was like, yeah. that's it. I have to get do heaters, forget it. So well, I ended up- That's the end get... of your observing session, you know, your that's, imaging session. It, it, totally. Well, it's, it's there, but it's it's kind of like, yeah, it teases you, right? Because you have this, you see the details in the galaxy, you see the stuff, but it's all mushy on the on the outside and it's terrible. <laughs> and I'll, I'll show you a picture. Uh, it, there's one of them coming up, but you're right. It, it kind of ruins it. And then you, you just don't want to leave stuff out in that condition. So it's like, okay, time to take it in, hair dryer. And uh, that's that's the end of it. Uh, I This is the book. Uh, so I want, I, this is my cheat sheet. Uh, this is just, I don't want to make everyone tired, but basically I do want to, this is, I do want to cover some of the stuff like, you know, the rig config. You know, I talked about the dual imaging system, right? We have, uh, I learned about OAG, uh, tandem piggybacking, um, cool camera, you know, that's really important. Equatorial mount, how to have one. Um, ASI Air Pro, great help uh, crutch to start you out. Um, at, and, with a, and then at PC with, uh, with ASI Studio, which is off the shelf free, comes with the camera. You can have multiple instances. Nina allows me to eventually, I'm going to probably put everything over to uh, to PC in, in the future and go back to ASCOM because uh, it's a lot more complicated, but you have total customization, total control. Um, you, you know, it's, uh, but but everything has its place. ASI Air Pro, love it, it's great. But I think uh, where I'm going with the dual imaging system, I'm gonna probably go all uh, all uh, like open, open source stuff. Um, and then, uh, then you learn about cable management, you, USB, power, Ethernet, you know, all that changes weight, uh, you know, do I put the ASI air on the, on the dovetail of my C8, or do I stick it on the, the leg, you know, and then run a couple of the power and the signaling, you know, every time you play around with the combination, you, you, you have to decide where the cables are going to go. Uh, back focus. You know, um, I learned about off-axis guider, not an easy thing to deal with, but when you figure it out, it's awesome. Um, because you focus that, then you're, you're, you're automatically focused in both the main image and also that um, image scale. You know, you learn about framing, uh, gas scope, uh, I've already talked about that, auto-focusing, douche shields, uh, workflow, image processing, that's a whole new thing. As you saw, I was kind of cheating uh, last year with those images, they're good, uh, but the, basically there's literally screenshots of stacked images that were done in ASI uh, Air uh, Pro. Now you start to get serious, you want to start to get better images, and you start to want to build database, especially with the sky survey, um, where initially it's EAA, but if you play your cards right, as you can see, uh, what I end up doing is, hey, maybe I take 
I don't know, three, five minutes exposures per object, do my full survey on one night. And maybe a year from now, uh, I, I do another set and eventually you build, uh, you know, and this is what people do, uh, you know, even with the, you just start taking your different um, lights, you start light layering them and then you start building better and better images uh, with more detail based on uh, consistent data. Um, I'm learning, you know I, know, I know the benefits of dithering. I had some experiments with that, but as I was mentioning before, I'm having issues with my synchronizing that right now. So I'm sticking with no dithering uh, for the images that we're doing so far. Binning, I learned about that. It's very good with a 183 on a, on a long focal length. Uh, it gives you some extra well depth. Um, and uh, I also learned filters. I am a galaxy guy uh, for the most part. Um, all my, most of my images are galaxies. Uh, so filters are great, um, but uh, they are pretty much restricted to nebula. And uh, so, you know, the good for the city, but I want to do wideband and, and get the whole galaxy. So that's, that's kind of something I've learned. And I've made a conscious choice that I still have a filter drawer on my wide field scope for Nebula, um, but, but it's empty right now uh, as I'm in galaxy season. Um, sensor cleaning, ah, of course, when you're playing around with all this stuff, as you can see, ah, it's like one day is like, what happened to my flat? It looks terrible. I have all these dots all over the place, small dots, big dots, donuts. I was freaking out. I was like, oh no. But then I learned, I did, did some research. Uh, there are special swabs out there that are used primarily for cameras, um, digital cameras. And they're nice, they're, you can get different sizes and you use a cleaning solution and there's instructions. And I actually took apart my two, uh, 183 camera and I actually cleaned it very carefully and got rid of those. And I was like, ah, oh, phew, that, that was a, a scary, a scary situation, but, but I learned about that. So it's not the end of the world uh, because you can, you could, the flats will take it out, but it will help. It will help uh, improve the dynamic range and cause these issues uh, when you're, when you're doing it down the road. So that was something um, imaging, like I already mentioned, uh, makes the cloudy nights go by. Uh, I, I, was, I had a lot of fun with my, my rigs, uh, getting it ready, looking forward to the next clear night. Um, uh, what else? I talked about image, imaging plans. So Mina allows you to you know, create imaging plans. ASI Air Pro also does. And I, that's another, each one of these things I'm talking about is an episode. <laughs> um, and and right. uh, eventually, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I, by the way, I have been watching a lot of these and I've been doing a lot of this myself, but I just wanted to, this is what you start to build uh, as you start going down this path and, and the journey. And, and I really look forward to, you know, when I have more time, I don't have it right now, but I have pictures, I have stuff. And to your point, Scott, eventually I will write you know, I will start documenting Yeah, you need this. to. Yeah. You know, yeah. Cause, uh, I want to you know, share. It's very this. similar to, uh, uh, I remember Mike Wiesner, you know, with his book on the ETX telescope. And uh, he just covered so many great points and great detail, you know, and really led people by the hand. And uh, uh, for for many, many people who wanted to get into amateur astronomy, that you know, they bought a ET ETX telescope as a nice, small little telescope, but, uh, uh, there, you know, with any telescope, there's a learning curve and, uh, yes. it really helped out. And I think that, uh, by you writing a book, uh, going through this because you do things so meticulously, but at the same time you make, you break it down, you know, so it's easy to understand. Yeah. I really want to make it digestible and, and, you know, forgive me for this slide, but, but that's, that's, that's my, my intention is to show that all sure. of these things are built on fundamental, simple concepts. And if we can, you know, present it in the right way, then ultimately that's, that's my contribution. I really want to help people, uh, you know, that budding astronomers and that say, Hey, these are, these are good little tips, you know, save a lot of pain and, and, and keep the enjoyment and, and show that, you know, uh, different paths of, of getting to what they want. And um, 
and it's very custom. It, it is very much everyone has their own thing. But as you go on a journey, you start to discover. It's kind of like going to university, you know, first year, and then you start to find out what you want to do, type of thing. Um, and then, anyhow, uh, the other thing I learned is uh, guide scope. Uh, yeah. So one little trick, because you know we have a lot of clouds here in Seattle. Um, you can see the clouds go by and then you start to see the, the guide stars stars pop in and out. So it's like, oh, that's a good way to for cloud detection. So when when it gives you a guide error and it's like, oh, okay, what's going on? I start looking at the uh, guide scope information and you can start to see. And then it's like, oh, okay, all the stars, guide stars came in, boom. Try to take a, a you know, a kind of a best effort image now. I can guide. So kind of fun there trying to take it uh, opportunistically. Uh, in between the, the holes and the clouds. Um, and uh, like I said, the, the double fun factor, you can do the EAA part where you kind of take little snaps, but then if you build it the way I'm trying to do, you can also take your lights at the same time and build yourself a database um, that you can start stacking and, and, and enjoying more detailed images and better quality images as you get that noise down. Um, and so uh, that's how these people, you know, you hear it well, like 20 hours or whatever, like, well, that's because they have consecutive clear nights. But when you're in a place like Seattle, you might have to take that over a couple of years, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's all part of the fun. You start to um, build it up. And, um, and, and, uh, and then finally, I, you know, I already talked about this last year about calibration frames, but I learned a whole bunch of more. And I was, I was mentioned to, to Maxi earlier, one of the techniques I learned, which is a really good technique for is, you can enjoy the live stack on your ASI Air Pro, or for that matter, you can do it in Nina or um, in, in the uh, ASI uh, um, studio, where you can actually view the, the image as it's being stacked as a, as a kind of a pre-processed image, but you're also saving the individual lights. Uh, so you, you already take your master bias, master darks, master flats, which you're gonna use when you post process, but you can also use them in the live stacking mode. So you actually have a good idea with the uh, screen transform function that is automatically stretching the image. You can already get an idea. Oh yeah, those are pretty good. You know, it's gonna be good. And then all of a sudden you'll see a streak of a jumbo jet going by. It's like, okay, well I can take that frame out uh, when I actually do my post processing. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it makes it enjoyable the whole time. Okay, now we get to the, the end goal and and I wanted to have a little uh, uh, little tour with everyone here um, I, I took uh, it with my dual imaging rig I went through and I did a little uh, I managed to have a successful night in Seattle uh, where I was able to take uh, simultaneous uh, wide field and narrow field uh, shots uh, of a number of popular galaxies that are happening in early galaxy season here. So um, let me go to blue stacks and I'm gonna switch this. Uh, actually, this is, uh, sorry, this is Sky Safari. And turn off the, let me make it now. And let's go uh, change this into, yeah. Global Star Party 89. And here we go, let's move over here. Okay, so this is, these are the objects we're gonna check out. Oh, okay. Got some sound effects. Okay, so, so we'll start off in, uh, in the Big Dipper. Uh, well, not Big Dipper, in Ursa Major. Um, and I always think of Big Dipper because of these two stars pointing to uh, M81 and M82. And that's a great way to find it, even with a, you know, if you're doing scar hopping with a binoculars or or a small scope, uh, you can zoom in. So let's uh, let's go in there. And I think I want to turn this off. Can you guys hear that weird uh, special effects? No. Oh, you can't. Okay, I won't. Good. And I'll just ignore it. Okay. So what you can see here is um, is uh, I have both uh, both image scales. Uh, this inner one is my C8 with F63 focal reducers with the 183. So if I look at my uh, scope display, I have a number of different combinations. 
The large one is a uh, my 80 millimeter uh, ED, uh, my ED80, with a 294 sensor. And you can see its field of view is 2.29 by 1.56 degrees. And if I go to the, EV, the, uh, the C8, uh, 63 reducer, it's with 183 field of view 0.59 by 0.39. Okay, so that's that's what we're seeing here. And uh, if we go to the to the uh, first shot, so you can see um, now, you know, a couple of disclaimers. These are not. Um, you know, by any means, uh, professionally uh, stacked or anything, but um, you know, there's moon, there's there's a gradient. If you pixel peep, this doesn't have the uh, field flattener on it. Uh, there's some stretching on the corners, uh, but um, what you what what I wanted to show you is, whoops, sorry, is that um, you have M82, M81, and you have this other galaxy down here, uh, NGC 3077. And um, in, an, in a nice frame. And I can, I really love in equatorial mode, it doesn't matter what time, any time, any day, any season, it will always be in this framing. And this, one thing you will notice though, it is it has nice round stars. Let me just move this out of the way. Give me a second. Uh, more hide video panel. Uh, hide, no, hide, there's something that's blocking me, give me a second. Okay, there we go. So this is, this image was made with 14 two minute uh, subs stacked and I post process this uh, offline. The main thing I wanna, you know, you can see that, um, all these images, I, I got pretty good flats. So you can see the flat field is relatively flat, uh, but it's a nice pleasing view with an ED80. And if we go, you know, M81 is a really bright galaxy, 6.8 magnitude, uh, M82, 8 magnitude 8. Um, these guys are, you know, if I, if I look at the, uh, the distance, they're pretty close by. Oh, sorry about that. M81 is 3.2, uh, sorry, 12 million light years away. So it's, you know, it's, it's out there, but um, it's not, you know, it's, it's further, obviously Andromeda galaxy is around, 2.5 million light years, uh, but it's so it's close, but it's not like a Virgo cluster, typically around 50 million light years away. So it's pretty close. And as a result, you can see in the image, this is the uh, the C8, 16 two minutes uh, exposures. Wow. You can you can start to see some spiral structure in, in nice. You know, um, uh, you know, I, I this was not the best of night. You can see the moon. Uh, on that, on the on the ninth, was actually uh, uh, creating a, a little bit of filter. But what you can see here, which is neat, is you see some fainter galaxies off to the side, like right here, uh, right here, um, and and basically even in the neighborhood of of uh, right. You see this guy right here, uh, and actually, if you look, if I zoom in. It's actually right there. This guy right here is a P PGC, you know, ending at 326 or whatever. This guy, what's what magnitude? He's a magnitude 159 galaxy. And I was able to pick him out in, uh, in, in my image here, right there. So um, that's, that was uh, M81, M82. Then we move on to, I'm a little rusty here. So. Sorry, here. Yeah. Now we move on to inside the uh, Big Dipper bowl or right, right beside it. Now we're gonna go down here and we got the Owl Nebula, M97, and it's uh, magnitude 
And of course, it's inside our galaxy. So we will go here. So even though it's galaxy season, I, I always like to get the Owl Nebula. And for, this is a wonderful uh, planetary nebula to image because it's quite large uh, and it's not so intensely bright to blow out uh, the detail. So it's only uh, 1.7 million or sorry, 1.7 kilolight years. Uh, so it's within our galaxy. And if we go, this is the nice wide field. And then of course, because it's a, an ED80 with a larger field of view, I managed to pick out uh, M108 in the, in the corner here which is kind of nice. And you can see some of the, the structure in the galaxy uh, and some of its dust lanes, which is nice. And even on, the, uh, on M97, you can just start to make out the central star. But then on the C8, we take the same um, 12 times two minutes stacked, and you can still to see the double shell, the two eyes and, and some stars, uh, these three stars, all different colors, including the blue central star uh, right there. So, very happy with this image of uh, M97. Um, then we move down, we go down here, zoom back out again. Now we're gonna go down to Leo. Oh, sorry about that. And there's two triplets, uh, you know, there is the, the original Leo triplet, but there's another one down here. M96, M95, and M105. And M105 has another trio of galaxies on the edge of the field of view on the ED80. So if I move, let me just move this out of the way. So you can see these three galaxies up here. You can actually see some of the structure. Um, so that's, uh, you know, NGC 3384, uh, 105. And then you have uh, 96. And what you can see what I've done is my main imaging scope is the C8 with the long focal length. So I'm centering on M96 in this case. So that's how it's stored in the database. Uh, but what, uh, and then I'm taking advantage of that, uh, I guess you could say plate solved location to uh, get my wide field shot as well. And here's a zoom in on the uh, on M96. And we'll just, look at M96 uh, stats, magnitude 9.1. And it is at C32, we're getting a bit further away now. So it's almost three times as far as M81. Um, kind of a neat, uh, neat structure with a, a bar. And um, these are all really great visual, um, very visually pleasing with a wide field and even high powered uh, scopes. Uh, you start to see some, uh, some structure, but really great, great uh, for small scopes. Then we get to the famous original trio. And here I centered in on uh, M9, on uh, M66. So in the wide field shot, you get nicely uh, all three including uh, NGC 3628, uh, which is actually visually very difficult because uh, the dust lane uh, really reduces the surface area brightness. That brightness is spread over a larger field. But when you do get it in the right skies or with a larger aperture uh, scope, it's very rewarding. The other two, M65, M66, these guys are nice and bright and oftentimes even in a in a higher power, you can get both of them in the same visual field of view. But they have a really neat characteristics. M66, which I took on the C8, uh, this is an example of you know, what we were talking about earlier, Scott, about the dew, what yeah. it did. Uh, it, oh, creates, yeah. it creates this total uh, whiteout. And so I have this tiny little donut <laughs> uh, in here. But I still was able to, uh, you know, with nine times two minutes, so almost 20 minutes, I was able to get uh, still some nice structure. And this is a really nifty galaxy. I like the way the arms come out. Uh, so I, you know, I kind of put on my filter and say, yeah, it's still good. It's, it's, but I wanted to demonstrate, obviously, you know, this is something when I, with my dew heater, all that, I take this again, it's gonna be nice and clean. Uh, so um, the stars are nice and round, no issues there, tracking is beautiful. 
uh, everything is good. Um, and now it's pretty focused. So it's just a matter of getting that do out of there. And if you look at uh, M66, it's a magnitude 8.9. And let's see how far that guy is. Yeah, okay. it's, a, it's a, in the same uh, 37 million light years. So wow. it's in the same neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. So these we're starting to get a little bit further out. Um, I never get back. jaded on hearing about distances to galaxies or, you know, learning about, you know, the, you know, the size aspects of things and the immensity of it, you know, when you think about that little dash of light having, I don't know how many billion uh, stars in its system, you know, um, you know, how many trillions of planets might be there and that little dash of light. It just, oh, yeah. uh, oh. it just propels me. It, it sends me off into, you know, this kind of uh, mental state, you know, of, uh, and that you're actually connected to it. It's, it's super far away. It is yes. super big. It is immense beyond proportions that you could ever really wrap your head around. But, you know, it's part of you. Yes. It's part of you, you know, and so that is, that is, uh, and it's just one of trillions, you know, just one of trillions. Well, you know, and, 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 you know, we, we're pixel peeping here, but basically, uh, you know, it's easy to criticize the flaws, but I look, I like to look at the, the positive things. Like, first of all, like you said, you're, you're looking at this galaxy 32 million light years away. And you're right. seeing you're seeing the structure. You're seeing the structure. You can't see. I remember when I first looked through a 17 and a half inch daub back in uh, when I was a kid, uh, probably 14 years old. At, and this is what got me hooked on galaxies. I was like, I, I remember. I think it was the Leo triplet. And I, I remember seeing. You can actually see this type of structure visually uh, right. on these on these brighter galaxies. And I remember it was like. Oh yeah, this is this is awesome. This is awesome. You know, and, That's right. And this is and this is just with uh, you know, granted this is an eight inch. Uh, you know, let's go back to the previous picture um, on the on the ED80. Let's go back. You know, this is not too bad either, right? Uh, with with oh, a yeah. little more, you know, that's a little more. Uh, I mean, this is just a beautiful to be able to have all that framed and the noise is there. But the fundamentals are there. You have round stars. I know with a flattener, I, I'll get these edge stars good. Uh, the tracking is good. All the building blocks are there. And I just need a dark sky, no do. And basically, uh, these are going to start to look really nice, you know, and, and yeah. it will just get better. I mean, already, I'm very happy, right? I mean, I'm seeing stuff that you can, can't even see with an 18 inch. Uh, visually on a dark in you know maybe in a dark sky you can start to see the the the, the structures but you can't see all uh, you know direct vision uh, this type of detail so but it makes the it's enhancement it's it to me it complements the visual because now you're training your eye as well so that when you do get that opportunity to see these visually in a in a, one of those big monster scopes or or even in a smaller scope on it in a dark sky, you start looking for those details and you find them. You actually, you actually will see them uh, much easier than if you didn't know they were there. And you say, hey, I wonder if I can see that. And it's such a gratifying uh, experience when you actually have that self-discovery, when you know what you're looking at. Right. And uh, that's part of the fun. And that's why I'm building this, you know, this is what drove me to, to do this. And, and I'm going to, you know, people have made messy catalogs and done lots of stuff and done amazing pictures. But again, yeah, my but point, when my, you do my, it, it's, my goal, it's different. it's different when you do it. And also, I, I, I'm looking at this as a visual enhancement. You know, you're, you're the only reason why I want to take better quality pictures over time of the same objects is so that you can actually start to see the painter galaxies in behind. So because, as we'll see in some of these upcoming ones, you'll start to see some other neighboring galaxies and you said it's like you're going even deeper right you're you're now taking your visual and your 
exploration even deeper than you ever could before. Right. And uh, it's really nice. That's so, right. So now we go to a famous object that what everyone knows and loves. This beautiful grouping in Virgo, right in the smack in the middle, and extremely pronounced uh, arc known as Stephens, uh, sorry, Stephens, known as uh, Mercurian's uh, chain. Mercurian's chain of galaxies Mercurian's going from chain. bright right. and all the way, it's just a beautiful thing. And of course, Virgo aid stuck in the corner here, but with the wide field, ta-da, you can get it all in. And, you know, it's, uh, this is a nice, you know, with a little more exposure, this is only made up of, um, this is only made up of uh, uh, two minute subs. But if I crank it up to five minute subs and then, you know, I, uh, I, I do some uh, more dithering and, and, you know, do a longer, uh, many, many more exposures, this is going to start to look like a really nice image. I'm extremely thrilled about this. This is beautiful to be able to see this, you know, in a wide field like this. It's just makes me so happy seeing all these galaxies. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and all different types, you know, nice edge ons, you know, it's the ellipticals, you know, us, oh, it's, it's so cool. It's just and, a deep, you know, it's a yeah. deep field. It is. Yeah, so. yeah, it's it's a beautiful. And then, of course, with a long focal length, this is all you get. But, aha, there's a little little uh, little bonus. All of a sudden, you pick out some of these other galaxies. So if we let's just zoom into the eyes, and see what those galaxies are. So we we'll go to here, and we zoom into the eyes. See now, you see how those galaxies start popping in. Okay, so now we're in the C8. This is C8 view. And if we look at the eyes themselves, this guy, let me just move this out of the way. Magnitude 10 a galaxy. I have to move that out of the way again. And we'll take a look. How far is this guy? This guy, 37. See, it's in the neighbor, same as the Leo. It's around the same magnitude, same size as you can see. So that's a good comparison. So it's 37 million light years away. However, you look at these guys. That guy's a magnitude 14.9. And this guy's, let's take the 15.5. So PCJ uh, 41018. Take a look at that guy. Move him out of the way. That guy is a whopping 51 million light years away. So now he's not quite, it's like one and a half, one and 66% uh, further. So it's uh, getting further away, but you know, smaller galaxy. And then it, you, the other thing is you, when you do this and you can set your magnitude limit in the uh, sky safari, you can start to say, oh, okay, hey, there's another galaxy here. This guy here is magnitude 16.3. I wonder if I can see him. And you go back to your image and you say, hmm, can I see that galaxy? Let's do a visual plate solve. So I just move over here and I, oops, sorry. Let's go back here. So it's, if I zoom in, and there's this little stir and go like that. Okay. So it's possible that it's one of these, but again, with more exposures and that, you start to now, th there's another purpose to making it nicer looking. You get a better signal to noise and you start eking out these galaxies. Like, see that one? Yeah, see that guy? I pick, there's a, these triangle of stars. Here's a mm -hmm. triangle of stars. There's another galaxy right there. If you, I don't know if you can see that. And if I, you know, take a longer exposure, you can start to pick that out and start continuing your galaxy hunt, hunter deeper. This is 16.5 magnitude. So 16.5, and it is. Look at this, 110 million light years away. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Now we're getting to yeah. another level. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So, so you yeah. start to go deeper and deeper and start to put the pieces and it just makes it such a fun puzzle. So, you know, beyond just the, this is kind of the, what, you know, Adrian is talking about beyond the, the, the visual, uh, you know, the appealing uh, look of things. Uh, it's, it's that orientation and, and, and seeing the depth and, and, the, and the, the, the relative connection, uh, you know, distances, uh, you know, the spatial, uh, you know, the, the geometry, um, it's really, um, yeah. And then I just love the eyes because you have this, you know, this big wisp and you have the, you know, that if you zoom in, you can see a little more of uh, dust here. 
And there's a lot of noise in this picture, but again, with enough uh, exposures, you clean it up and, and I haven't done anything with Pixin. I'm not even, eventually I will get probably a Pixin, Pixin site because uh, that's, you know, it will be able to do some scripts and all that. Um, but for now, uh, I, I, the main thing is I want to get some good data reliably. And then, uh, you know, the image processing will follow. Uh, I'm just doing some basic processing right now uh, using the existing tools, stretching, basic stretch. Whoops, uh, let me go back here again. So continuing, continue, that was a little bit of a jumping ahead. Now this one here, uh, we all going up is the needle galaxy, which uh, is the rest of them are actually all in Coma Bernicius. Just, uh, now this one I only got with the C8 because I, I So this one is nine, magnitude 9.1 and he is, see, 39 million light years away. So he's the Leo galaxies, the, the Markarian chain, all those galaxies are around the same distance in, in, a, in that sphere uh, away from us. And if I look at the, uh, this is what I got with my C8 and you can see nice uh, dust lane, uh, and uh, then you have uh, this, you can see my, actually a dust mode here. This was a, not a calibrated flat. And you know, this is, you know, I'll get better at it, but uh, this is what I have at the time. There's a little galaxy here. This was a very pronounced galaxy. Let's take a look at what those guys are. So if we go, there he is, see, there it pops up. I see 3571. That's a magnitude, whoa, that was magnitude 17 and a half. That's, and then uh, let's take a look at that guy. How far is he? Oh, 64 million light years away. So that's, that's interesting. So about twice as far. And this guy, NGC 4562, magnitude 14.4. And let's go that guy, 36 million light years years away so what's what you're seeing here this is what's fascinating is well you, you get a good um a good sense that you know a magnitude magnitudes can be misleading uh you because they don't necessarily translate into distance it also doesn't translate into surface brightness and you can really with with imaging it can also help you set expectation on what you can see visually um, you know, sometimes a fainter galaxy, like I've seen when I was doing my survey of 3000 objects or whatever, I was surprised to find that some of the 12th magnitude galaxies that are much smaller actually are much more defined and easier to, to find and spot, uh, either because of the star field or because of their surface brightness compared to brighter galaxies that might be magnitude 10, but they're very diffuse. So capturing that with, with the images here and also looking at these fainter galaxies, the same law applies and you can really see. And it also, you can see, translates into distances as well. Uh, you, you can't make a, a, a general statement. Um, okay, continuing right along. Next one, ah, yes. This is one I was so happy to discover. I remember when I first came across this pair uh, with my 18 inch dog, it's kind of like, it's like, whoa, how come nobody talk about these galaxies? Is because it, they're really quite bright. Uh, this whale, whale galaxy is, uh, let's go, magnitude 8.9, they're a huge galaxy. And uh, if you look at the uh, distance, see 24 million, it's a, it's a closer galaxy. It's, it's often overlooked because it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and then it has this other one, uh, NGC 45, which is um, which is quite a bit fainter, 12 magnitude 12.4, oops, sorry, that's the wrong one, magnitude 9.5, and then 17, so it's even closer. See, here's an example where the fainter galaxy is actually quite a bit closer, uh, but let's go to the images. So the wide field shot, I was very happy with this ED80. I never, 
seen a wide field image of these, these two. Um, it's not a very common. I want to do better at this, but I, you can see I, because of my C8 being trained on the image, uh, the plate solve on the whale galaxy, uh, it's centered on that. I could do a better job framing this or, or could just crop it uh, later on. Uh, but, you know, quite, quite nice detail on the ED80. Uh, this is called either the crowbar galaxy or the hockey stick galaxy. As a Canadian, I, I like that. Um, and you have a little elbow here. That's actually another galaxy on the tip. And you see the brightening. This whale galaxy has another galaxy that's a dwarf galaxy that's uh, right beside it. In fact, just for fun, let's see if it's actually a neighboring galaxy. So that guy is magnitude 12.4. And if he's around 20 million light years, he's probably in the same internet. Let's check it out. 31. Okay, so he's about 10 million light years away from the whale galaxy. So he's still pretty far, but, um, but he's off in the distance. So it's not actually a companion galaxy. Um, and then if we go, that's on the ED80. And then if we go to the zoom up, this is, I love this one. This is my C8. And look at kind of the detail you can get in this. I just love this. You know, all the, the nice, uh, you know, uh, structure in, in, the, in, the, in the galactic uh, plane. Uh, and it's a, it's a little bit uh, off-centered, has a lot of modeling over here, and then it goes there, nice bulge. And then you can you visually see this, uh, this companion galaxy. It's a magnitude 12 point something with an eight inch, you can, you can capture that. Uh, then there's a little bonus galaxy here. Uh, you can clearly see beside this star. So let's see where that is, let's zoom in. Uh, see here. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I'm not going to claim that I discovered something new, but uh, you can see these. <laughs> the, <laughs> There's some fuzzies out there. <laughs> it, it might be, a, you know, it might be a comet, uh, or or, or it's, it, it's it's possible it's a comet. Um, there is a little bit of it, you know, but I, you know, I don't know because you can see on the it's not there. It should be between these two stars. Should be right there. These two galaxies you can make out. See these two, there's one there, one there. This is quite a bit brighter than those two. I would not be surprised if I pick, you know, I, I should take another picture. It's possible that that's a comet. Let's see, I don't know. It's, this is part of the fun of this too. You, you, you know, you, you'll, you, you'll find these potentially, well, you'll clearly see if a, if a jet goes in, in, the, in the way or, or if a satellite uh, trail is going, which by the way, uh, one thing that we should all consider, uh, satellites uh, of all types, uh, especially the ones that are near Earth uh, or, or low LEO satellites, including the um, Starlink, uh, because they're so close, the nice part, if there is any um, benefit, is if you image at the meridian at midnight um, or anything, that should be in the Earth's shadow, so you're not going to get any reflections on satellites. And I, I discovered that when I was taking a lot of pictures of Orion um, uh, early in in the uh, in the in the dawn, or sorry, in the uh, as soon as sunset um, uh, was was finished, uh, I would right away start taking pictures of Orion, and and then there's tons and tons of these. Uh, geostationary satellites making star trails all over the place and it was like what the heck and then you realize well if you just wait a little bit until the sun sets on those satellites uh, they won't be there anymore uh, so so that's that's the ultimate way around uh, that type of uh, photobombing but it does restrict uh, you know your, your imaging window if you want to have no chance of them hitting there uh, so that's something I've discovered. Okay. Now, another favorite of mine. Oh, yes, yes. I never forget when I first saw this. Oh, man, in my in my 18 inch. And this is the opposite. So you, you got, see, uh, this one's easy to remember because in this direction along the Big Dipper, you got M81, M82. But then the opposite direction, you have M106. And this is a beauty. I love this galaxy. 
because this is one of those just has really nice pronounced spiral arms and uh, this is the wide field and it also has some beautiful neighboring galaxies that are bright enough to see in moderate sized scopes in the in in the same field so here's a nice ed80 wide field view where you have a number of galaxies all around there and you also it's long enough exposure i actually got the outer halo of the spiral arms besides the core arms uh, so if i zoom in on the ed80 you can still start to see that it's noisy but it's still there and let's take a look at m106 m106 magnitude 8.3 and 25 million light years away you know uh so it's it's pretty close but it's neighboring one that we can barely see that's magnitude 13.2 and that guy 36 you see so million light years away so, so actually that's interesting 36 and let's do it again 25 okay so it's 20, 11 million light years away from m16 and then you have all the other ones as well which we can go but that's okay uh, then if we look at the c8 the, the the zoomed in picture look at that oh i just love this you know just really nice and visually oh yeah I that's, remember. See, I remember that's seeing like this the, the sci-fi version of a galaxy right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, lots of noise and all, but the, the but you can really still see just gorgeous structure. I mean, the I remember seeing this with my 18 inch. I was just blown away as soon as I saw. It, I was like, whoa! Like, of course, M51, gorgeous, all that. But when I saw this guy, uh, I was like, wow! You know, it's like on edge, and you have these really nice, and you can actually see some modeling. Uh, that's a that's a beauty. So any, if you're ever at a star party, check out M106. Um, and then uh, and then it has this other galaxy uh, right there too, which is which is nice. Um, anyhow, uh, it's called NGC two four two four eight. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, do do do. Yeah. Next one. Zoom back out here. Okay, we're almost finished. Yeah, I think I think uh, one more. Yeah. Ah, yes. Here's the last one. I know we've been going for a long time. Thanks everyone, and for those of you who are watching the replay, that's uh, hope you're enjoying it. Um, but here is everyone's favorite. Oh man, M51, and this one. I just want to say. So this is 20 minutes. Okay. Of stacks on an ED80. It's far enough away from the moon, nice flat field relatively. There's a little bit of a gradient here because the moon, is, what I've learned is that the gradient occurs opposite the direction of the light because it reflects off of the cone of the uh, dew shield. Um, so for example, the moon is to the right, top right here. And you can see that this glow comes from, even though you have baffling and dark and all that, it doesn't matter. It still will reflect and it will cause this gradient. Um, and so, but doesn't matter. Hey, look at this. You can see the structure nicely. You, you can see even some of the, uh, the dust, even in an ED80, and then you know, nicely situated and then centered perfectly in the field. And then bang, here's my C8 view. And what I like about this one is uh, look at the, look at the detail, right? You have really nice structure. You can see all of the uh, additional uh, stars that are cast out, uh, thrown out from the uh, the interaction of these two galaxies. You also see some uh, nifty stuff like uh, this one here. If we go to the um, zoom in now, M fifty one. So you see, we'll, we'll just frame it and we can zoom right in. And you can see this guy right here is that guy right there. So zoom right in. Oh, sorry. It's a galaxy right there. I see four, three, four, four, two, uh, seven, eight. 
I'm just as interested in these very small smudges that are beside these show objects as the big objects themselves. They're galaxies too. <laughs> um, right. So if we, if we look at this guy, he's, look at that, magnitude 17.8. Here's a classic example where say, so, okay, 17.8, we saw some other stuff that looked even fainter, but because of its uh, high concentration, if you look at the image, oh, where is it? you can see it's very pronounced. And uh, so we'll go back to the specs on it. So that's 250 million light years away, okay? 250 million light years away. That's getting out there. And that's right beside M51 itself. Let's take a look at that guy. M51 itself is only 28. So almost 10 times the distance, 10 times the distance of that right beside each other. And then if we look at the image again, there they are. So very humble. And that's my, that's my, uh, my journey. And then there's lots of other, if we peek around, there's other galaxies and stuff, but, but basically uh, bottom line, the end goal is to take images so you can continue to enjoy them on rainy nights, <laughs> cloudy nights, and, and share them with all our friends here. And, and then make a, make a way so that you can build the journey and start to make it repeatable so that all your time under the stars is maximized enjoyment and, uh, and, uh, and we can all share. So thank you. Thank you, Scott. Wow, Cameron, thank you so much. It's great to have you back on again. And I certainly hope to have you back that you don't have such a long uh, 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 stay away in the future. So <laughs> um, I had to run out uh, during your talk there. I mentioned in in, uh, in chat with you that I had to uh, go check something and uh, it was it started to rain outside and there was a door that was open. So I had to take care of that. But um, like you, I love galaxies. I love, uh, you know, s seeing how far you can see. And uh, with with your with your camera set up, e even though uh, uh, many people, those of you on the audience, I mean, you've been seeing these people uh, do this kind of imaging and exploring the sky in Bortles seven, eight, and nine skies. Okay, and doing yes. amazing stuff. So. Um, you can do it too. Um, and, uh, so I'm glad you guys were watching tonight. Um, Cameron, thank you for, for, uh, your presentation. I see that John Briggs is still there in the background and Cameron, Gil or you've got two Cameron Gillises. So you and John are the last holdouts there. Maybe some of the other presenters are watching on YouTube or Facebook. Um, but, uh, again, uh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, it's now about 12.15 here, and uh, so we're going to call it a night, um, but, uh, you know, the main message here is to keep looking up, uh, keep exploring, you know, uh, find a way to experience real, true, personal discovery of the universe. Uh, you know, you may not be the first one to see these things or experience these things, but uh, it, it may be the very first time for you, and that's very important. So, um, you know, in this troubled world that we have today, uh, you know, with a war going on in the Ukraine and, uh, um, you know, people uh, divided, uh, astronomy brings people together. It uh, is something that uh, lowers your stress. It can uh, lower your blood pressure. Uh, you know, and uh, you can experience a state of flow. And, um, you know, uh, Cameron does that very, very well uh, uh, with his cam, cam astronomy program, his sky survey. He, he I know he experiences flow when he's doing this. And most of us that do astronomy have those moments of uh, peace and uh, a, a flow state that is uh, really, really important uh, that you can experience that in your life. And, um, you know, so uh, we there's many ways to do it, but astronomy is a good way uh, that uh, really only first requires that uh, you use your pair of eyes uh, to experience this. So 
we want to wish you good night and wherever you are we hope that you have a, a good day or a good night wherever you're watching in the world and we will be back next tuesday and um with the uh, 90th global star party so see you then and until that time keep looking up good night good night